What's up? Ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was in Marvel as Spider Man, Conqueror of Multiverse, Part 4. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Asgard Bifrist. Laufey alongside two towering frost giant warriors appear out of the Bifrist and step onto the golden platform. As the enemies of Asgard arrived, their skeptical and wary looks instantly disappeared. After all, Loki could have used this opportunity to send him and his men into a nearby sun, or perhaps slaughter them with surprise and numbers upon their arrival. Loki may be Lofi's son, but he was not raised as such. In the Jotun King's eyes, Loki was an Asgardian and that wouldn't change. Though perhaps he was a trustworthy Asgardian, as the only person that was there to welcome their arrival was Loki. Not a single Asgardian soldier was in sight. The godlike trickster pulled Gungnir from the control panel, ceasing the activation of the Bifrist. Father, welcome to Asgard. As Peter watched Thor bend down and grasp the handle of Mjolnir with a resigned look on his face, Thunderous clouds fill the sky at an abnormal rate. Seeing these clouds, Peter knew that his time with Mjolnir was over, but he wasn't angry or resentful about it. This was inevitable, and Peter would rather have a lightning-powered Thor fighting at his back than anything else. It wasn't my power to begin with, Peter thought as he watched Thor lift Mjolnir over his head as multiple strands of lightning converged above and formed one bolt, which cracked downwards and struck the hammer. When the bright flash from the lightning cleared, Jane and her group were instantly convinced that Thor's ramblings were, in fact, true. Instantly, Thor's normal clothes were swapped with his trademark golden Asgardian armor, accented by a sleek red cape. A look of pure happiness filled Thor's face as a single tear fell from his eye. He missed this feeling dearly. Bringing Mjolnir to his face, he smirked victoriously as lightning flowed around the hammer. Thor was truly happy to finally reunite with his powers and trusted weapon. Finally whole again. Upon seeing this, Peter smiled as well, feeling good about the way he handled things. I could have kept Mjolnir if I really wanted to, but this is a far better outcome. Although Odin made it so the hammer would default back to Thor once he learned his lesson, Peter could think of multiple ways to keep it within his grasp. The simplest of these ideas was to kill Thor, which would be especially easy as he was a mortal only moments earlier. Without the person that it's supposed to default back toward, Mjolnir would be his, at least until someone more worthy comes along. Of course, Peter isn't a villainous person so he would never do such a thing. The hammer probably wouldn't choose a wielder that would do such a thing in the first place. Oh my god! Jane mutters as she looks Thor up and down with a heated gaze. That smirk only grew as Thor turned to see the woman he was interested in, eyeing him like a juicy piece of meat. Winking flirtatiously at his love interest, Thor turns to Peter, full of gratitude. Thank you, my friend, Thor says as his grip tightens on Mjolnir. It's a hard thing to give up such power. You have my respect, man spider. Don't worry about it, Peter says with a shrug. Bring me over to Asgard sometime and we're even. I want a tour of the place as well. Peter would ask for a replacement weapon from Nidaveller later on, and if Thor or his family are reluctant, then Peter can always portal there and ask the dwarves himself. I'm sure I can pay them for their services in some way, Peter thought, hopefully. Of course, Thor laughs with open arms. I will invite all of my Midgardian friends for a feast upon my return. Boom! As Thor was celebrating the return of his powers, the last of Tony's explosives went off, shrouding the destroyer in smoke from the blast. By this point, all civilians have already left the area. Tony fought in a way that kept the destroyer pinned to one area, leaving room and time for the bystanders to hightail it out of there. Before the smoke could clear, a single fiery red and orange beam shot out 
and collided with Tony's armored chest, sending him flying back towards Peter, who ducked out of the way. Asterisk shatter. Crash. Asterisk as Tony's red and gold form flew past Peter. He smashed into the big glass window of the diner and only stopped when he hit the table they were eating at only minutes earlier, breaking it to pieces while sending food and drink everywhere. It looks like it's time for round two, Peter says as Tony gets up and starts brushing food off of his suit. As the smoke clears, a pristine destroyer could be seen standing in the middle of a small crater at the center of the road. Damn, that thing is sturdy. Tony comments as he walks out of the diner with some food stains left over on his armor. I'll take it from here, Thor announces as he strides down the street towards the destroyer, no longer defenseless. You want any help? Peter asks, but before Thor could answer, his Asgardian comrades step forward. We can handle it, Sif says as she and the warriors three form up behind Thor, following him into battle. It's good to have you back, Thor. Volstag states as he pats his true king and friend on the shoulder. You as well, my friends, Thor says as lightning begins to dance all over his body, his eyes never leaving the destroyer's ominous figure. Brother, for whatever I have done to wrong you, whatever I have done to lead you to do this, I am truly sorry. Though this world has done nothing to you, they are innocent, Thor says as he inches closer and closer to the destroyer, knowing his brother could hear his every word. Lifting Mjolnir into the air, lightning strikes down from the clouds and hits the destroyer. It convulses and falls to one knee as Thor swings Mjolnir around, launching himself off and up into the air. As the destroyer gets back on its feet and looks up at the sky, where Thor was surrounded by clouds and high wind, debris from the earlier battle began to rise into the air. The destroyer stayed there in the crater, kept grounded by its massive weight, as wind launches debris all around. It lifts its head up, opens its faceplate, and unleashes a fiery blast in Thor's direction. Not fearing anything now that he has his powers back, Thor dives downward straight at it, holding Mjolnir in front of him. Mjolnir collides with the destroyer's fiery energy beam as the two forces meet Midair. After only a few seconds, Thor and Mjolnir start to gain some ground, overpowering and pushing the destroyer's blast back, forcing the beam downwards at the destroyer. Thor slams his hammer down onto the side of the destroyer's head, knocking the behemoth off its feet. In the instant, the warriors three and Lady Sif were ready and surrounded the downed destroyer, pinning it down by its arms and legs. The destroyers flailed and pushed against the weight that kept it pinned to the ground, lifting Thor's friends momentarily as they barely keep the giant automaton from returning to its feet. As if angered, the destroyer starts firing off its fiery face beam into the open sky, tearing through the thunderclouds wherever it blasted. Landing beside his friends, Thor made his way to the head, looking down at the destroyer as if it were a dying animal. Arriving at the head of the Asgardian robot, Thor winds his hammer back and smashes it down into its open faceplate, jamming the hammer deep into the destroyer's head. Retreat! Thor calls out to his friends, leaving Mjolnir behind. For the time being, Thor and his fellow Asgardians run for cover. With the weight off of its body, the destroyer could finally get back up to its feet, but sadly it was already too late. Not being able to escape due to Mjolnir, the fiery energy within the automaton builds up inside its body and explodes within it firing out of every orifice of its metal body. Although there was an explosion, the destroyer was completely intact as it fell to the ground without a single piece missing. The fiery energy within it was completely extinguished, leaving the metal robot lifeless, like a puppet without strings. Walking over, Thor pulls Mjolnir from its faceplate and leaves its lifeless carcass in the crater. Heimdall, open the Bifrist, Thor calls out, ready to return home and find out all the damage his brother has caused. No reply. Heimdall, open the Bifrist. He yells a bit louder this time, but once again, nothing happens. Asgard prison. Heimdall, open the Bifrist. In a cramped prison cell, Heimdall stood frozen like a large armored popsicle as Thor's voice rang out in his head. Although the former gatekeeper of Asgard was frozen solid, he could still see and hear as he usually does. 
nothing escapes his all-seeing eyes and ears. Unless, of course, some sort of magic was in place to do so, as Loki did when he visited Jotunheim. Sadly, although he could see, Heimdall was unable to move and follow the orders given to him by the rightful king of Asgard. Even if he could thaw himself, getting out of this prison and maneuver past the countless guards was practically impossible. He could only watch and listen as the surrounding events took place, completely powerless to act. He would open it if he could. I fear the worst, Thor says as he looks at the others with concern. Then we're trapped here forever, Valstag comments in defeat. There was only one way in and out of Asgard, and that was through the Bifrost. At least that they knew of. If Heimdall wouldn't or couldn't open the pathway, then they would remain trapped on Earth for the foreseeable future. Then I suppose we'd best start settling into our new lives. Fandral looks at Darcy flirtatiously, turning on the charm. Are all Earth maidens as fair as you? A feline smile forms on Darcy's lips as she enjoys the attention. Jane couldn't be the only one with a handsome alien suitor after all. No, you're in the presence of greatness. Darcy answered in a conceited tone. Heimdall. Thor ignores the talking around him and shouts back up to the sky. Is he not able to open it? Peter thought as once again nothing happened. Peter wasn't sure exactly when it would happen, but he could swear that the Bifrost should have shot down by now. As Thor began to realize that he may not be able to return home, Tony snuck away from the group and made his way to the lifeless destroyer. You are a beauty, aren't you? Tony thought as his HUD scanned the downed automaton. I'm going to rip you apart, learn everything about you, and use you to upgrade my suit. While the inner mad scientist in Tony was boiling over to the surface, Thor finally gave up calling for Heimdall, knowing that something had to be wrong. Looks like we have more time to ourselves, my love. Fandral was really laying it on thick with Darcy. Ignoring the newfound couple that was forming, Peter turned to Thor, who was filled with a growing feeling of dread. Should I portal them to Asgard? Peter thought as he wondered if he could do such a thing. Peter has never portaled outside of Earth, and wasn't even sure if he could open a portal to somewhere in a random portion of space without coordinates or something. Yeah, he can open a portal to places he's never been on Earth, but at least he has an idea of where they are. Hence, how he opened a portal to Mount Everest without ever visiting the place before. He knew it was in the Himalayan mountain range which is located between Nepal and Tibet. Using those parameters, Peter could sort of triangulating the location and open a portal exactly where he wanted. With Asgard, on the other hand, he's only ever seen the place in movies from his past life. Peter doesn't know the spatial coordinates, galaxy, nearest star, or even which side of the universe it was on. Now that he truly thought about it, Peter knew for a fact that he wouldn't be able to open a portal to Asgard even if he wanted to, which he most certainly does. Well shit. Peter thought as he turned to see a familiar bald head in the distance. You've certainly made a mess of things, haven't you? The Ancient One comments, surprising everyone as they jump into action, ready to fight once again. She tends to watch a lot of Peter's major life events, especially since these events tend to align with her most favored timeline. At first, the Ancient One didn't want to reveal herself, but then the words of her most favored student played in her mind. You don't have to die. The more covert way to handle this situation would be to simply portal over to the Rainbow Bridge in Asgard and open the Bifrost for Thor. She could be in and out without a single person knowing. Not Odin nor Heimdall would see a thing. Obviously, she didn't do that and truthfully, she didn't know why. Yes, her student's words may have swayed her judgment, but he was young and reckless. The flaws in his argument were countless, yet she felt the overwhelming need to just give in and trust her student. Does this mean you've decided to join the Avengers? Teacher? Peter asks with a smirk, confusing all those around him, especially the people that know him. In his point of view, if she was willing to reveal herself to all of these people, then she was starting to see things his way. I haven't decided, the Ancient One says as she waves her hand, conjuring a portal right between Peter and Thor. You're welcome. Without another word, the Ancient One disappeared as if she were never there in the first place. Who was that? Tony asks as he walks over, 
dragging the carcass of the destroyer behind him. My teacher, you'll meet her again soon enough, Peter says cryptically, gesturing to the portal next to him. Thanks to her, we have a way into Asgard. Looking into the portal, Thor grins as he can see the familiar image of the rainbow bridge on the other side. While those that weren't used to seeing Peter's portals looked on in amazement as they studied the portal in awe. Turning to the beautiful Lady Jane, Thor takes her hand and kisses it tenderly. Jane looks up at him with fear-filled eyes, as if she may never see him again. Whatever fate lies before me, you are part of it. Thor states as he lovingly takes her into his arms and leans down to kiss her on the lips. When the farewells were said and done, the Asgardians ventured through the portal, leaving the Earthlings behind. I'm going to explore a bit. Peter gave everyone a quick wave and dashed into the portal behind them. Before Tony could decide whether he should do the same, the portal snapped shut. Whatever, Tony thought as he grabbed the destroyer by the foot and dragged it down the barren street. I have to go and dissect this thing anyway. Asgard Palisoden lies unmoving in his healing bed, sleeping as still as a corpse due to his Odin sleep. Odin sleep is a state of deep sleep that Odin periodically enters to recharge his Odin force, the magical energy that gives him his power. While in Odin sleep, Odin is left utterly vulnerable, though he is aware of what transpires, not only around him but throughout the entire universe. His loving wife and queen, Frigga, sat at his bedside, watching over him at all times. There's a reason that Loki has been able to rule with complete impunity since his unofficial crowning as king. That's because his mother barely ever left Odin's side during his Odin sleep. Suddenly, Frigga started to hear some shuffling outside, followed by grunts and the sound of armored guards falling to the ground. Jumping into action, Frigga waves her hand, which activated the security measures on the doors, locking them tightly. Grabbing a nearby sword, she expertly unsheathed it and cast a quick spell upon the blade in preparation. Asterisk bang. 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 Asterisk soon. The doors begin to shake as whoever was outside tried to forcefully enter the room. Although the door was locked tight, it didn't hold for longer than a few minutes before the doors broke open and an armored frost giant warrior bursts in. Without an ounce of hesitation, Frigga swings her sword toward the blue towering intruder, cleaving into his shoulder. Ugh! The Jotun grunts in pain as the sword sliced through his armor and into his flesh. Just as he was about to retaliate against the Asgardian queen, an excruciating burning feeling filled the frost giant's body. Ayaha! The blue warrior screamed in pain as his icy body began to ignite and burn from the inside out. It was as though someone was pumping molten lava into his bloodstream, which was especially horrible for a creature built for the cold like a Jotun. Within a few seconds, the screaming stopped and the frost giant's charred body fell to the floor in a burning and bleeding heap. Yanking the spelled sword from the Jotun warrior's fiery cops, Frigga turned to the open doors and found something she didn't expect to see. Loki? As Thor and his trusted companions step out of the portal and arrive in Asgard, Thor walks slowly to the doorway and looks dazed at the beautiful city on the other side of the Rainbow Bridge. He couldn't help but marvel at his home and feel a fond sense of nostalgia from the view. It hasn't even been a week since he was banished. Yet his home seemed to have a new shine to it that Thor never seemed to notice before. He truly appreciated his home world. Before his banishment, Thor would have walked past this view without a second thought, thinking nothing of his home, but now that's all changed. The luster of Asgard shined before his very eyes. I'm home, Thor thought as the warriors three joined him in the doorway. Are you alright? Sif asks as she places a comforting hand on Thor's shoulder. Why yes, Thor answers with a stutter as he snaps out of his dazed state. We should get to the palace. Heimdall isn't at his post, which means Loki may be up to something. Mind if I tag along? A foreign voice startled the Asgardians, causing them to draw their weapons and snap to attention. When they turned to find out who was speaking, Peter stepped into the room as the portal closed behind him. Yo! Peter says with a wave as he admires the place. Man Spider, why are you here? Thor asks as they all lower their weapons. I couldn't miss the opportunity to see an advanced alien civilization, 
so I hopped in the portal before it closed. Peter says as he walks up to Thor and admires the view of the city behind him. Whistle, damn. That is some beautiful architecture. Peter comments as he admired everything from the city skyline to the mountains and the waterfalls that seemed to drop out into space. This place is a flat earther's heaven. Isn't it? Asgard wasn't a planet like most places. No, it was a legitimate disc-shaped flat earth in the middle of space with waterfalls dropping off into the empty void of space. I don't know what a flat earther is. But yes, Asgard is a very beautiful place. Thor smiles, happy that his newfound friend appreciates the beauty of his home. You don't need to know, Peter says with a shrug. Just some oddballs that think my planet is flat, like yours. I see. Thor nods in understanding. After all, every civilization has its fair share of crazies, and Asgard was no exception. So, should we get going? Peter says as he motions toward the city. After realizing that they had wasted even more time after Peter's arrival, Thor swings Mjolnir and launches himself into the air toward the city, leaving behind those that couldn't fly. Looks like we're running. Valstag mutters. Nope, you're running. Peter says as he shoots a web that sticks to Thor's red cape. See ya! Giving the Warriors Three and Lady Sif a quick wave goodbye, Peter is pulled by Thor's momentum and launches off behind him. As Thor rides the winds over the bridge, speeding towards the palace, Peter holds on tight and admires the city below. Maybe I should buy a house here? Peter thought, wondering if Asgard would allow such a thing. I could always just stay with Thor when I visit. Loki? Frigga exclaims in shock as Loki appears at the doorway to Odin's healing chambers. Take a nap, will you? Her son's voice appeared in her right ear as the Loki at the door faded away like a mirage. Loki somehow appeared behind his mother and grasped the back of her head with a glowing white hand. Instantly, Frigga became extremely lethargic and sleepy, passing out and collapsing into her son's waiting arms. As Loki moved his mother's body out of sight and into a corner behind a convenient pillar, Laufey strolls into the room with a confident smirk on his face. His only remaining frost giant guard followed closely behind, ready to pounce at the nearest enemy that would threaten his king. Seeing the helpless form of his worst enemy, sleeping peacefully in the center of the room, the Jotun king felt that victory was upon him for the first time in a long while. It said you can still see and hear what transpires around you, even in this state. I hope it's true, so that you may know your death came by the hand of Laufey. Laufey taunts as he walks up to Odin, who was helplessly laying in his bed. Raising his hand, an icy dagger materialized in the palm of Laufey's hand. Seeing this, Loki sneakily maneuvers along the edges of the room and positions himself behind his biological father, careful not to alert the remaining guard to his movements. As Laufey stabs down toward his defenseless enemy, Loki stabs the pointed end of Gungnir into his back and through his icy heart. Immediately, the dagger of ice in Lofi's hand shatters as he coughs up a mouthful of blood, which landed on Odin's chest, staining his clothes. T-Traitor, Laufey stutters in pain as he turns to look his killer slash son in the eyes. Loki watched as the life drained from his biological father's eyes without so much as blinking. As Lofi's lifeless body crashes to the ground, Thor and Peter arrive just in time to see Loki pull Gungnir from the Jotun King's corpse. Know that your death came by the hand of the son of Odin. Loki repeats Lofi's earlier words with a sneer on his face. Enraged by his king's surprising and quick death, the last Jotun in the room materialized a big icy hammer and swung it toward Loki. Suddenly, the war hammer-wielding frost giant stops dead in his tracks and his eyes go wide. Aya! Just like his fellow guard, the last Jotun in the room screamed in agony as his body ignites into flames. After a few moments, the charred frost giant falls to the ground, and his icy hammer shatters into snowy pieces. Standing behind him with an angry look on her face, Frigga pulls her enchanted sword out of the Jotun's back and looks to Loki for answers. My son, what have you done? Frigga asks, not noticing Thor and Peter standing at the door. That's what I would like to know as well. Thor makes his presence known as he walks into the room with Mjolnir in hand. Thor. 
Frigga exclaims in happiness as she rushes over to Thor and wraps him in her arms. Thor returns his mother's hug, but his eyes remain fixed on his brother and the spear in his hands. Likewise, Loki looks at Mjolnir in his brother's hand with wary eyes. The drama is about to start. Peter thought as he opened a portal to his snack stash and grabbed a bag of popcorn to enjoy the show. Found its way back to you. Did it? Loki comments as he gestures toward Mjolnir. No thanks to you. Thor answers back with a bit of sass in his voice. Frigga immediately picks up on the tension building between her sons and tries to figure out what's going on. What does that mean? She asks in confusion. Why don't you tell her, Loki? Tell our mother all about how you told me father was dead and I had killed him? How mother forbade my return because of it? How you sent the destroyer to kill our friends? To kill me? Thor lays out all of his brother's dirty laundry. A faint crunching could be heard in the background from Peter, who was leaning against a wall and shoving popcorn under his mask and into his mouth. Of course, the family drama was too distracting for anyone to notice his behavior. Frigga looks at Loki, alarmed, confused, and looking for answers. I only told it to stop you from returning. Nothing more. Loki explains truthfully. Either he wasn't thinking, or he left the command open-ended on purpose, leaving it up to the destroyer to interpret his words. You're a talented liar, brother. Always have been. Thor has been lied to enough and wouldn't believe anything from his brother's mouth anymore. It's good to have you back, brother. Loki says with a smile that soon morphs into complete seriousness. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to destroy Jotunheim. Loki suddenly raises Gungnir and fires it point-blank at Thor, launching him out of the open door and down the hallway. Before anything else could happen, Peter had to come to a decision. Do I save Jotunheim or Loki? Maybe both. Do I save Jotunheim or Loki? Maybe both. Peter thought as he had to decide now. In the first Thor movie, Loki overloads the Bifrost's power in order to destroy Jotunheim and all of its inhabitants. However, Thor destroys the Rainbow Bridge before the realm could be completely destroyed. Of course, partial destruction is probably worse than complete destruction. Jotunheim is already an absolute wasteland of a planet, so who knows how much worse it gets when you add in an apocalypse-level death ray that almost disintegrates the whole place. If Peter were to decide to save Jotunheim, he would have to stop Loki from even starting up the Bifrost in the first place. As for Loki, Peter was even more undecided about saving him. Loki falling from the Rainbow Bridge and through a conveniently placed wormhole is an important moment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Far more important than any other thing that Peter has changed. Without this one moment, the Earth may not be attacked by the Chitauri and Peter would most certainly have a harder time getting his hands on the Mind Stone, as Thanos is supposed to give it to Loki in the form of a spear to aid in his mission to retrieve the Tesseract. Well, the Chitauri would probably still come, Peter thought, as that seemed to be the plan even before Loki showed up. The thing that worried Peter the most was the possibility of not getting the Mind Stone. Though there are some positives to saving Loki as well. Peter could gain another member of the Avengers, alongside the gratitude of Odin, who is currently one of the strongest beings in the universe. Though he's old and seems to have a cool down in the form of Odin sleep, Peter thought dejectedly. After what felt like hours of thought, Peter came to a shocking decision. This decision surprised even him. Damn it, let's shake things up a bit, shall we? Peter muttered as Thor collided with a wall at the end of the hallway. I've always felt a bit bad for Loki anyway. Maybe I can help him. Before Thor could get up, Loki tried to use an illusion to sneak off. Right in front of his mother's confused eyes, Loki disappeared with a quick act of magic. Though what really happened was a simple illusion. Loki made himself appear invisible and tried to sneak out of the room. Thankfully, Peter knew how to counter this and poured some eldritch energy into his eyes. Instantly, he saw a human-shaped mass of magic energy try to pass by him. Where do you think you're going? Peter calls out as he sticks his foot out and trips Loki, as the godlike trickster didn't expect anyone to see him. As soon as Peter's foot made contact with Loki, his invisibility spells were cancelled, and he tumbled to the floor with a bewildered look on his face. Why don't you stay and console your mother? She seems upset. 
Peter advises as he shoots a web at Gungnir and yanks it back. Loki seemed to see this coming, as red energy surrounded the spear and melted the web away upon contact, stopping Peter from snatching it away. Stay out of my affairs, mortal. Loki demands as he rolls over to his side and fires a blast from Gungnir in Peter's direction. Kicking off the ground, Peter leaped to the ceiling and stuck to it, dodging the energy blast with relative ease. That's one way to say hello. Peter comments as he kicks off the ceiling and aims his two feet at Loki's forehead. Just as he was about to stomp on Loki's head, a strong blast of wind shot at Peter from inside the room. Exclamation point. Feeling the incoming attack headed his way, Peter shot a web from each hand at the walls and hung on as the extreme current of wind tried to blow him away. When the wind stopped, Peter landed in the center of the hallway and turned to his latest attacker. Look, I get the whole protective mother thing, but I'm trying to help here, Peter says as he eyes Frigga, who just sent a spell his way to protect Loki. Before Frigga could reply to the stranger's words, the sound of rumbling thunder could be heard from the other end of the hallway. You've done it now. Peter turns to Loki with a look that says, You messed up. Turning around, Peter and everyone else could see a lightning-clad Thor Odinson, rightful king of Asgard, walking down the hall in their direction. Loki, why have you done all of this? Thor asks in exasperation. Is it because you want to be king? Is the throne really worth what you've done? That's where you're wrong. Loki answers as he stands up and stares directly at Thor. I never wanted the throne. I only wanted to be your equal. Now fight me. Loki points his spear at Thor, waiting for him to make the first move. Meanwhile, Thor stops his advance and looks at his little brother in pity. I will not fight you, brother. Thor announces as the lightning around his body dissipates. I'm not your brother. I never was. Loki reveals, but Thor didn't seem to pick up on what Loki actually meant by that. What made you think you're not your brother's equal? Frigga walks up and asks, unsure how it all came to this. Everything. Loki snarls in anger. Do you know what it's like to live in the shadow of a conceited, arrogant, immature, stubborn muscle head? No matter what I accomplished, father would only see Thor. At first, I thought it was because Thor was the firstborn son. But you helped me realize the truth. Thor listened in silence waiting to hear why his brother turned out like this. I'm not your son. Loki says to Frigga, who shook her head in vehement disagreement, and then he turns to Thor. And I'm not your brother. Frigga did indeed tell Loki that he was adopted, but she also told him that he was still her son and that would never change. The same went for Thor and Odin, though Loki didn't seem to think so. Loki, this is madness, Thor says as he hangs Mjolnir on his hip. Let's all just put down our weapons and talk like we've been doing? The time for talking is over, Loki states as he disappears. Using the same trick to locate Loki once again, Peter wasn't able to find his energy anywhere in the hall. Did he actually teleport this time? Can he do that? Peter wondered, as he didn't know the extent of Loki's powers. Any idea where he is? Peter asked, knowing he would be going to the Bifrist though he couldn't just say that without any proof. He's making his way toward the Bifrist. Frigga reveals after a moment of concentration. Why would he go there? Thor asks in confusion. Is he trying to escape? No, Loki said that he needed to destroy Jotunheim. Peter says and pauses for suspense, as he already knew the answer. Can the Bifrist be used as a weapon? The hall goes silent as Thor wasn't knowledgeable enough to know and Frigga was too scared to answer that question. Not willing to wait another moment, Thor swung his hammer and launched himself out of a nearby window. He would head straight for the Rainbow Bridge and do all he could to stop his brother. Just as Thor flew out of the hallway, leaving Peter and his mother behind, the sounds of rustling and slow footsteps could be heard from the healing room behind the remaining two. Turning around, Peter saw a frail but conscious Odin standing with a tired yet determined look on his face. Take me to my sons. Arriving at the Golden Bifrist at the end of the Rainbow Bridge, Thor caught his brother hovering in the center above the control panel, where Gungnir could be seen jammed inside. 
Surrounding his levitating figure were countless Nordic runes accompanied by spell lines, which connected everything to Gungnir below. All these years and no one's ever dared to use the Bifrist as a weapon. Loki says as he welcomed his brother with a conniving smile. Loki! Stop this! Thor calls out as lightning dances around his body. Loki merely scoffed as the massive dome they were in spun slowly, taking aim at Jotunheim. Seeing this, Thor acts quickly and dashes to the control panel, planning to remove Gungnir before his brother could fully activate the Bifrist. As he rushes forward, an icy transparent barrier appears out of nowhere, which Thor smashes into head first. Bang. Looking inside the barrier, Thor could see the casket of ancient winters. The casket was connected to the barrier and pumped enough power into it to block a medium-sized army. You can't stop it. The Bifrist will build until it rips Jotunheim apart, Loki says with a laugh at his brother's expense. Not one for giving up easily, Thor grabs Mjolnir and starts wailing on the frosty barrier with all his might. Boom 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 boom. The dome-shaped barrier rippled with every hit of Thor's hammer, though it didn't come close to breaking even once. On his very last swing, Thor noticed a tiny crack appear on the barrier, but it was fixed in a matter of seconds thanks to the casket of ancient winters. Why have you done this? Thor asks his brother out of breath. To do what father never could. To destroy their kind forever. When he awakens, he'll see the wisdom of what I've done. Loki says haughtily as he looks down at Thor in contempt. I see no wisdom here. Suddenly, an aged and tired, yet powerful voice filled the room. Turning their heads to the side, Thor and Loki saw a frail and disheveled Odin walk in through a golden portal. He was too weak to walk on his own, so he had to be supported by their mother, Frigga. Usually, Odin would wake from his Odin sleep completely rejuvenated, but not this time. The shenanigans brought about by his sons, mainly Loki, have forced him to emerge from his much-needed sleep earlier than what was necessary. Walked in behind the king and queen of Asgard, Peter was surprised by what he found in the Bifrist. This isn't what happened in the movie. Peter thought as he eyed the layout of Loki's runes alongside the barrier. Though it makes sense. My interference probably caused him to be interrupted earlier than expected. As the room froze upon Odin's entrance, the Bifrist stopped spinning and was now aimed directly at Jotunheim. Staring at his father like a deer in headlights, Loki was originally hopeful looking for any form of approval from Odin. Though, after hearing his father's words, that hopefulness turned to sadness and anger. Loki, stop this at once. Odin orders as he gives his most troubled son a stern fatherly look. It's too late for that. Loki answers with a dead look in his eyes as the runes around him glow, causing the Bifrost to power up. Soon, rainbow-colored energy began to build in the dome where it would have stabilized in order to ferry someone across the universe safely, the energy kept building to a point that was almost blinding to the naked eye. Son, I know now that I've failed you in many ways, and I'm terribly sorry for that, but destroying your birthplace will not make it better. Odin tries his best to reason with Loki. Bring down the barrier and end this, please. Loki froze for a single second, as he never heard his father speak like this. The mighty All-Father apologizing and using the word please? It was unthinkable. Though, instead of taking his father's words to heart, Loki merely scoffed and sneered in the All-Father's direction. Careful, father. Loki warns Odin with a condescending tone. You're growing sentimental and foolish in your old age. Odin's eyes go wide for a moment as he remembers his other son's words just before his banishment. You are an old man and a fool. It seems that you and Thor have a lot more in common than either would like to admit. Odin mutters in defeat as Loki prepared to shoot the built-up energy of the Bifrost. Loki! Stop! Thor bellows as he returns to hammering on the barrier to no avail. Bang 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 bang! I guess that it's my turn to finally do something! Peter thought as he waved his hand, conjuring a portal beside him and reaching inside. You can't kill an entire race! Thor roars tiredly as he gives up on breaking the barrier for a second time. What is this newfound love for the Frost Giants? 
You who would have killed them all with your bare hands. Loki asks, wondering what happened to the bloodthirsty brother he knew only days ago. I've changed, Thor answers matter-of-factly. Good, because so have I. Loki answers as he taps a nearby rune with his hand, triggering the Bifrus to fire at Jotunheim. The king and queen of Asgard watched in horror as they knew what that rune meant. Each of them preparing themselves to witness a son they loved commit genocide on an entire planet of people. Though something odd happened. In fact, nothing happened at all. Instead of firing out its overcharged ray of energy, the Bifrost seemed to power down as the built-up energy began to disperse slowly but steadily. Loki, who was smirking victoriously only moments ago, instantly noticed that something was amiss. Frowning in confusion, Loki looked around and found nothing wrong with the Bifrost or his magic. Even the barrier was still working properly. Gasps filled the room as Loki saw his family looking at the control panel below him. Following their line of sight, Loki finally found the problem. Gungnir was missing. There are two keys to activate the Bifrost. The Spear of Odin, Gungnir, and the Golden Sword of Heimdall. Without either of those two keys, the Bifrost will simply power down and disperse whatever leftover energy it accumulated back into the universe. Looking for this? Peter made his presence known. Instantly, every head in the room snapped to Peter, who was casually standing to the side with Gungnir twirling between his fingers. Haha! Thor laughed in relief. Good work, my friend. Meanwhile, his parents were sighing in relief, as the Bifrost fully shut down without a speck of energy left over. Question mark. Loki stares in shock, not understanding how the oddly dressed mortal could get past his barrier, though he was about to witness how in just a moment. Man Spider, bring down the barrier, Thor says, and Peter waves his hand once again. Instantly, two portals opened in the room, one flat above Peter's open hand and the other directly below the casket of ancient winters. Before everyone's eyes, the casket fell through the portal and into Peter's waiting hand, which in turn caused the barrier around Loki to lose its power source and fade away. No more running now, brother. Thor says as he walks past where the barrier once was. Surrender peacefully. Fine, Loki says as he gives a side-eyed glance towards Gungnir in Peter's hand. Descending toward the ground, Loki feigns accepting his defeat as Thor walks up to him. Just as Thor was about to grab his arm, two daggers drop from Loki's sleeves. Grabbing them by the tips, Loki dashes to the side and threw the two knives toward Thor, who stopped for a moment to sidestep one dagger while swiping the other away with Mjolnir. Since Thor was busy blocking his attack, Loki used his magic to disappear in a puff of smoke and appeared at Peter's side, ready to snatch Gungnir back from him. Thanks to his spider senses, Peter saw this coming and easily backstepped away from Loki's outstretched arm. Picking his leg up, Peter sent a powerful Spartan kick to Loki's chest, launching him across the room and into the wall of the dome with a loud bang. Finders keepers, Peter says as Loki glares at him from the floor across the room. Get your own spear. Seeing that there was still some fighting spirit left in Loki, Peter decided to put an end to this. Hold this, Peter says as he tosses the casket to Thor and turn back to Loki. Let's put you in time out, shall we? An evil smirk appears under Peter's mask as he waves his hand, creating a portal above and below Loki. Ha! Loki grunted as he fell through the bottom portal and continued falling through the one above as well. Eh, aha! This repeated over and over as he only started falling faster and faster, stuck in a loop that never ended. Loki's screams were choppy as they would cut out for a brief second every time he would enter and exited the portals. This reminds me of the game Portal 2. Ayaha! Loki continued falling through the two portals infinitely as everyone watched from the sidelines. Odin was watching Peter with a curious gaze, while his wife and queen, Frigga couldn't help but feel like her youngest son was being bullied at the moment. As for Thor, he was watching his brother's plight with a smile from ear to ear. There have been many times when Loki used his magic to harass him, so Thor felt that this was more than deserved, especially after all that Loki has done lately. Turning his head away from the falling trickster, Thor walked over to his father and mother with a fond smile on his face. Mother, I missed you so much. 
Thor says as he hugs Frigga with one arm, as the other was still holding the casket of ancient winters. Turning to his father, a single tear dropped from Thor's eye. Loki told me I had killed you, Thor says as he wipes the tears from his eyes, chuckling in self-deprecation. I was so stupid to believe him, I know. Odin nodded, as he watched Thor's entire journey on Earth while in Odin sleep. I saw it all. I should have known you would be watching. Thor seemed genuinely happy to be with his parents once again. From all that I saw, I know you'll be a wise king, Odin declares, showing Thor a proud look that only a father could give. If Loki weren't falling endlessly, then he would be quite jealous right about now, Peter thought as he laughed inwardly. There will never be a wiser king than you, father. I have much to learn. I understand that now, but someday perhaps I will make you proud. Thor looks to his father in determination. You've already made me proud. Odin reveals, only brightening Thor's smile more and more. Frigga, who was currently supporting her husband so that he could stand and walk, watched all of this with a happy smile on her face. In her mind, this is how their families should have always been, Loki included, of course. Father, I would like to introduce you to my friend from Midgard, Manspider, Thor says as he gestures to Peter. Manspider, this is my father, Odin, yo, Peter says with a wave to Thor's parents, not caring to treat them as royalty, as he isn't from Asgard. Nice to meet you. Thor has told me a bit about the both of you. Yes, I've seen you along with my son in Midgard, Odin says as he nods toward Peter. Thank you for helping him. No problem. What are friends for, right? Peter says with a shrug. Indeed. Frigga nods in agreement, happy that Thor has made a trustable friend. May I? Odin asks as he gestures toward his spear. Oh yeah. Peter mutters as he hands over Gungnir to its rightful owner. Here you go. Grabbing Gungnir and using it as a sort of walking stick, Odin could finally stop leaning on his wife. Although he was still weak and needed more time in his Odin sleep, having his trusted weapon in hand made Odin feel empowered once again. Thank you for your help in this situation and for retuning Gungnir and Mjolnir, Odin says as he looks at Peter with gratitude. Asgard owes you a debt that will be paid. Ayaha! Loki's screams break everyone from their conversation. Turning back to look at his most troubled son, Odin had no idea what to do with him. Thor may have dove headfirst into Jotunheim and started a war, but at least he didn't try to completely annihilate the place. If Loki succeeded, countless men, women, and children would have all perished without any hope of escape or salvation. What Loki did was far too extreme for Odin to look past. Call the guards, Odin says to Frigga, who was still looking at Loki in pity. Have them prepare a special prison cell for Loki. It needs to be able to withstand his magic and keep him trapped. Do we have to imprison him? Frigga asks, afraid for Loki's mental state should he be imprisoned by his family. Yes, don't worry. You may visit him at any time. Odin says with compassion toward his wife. Sadly, Loki's crimes can't be overlooked this time. Might I make a suggestion? Peter inserts himself into the conversation, as Loki continues to scream and fall. Speak. Odin nods easily. First, would you say Thor's banishment was a success? Peter asks as he pats Thor on the shoulder. Both parents go quiet and observe Thor before smiles adorn their faces. Yes, I would say Thor's time in Midgard has done wonders for him, Odin replies, receiving a nod of agreement from his wife. Then why not give Loki the same treatment? Peter asks, getting reluctant nods of agreement from both Thor and Frigga. A temporary banishment to Midgard would be a far better punishment than being imprisoned in a dark and lonely jail cell under the palace, though Odin didn't look fully convinced. That sounds good, but Loki is far more skilled in the art of magic than most could ever hope to achieve. It wouldn't be long before he put together a spell to cause his usual chaos, even as a normal human, Odin says with a shake of his head. Hmm, is there not a way to cut him off from the energies that he could use? Peter asks and the room goes silent in contemplation. I can help with that. A familiar female voice appears in the Bifrist. 
Thor instantly got back into battle mode, as he turned around in a flash with lightning dancing around his figure once again, while his mother and father simply turned with surprised looks on their faces. Teacher, this is the second time today that you've shown yourself, Peter says with a knowing smile on his face. Are you trying to tell me something? Atop the control panel of the Bifrist, the Ancient One stood with her usual bald head and monk robes. No, now would you like my assistance or not? She answers, annoyed with her student to no end. Who is that? Odin asks Thor, as he could feel that his newest guest was extremely powerful, possibly more powerful than himself and just as old too. I'm known as the Ancient One, she says as she could hear their conversation. She teaches the mystic arts on Earth. Peter reveals, knowing that Odin would find out soon enough. I've learned everything I know from her. If you have a solution, then we would gladly accept your help. Frigga looks to the Ancient One for help. Without another word, the Ancient One turns to the still-falling Loki and waves her hand. Immediately, countless spell circles surrounded the two portals. In just a few moments, the spells converged into a singular spell circle, which then floated in between the two portals like a sandwich. As Loki fell from the top portal and passed through it, the spell circle wrapped around his falling form, disappearing into his body. Done. Loki won't be able to harness any of the universe's energies from here on out. Though my spell will dissipate when you return his powers, the Ancient One says as she fades away, leaving an impressed Asgardian royal family behind. I have many questions, but that can be handled later, Odin says as grips Gungnir tightly and looks toward Peter. Bring me my son. With a wave of his hand, Peter moved the top portal to Odin. Ayaha! Loki screamed as he fell from the portal and hit the floor at max speed. Bang! Breathing heavily, Loki looked up from the ground and found his father standing menacingly over him. Loki Odinson, you have almost destroyed an entire realm in your childish rage. Through your arrogance, resentment, and anger, you wish to commit one of the most heinous acts I've ever witnessed genocide. The Allfather says as he limps over and plunges Gungnir into the Bifrost's control panel. The Bifrost's energy begins building as it activates. Soon, it fires, and the Bifrost opens at the end of the platform, creating a portal. Odin turns to his second son and limps over with a resigned look on his face. This would be the second time he would cast out one of his sons in just a week's time. Three altogether if he was counting his daughter Hela as well. You are unworthy of your former titles, Odin says as he rips away the insignias on Loki's clothes, which showed that he was a prince of Asgard. And most certainly unworthy of the loved ones you have betrayed and disappointed. Wait, let's not be too hasty, father. Loki tries to reason with Odin, but the time for that had passed. Mother, stop him, please. Frigga could do nothing but watch in sadness as her son pleaded for her help. I hereby strip you of your powers. Odin ignores Loki's words and continues on. Instantly, Gungnir glowed brightly and Loki could feel his godly powers being ripped away from him. In the name of my father and of his father before him, Odin bangs the butt of his spear to the ground, stripping Loki of all clothes that identified him as an Asgardian. I cast you out. As Odin proclaims this, a powerful gust of wind blows, launching Loki across the room and into the open Bifrost. As soon as Loki was gone, Odin collapsed to the floor, entering Odin's sleep once again. New York City 485 West 64th Street, alias Investigations. In a rundown office building, where anyone can rent a meager space for their business, a black-haired woman can be seen sitting at a desk in a small office. She wore a black leather jacket, black shirt, and stylishly ripped jeans. Insert picture of Jessica Jones here. An elderly woman sat across from her, crying into some tissues she conveniently had in her purse. Between the two on the desk were photos of an elderly man and what appeared to be his much younger mistress. The man was naked and tied to the bed of a hotel room. Standing above him was a young woman, dressed in black latex and wielding a small whip. The age gap between the two was immense, 
as the man in the photo could probably pass as this young dominatrix's grandfather. How could he do this? The elderly woman cried as she felt nothing but betrayal and disgust. We've been married for 40 years. For Christ's sake. This woman, like many others that Jessica Jones encounters in her daily work, became suspicious of her husband, thinking that he could be having an affair. Not knowing how to handle it, she asked a friend, and they pointed her in the direction of alias investigations. The small private detective agency that was created and owned by Jessica Jones. Well, look at the bright side. Jessica draws her attention away from the incriminating photos. You can divorce his sorry but take his money, and spend the rest of your life as a single woman. Maybe move to a place with a beach and mingle with the local grandpas? Jessica's attempt at brightening the mood seemed to have missed the mark, as her client only cried harder as she grabbed the photos and swiftly left the room, slamming the door loudly on the way out. Hey! Jessica yelled as she ran to the door and ripped it open. You forgot my money! Unluckily, the elevator in the hallway had already closed, and the woman was on her way down to the first floor of the building. This old bitch! Jessica muttered as she prepared to rush down the stairwell to get what was owed to her. Suddenly, just before she could leave the room, a blinding rainbow-colored light pierced through the windows behind her desk. Huh? What the? She muttered as the room brightened in an instant. Shatter. Bang. Just as the light became almost blinding, something or rather someone crashed through the window, breaking the glass and destroying her desk on impact. As the light died down, Jessica could see a naked man laying unconscious in the rubble that was once her desk. Jessica just stood there for a moment, without a clue of what to do or what just happened. No, I'm not dealing with this right now. Leaving the sleeping nudist in her office, Jessica rushed down the stairs to get her payment before her client could get away. She would deal with her odd visitor soon enough. It's not like he's going anywhere. After Odin collapsed, Thor and Peter carefully carried his unconscious body back to the palace, where he would, hopefully, sleep peacefully this time. Though, he certainly wouldn't be bored this time around, as the trials and tribulations of a human Loki will definitely make for some good entertainment. As they laid him on his bed once again, Frigga looked him over for a moment before turning to Peter and Thor. He'll be all right, she informed them, which caused Thor to let out a relieved breath. He just needs to sleep uninterrupted this time. That's good, Thor said as he looked at his father's powerless form. He has never seen his father in such a weakened state before, so this was an odd sight for him. Every child tends to think that their parents are superheroes that would live forever, so it's always vexing when they become old and weak. I never get used to seeing him like this, Frigga admits as she joins Thor in watching Odin sleep. There's always this fear in the back of my mind that he won't wake. Although Thor was having this same feeling, he squashed it down and moved to his mother's side, hugging her with a single arm. Father will wake up soon enough, he says with confidence, trying his best to comfort Frigga. We must only wait. Frigga has been having a very emotional week. She only wanted her family to be together and happy, Yet that seemed like a far-off dream at this point. At least, Thor is back. But now her other son has been banished just the same. I should go and investigate the palace, Thor says after a moment of silence. Who knows what else Loki has done in my and father's absence. Oh yes, I almost forgot, Frigga says with a smile, as she takes Gungnir and hands it over to Thor. The king of Asgard has returned. Ah, uh, Thor froze as he didn't feel like much of a king anymore. I don't know if I should be king anymore. An awkward silence fills the room, which Peter decides to fill. Great leaders don't seek power. They're called to it by necessity. Peter repeats a quote he remembers seeing in a novel. There are two heirs of Asgard's royal family, at least that I know of. You and Loki. If you aren't king, then that would leave Loki as the only other candidate. I think we can all agree that he isn't a viable option. Frigga wanted to speak and defend Loki but decided to keep quiet, as her second son's latest actions were hard to overlook. Then father can remain as king, Thor argues back. Oh! Peter raises a challenging eyebrow under his mask. 
You mean the man that seems to go into a forced coma every once in a while? Tell me how long until this happens again and Loki takes control of Asgard. Thor's face scrunches as Peter hits him with a big helping of reality. Like it or not, this place needs you. Grow up and get your head out of your butt. Peter says harshly, hoping to get through to him. You're right. Thor mutters as he takes the spear from his mother. Though, I'll return Gungnir to father once he awakens. I have Mjolnir after all. Good. Just don't expect me to treat you any different, Peter says as he pats Thor on the back. I'm not an Asgardian citizen, so you ain't my king. Thor didn't seem to care as he laughed at Peter's words, happy that his new friend wouldn't treat him differently. Make your father proud, Frigga says as the sight of Thor holding Gungnir reminds her of a much younger Odin. I will. After taking back his rightful place as king of Asgard, Thor started investigating all of Loki's actions while he was away. It didn't take him long to find Heimdall, thawing in a cell in the dungeons of the palace, among other high-level palace members, such as ministers and royal guards, who refused to follow Loki's orders. While Thor was freeing these people and investigating, Peter was seated in the palace's library, reading anything that sparked his interest. He knew, thanks to the movies of his past life, that the universe was vast and full of intelligent life, so Peter wanted to learn all that he could about the different races, planets, and empires that were out there. Dwarves, light and dark elves, frost giants, fire demons, titans, cronins, sicarans, chitauris, andarians, krylorians, kree, and the list goes on and on. Sadly, this library doesn't hold any magical knowledge, but that was okay. It still held a plethora of useful information. The most useful being the location of a planet that Peter needed more than anything. Morag. At least, he hoped the location of planet Morag would be here, as there are just so many books to go through. Looking up at the countless towering bookshelves, Peter couldn't help but wish that he had some sort of cloning ability. Staying in the library deep into the night, Peter kindly refused to attend the return feast that was held for Thor. He knew that he was close as he opened yet another book with a title related to foreign worlds. Skimming through it, Peter finally found what he was looking for. Morag is an oceanic planet located in the Andromeda Galaxy at the eclipsing binary star M31 VJ 00443799. Nine two three six. Some inhabitants of this planet were the rodent-like Orloni and aquatic crocodile-like creatures. He read as a triumphant smirk appeared on his tired face. Time to get my first infinity stone. Upon finding the spatial coordinates of Morag, the planet that holds the power infinity stone, Peter started formulating a plan to find the damn thing. Finding the planet itself was a good start, but based on his memories, narrowing down its location on Morag would be a challenge. Due to the extremely destructive capabilities of the Power Stone, a containment device known as the Orb was used to house it. Without the Orb keeping the Power Stone's unlimited power locked away, Morag would have probably been completely disintegrated long ago. So tracking its energy signature would be impossible, Peter thought dejectedly. Not only that but the Orb has been hidden for millennia in an underwater temple vault on the planet where receding tides allowed access only once every 300 years. Something tells me it's not that time just yet. Peter knew this would only happen around the time that Peter Quill slash Star-Lord came along, which means Peter would have to go diving in an alien planet's ocean. Maybe I can predict the movement of the tides and use that to aid in my search. The most important factors in predicting tides on any planet are the positions of the sun and moon, depending on if Morag even has a moon, their distance from Earth, their direction in space, and how they're moving. Though the most accurate predictions require even more information than this, such as the contours of the seafloor, for example. I'd have to set up a base on Morag so I can study all of this. Peter thought out loud as he snapped the book he was reading shut. Shouldn't be too hard, hopefully. Must you tamper with the Power Stone? A familiar voice filled Peter's small corner of the library. I've told you many times already, teacher, Peter says as he looks up to see the Ancient One sitting across from him. I plan to change a lot, including your death. The Ancient One remained silent as her brows knit together for just a moment. 
You could make this easier and lend a helping hand like you've been doing lately, Peter says, hoping to skip past the tedious research needed to find the orb. Where is the temple that holds the orb? Peter knew for a fact that the Ancient One knew exactly where every Infinity Stone is located. The question is, would she help him in his collection of them? I think I've helped enough lately, she says as her form shimmers for a moment and disappears, leaving Peter alone in the library once again. It was worth a try, since Peter had the actual space coordinates for Planet Morag, he could go there in an instant, but before that, he would need to get some supplies for the creation of his base. Leaving a note for Thor, saying that he would be back soon, Peter portaled over to the Avengers Tower. Bang clank bang clank. As the portal closed behind him, Peter could hear the loud sounds of metal being struck over and over coming from Tony's workshop. Giving in to his curiosity, Peter made his way into the workshop and witnessed Tony, standing over the lifeless destroyer. He wore a metal welding mask and wielded a sledgehammer, which he was using to forcibly take the giant thing apart, piece by piece. Yo! Peter called out over the loud banging, resting the hammer on his shoulder with one hand and pulling up his face mask with the other. Tony looks at Peter with an annoyed look on his face. You ditched me. The first words out of his mouth were a complaint. Well, the next time a portal to an advanced alien civilization opens up, hop in before it closes, Peter gave him some advice. Right? Tony said sarcastically. So, is everything in Valhalla good? Asgard, but yeah. All of Thor's problems have been solved. Peter says as he goes on to explain everything that happened in Asgard. You're telling me that Thor's evil brother is walking around somewhere on Earth? Tony asks, receiving a nod from Peter. Any idea where he is? Nope. But I can probably ask Thor later. He might know. Peter says with a shrug. Okay. Wanna help me take this thing apart? Tony motions toward the huge robot between them. I could use your super strength. This thing is hard to break open. Sure. But I need some help procuring some supplies. Peter says, knowing that it would take Tony only a fraction of the time to get everything he needs for Morag. Supplies for what? Tony asks curiously. I'm planning an expedition to an abandoned alien planet. Peter says as he lists off the different equipment and materials he needed. I can easily get all of that by tomorrow on one condition. Tony says as he holds up a single finger and smirks. I get to tag along. Sure. Peter answered easily as he didn't see a problem with having Tony's help. I don't mind. Putting their minds together would only quicken his search for the Power Stone. Of course, Peter wouldn't be sharing the treasure he finds with Tony this time around. Usually, Peter wouldn't have a problem with sharing, especially with his friends, but the Infinity Stones are far too dangerous for that. There's a reason that the Power Stone was placed into the orb. His power is immense and never-ending. Just its mere presence will cause the destruction of any person or planet, no matter how strong. Even Thanos can't handle the limitless power of the Infinity Stones without using his gauntlet as a medium. Not to mention the Power Stone, which is the most destructive of all six Infinity Stones. Sadly, Peter barely trusted himself with the Power Stone, as he planned to leave it in the orb until his own medium could be made. Maybe I should ask the dwarves to forge me an Infinity Gauntlet? Peter thought, but he would need to draw up some blueprints for them to use as reference. It would be hard to convince them, though. Peter would probably have to ask Thor for help in convincing them. Even then, it would still be hard to get it made. The dwarves would certainly understand what the gauntlet is for when they see the blueprints. Whatever, if they decline, then I can try my hand at forging. It would be difficult, though. Peter thought as Tony made some calls for his supplies. Looking down at the powerless destroyer, Peter put these thoughts to the back of his mind and started tearing it apart as promised. Up! Hey! Ache up! Loki Odinson groaned in pain as he heard a voice calling out to him. It was a female voice, laced with a rude annoyance, which reminded him of his usual tone. I said wake up! Slap! The voice yelled as his jaw almost cracked and a fierce stinging feeling was left on his right cheek. Ha! Huh. Loki grunted as he opened his eyes to find a beautiful black-haired woman with a scowl plastered on her face. Mortal! 
What did you just call me? She asked threateningly. Where am I? Loki ignores her menacing figure and looked around, finding that he was laying undressed in a heap of broken wood near a broken window. He even had a few splinters and bruises on his back, which hurt quite a bit. My office, now get your butt up and to the bank. You owe me money for all the damage that you've caused, she says, doing her best to look away from his unclothed lower half. Bank? Loki muttered as the memories of his father casting him out suddenly filled his addled mind. Instantly, Loki became quiet as a simmering rage filled his every being. How dare they banish me? Loki thought as he raged in his own mind. Don't glare at me, you pervert. The unknown woman above him gets pissed. As Loki began to glare in her direction, you're responsible for every bit of damage to my business, and you'll pay or else... Snapping out his anger-fueled thoughts, Loki stood up and scoffed at the weak mortal before him. How could a god such as him allow a mere mortal to speak to him like this? Or what? Loki says as he glares down at her intimidatingly. I'll post these pictures online, she says, showing her smartphone screen to him, which had countless pictures of him laying naked in her office. His little Loki was bare for all to see. What would his mother think? Give me that. Loki tries to snatch the phone from her hand, but she saw that coming and grabbed his wrist with her other hand, crushing it in her superhuman grip. Crack, crack. Ah. Loki yelled as his wrist was broken in an instant. You will pay or else. She says as she gives Loki's wrist a final squeeze before letting go. Do I make myself clear? Loki eyes her warily and cradles his broken wrist. This isn't some ordinary mortal. After taking the destroyer apart for Tony, they found that it was just a hollow set of armor. No power source or robotics. Nothing. It was completely empty, though they did find something interesting. What appeared to be Nordic runes were carved all over the inner portion of the armor. While the outside looked sleek and smooth, the inside was covered with lines and symbols. Seeing this, Tony couldn't help but stare in awe as he finally had his first run-in with magic. Peter knew this would happen sooner or later, so he heaved a heavy sigh and opened a portal. I'll be right back, he said, confusing Tony as he stepped into the portal. Only a minute later, Peter returned with a stack of old books in hand. Tony watched in curiosity as his spidery friend placed the books in front of him. What's this? Tony asked as he picked up one of the books. Runic magic for dummies? Seriously? Remember when we first met and you asked how I made the portals and I said magic? Tony nods so Peter continues. Well, I didn't lie. Magic is a thing? Tony asks as realization started to set in. That bald woman taught you, didn't she? Yeah. She's probably the strongest person on this planet and possibly the universe. Peter brags a bit about his teacher's strength. She's called the Ancient One. I've been trying to recruit her to join the Avengers for a while now. Ha! Huh? Tony grunts as he plops down into his desk chair in shock. This is... A lot, I know. Peter tries to finish Tony's words but got them wrong for once. So cool. Tony practically jumps out of his seat and starts pacing around the room. I could use the metal from the destroyer to create a new suit and add these runes to it. Tony started monologuing his every thought as he planned to make the ultimate magic-infused Iron Man suit. Peter thought it would take Tony a bit longer to wrap his head around magic being real, but it seems he underestimated him. Just as Peter was thinking this, Tony started trying to write the runes that were on the destroyer. Acting quickly before his friend killed himself or some other accident happened, Peter snatched the pen from Tony's hand. Hey! Tony shouts as he turns to Peter. Runes are too dangerous for you to be writing without any knowledge. Peter reprimands Tony as he pushes the books in front of him once again. Memorize these first and then you can start practicing under my supervision. Tony stayed quiet for a moment, as he doesn't like being told what to do. Though after some thought, he understood that magic was new to him and he would have to take Peter's advice. After all, Tony has studied for years to be able to create the things he does in his workshop. Diving headfirst into something new and dangerous wouldn't be smart, especially when he has someone so willing to help him get started. 
Is your teacher okay with you showing me this? Tony asks as he holds up one of the books. Magic is supposed to be a secret, right? There's a reason why magic isn't widely known all around the world. After all, someone has been keeping it under wraps. That someone being the ancient one herself. She shouldn't mind, Peter says with a shake of his head. You discovered the runes on your own. I'm only stepping in so you don't accidentally cause some sort of catastrophe. If you say so, seeing as Tony had some reading to do, the study of the destroyer was put aside for the time being. Before leaving for home, as he hasn't slept yet, Peter snapped some pictures of the runes inside the destroyer for his own personal studying. Asgardian runes are hard to come by, Peter thought as he carefully took his pictures before heading home to sleep. By the next day, everything that Peter needed for his expedition to Morag had arrived at the Avengers Tower. The only question was, would Tony be coming along still? As soon as Peter arrived at the tower, Tony was passed out in the same place he left him, surrounded by open books. He spent the whole night studying the rune books that Peter gave him, and fell asleep in his seat. Maybe it's best that I set up the base before Tony comes. Peter mutters as he portals Tony to his bed, leaving him to his sleep. Arriving at an underground storage area in the tower, Peter found everything he needed. Time to head out, I guess. Peter thought as he waved his hand, using the coordinates to open a portal to planet Morag. As the portal appeared, Peter peeked through it cautiously, making sure nothing went wrong. On the other side of the portal was what Peter could only describe as a rocky wasteland, filled with fog and clouds. Definitely a foreign planet, Peter thought as he ran a few safety tests before stepping through. Just from looking, Peter could say that it looked to be the same Morag from Guardians of the Galaxy. But that didn't mean he would step through the portal so easily. He would only enter Morag when he knew it was safe to do so. Almost an hour later, Peter had used both magic and a few of the devices that Tony procured for him to test things like Morag's air quality, temperature, radiation, etc. From the movie, Peter knew that Morag's air was at the very least breathable, as Star-Lord was able to walk around without his mask. But this is the real world, so he would be careful. At the very least, Peter would die without air to breathe. Once everything had been tested, Peter found that the planet was barely habitable, as he suspected. The only thing wrong with the place was the fact that it was nothing but a rocky wasteland alongside some ocean, which made it clear why the planet is empty now. I can see why this planet was abandoned, Peter thought as he eyed the place. I doubt anything could grow here either. With that all out of the way, Peter started carrying materials through the portal. Metal sheets, beams, concrete bags, and other materials that he would use to build a small base in a safe and elevated location. As he made his first step onto a foreign planet's soil and breathed in its air, Peter felt a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, he visited Asgard already, but that wasn't really a planet. Morag just had a different feel to it. Let's get to work. Waking up from his exhaustion-induced sleep, Tony saw the time and cursed as he found that he slept for most of the day. Looking out the nearby window, he saw that the sun was already beginning to set. Jarvis, did Webhead's order come in yet? Tony asks as he gets up and heads for the bathroom. Yes, Jarvis answered as he goes on to explain what Peter has been doing in the tower while he slept. That mother schmucker. Tony cursed as he rushed downstairs, not wanting to be left behind. He was already left behind when it came to Asgard so he wouldn't be ditched again. Entering the underground storage area, Tony rushed to Peter's open portal and froze as he saw the barren, otherworldly landscape of an alien planet. Over on a nearby hilltop, Tony found what appeared to be a metal structure being built by a familiar blue and red figure. Without thinking of his safety, Tony steps through the portal and walks up the hill, not thinking to run any of the tests that Peter did earlier in the day. Boom! Hearing someone walking his way, Peter dropped a heavy metal beam to the ground and hopped off the partially built base to greet them. Yo! Peter said with a wave as Tony made it up the hill, out of breath from the walk. Have you been slacking on your training? Shut up! Tony breathes heavily as he glares at Peter. You left me behind again. No! You stayed up all night reading about runes, Peter says with a shake of his head. If you wanted to visit an alien planet bright and early in the morning, 
then you should have gone to sleep and woken up in time. I also left the portal open for you. Whatever. So what are we here for? Tony asks as he recalled all of the different devices Peter asked for. Obviously, you want to predict this planet's tides for some reason, but why? Because I need something that's under the ocean. Peter says cryptically as he lifts the giant metal beam once again and returns to the partially built base. What might that be? Tony asks curiously. I'm not telling you. Peter calls out over his shoulder. If you knew what it was, You'd want me to share, and that's not happening this time around. Don't be like that, webhead. Tony yells back. Didn't your mother teach you that sharing is caring? In an icy tundra, two warmly dressed U.S. government agents step out of their truck to meet a lone man. They were called in to investigate a large unidentified object that was found by a research team in the Arctic, which was a job no one wanted to do. After all, it was a frozen wasteland out there though they couldn't just leave it as it could be something important like a Russian spy satellite or something. Could even be aliens. Of course, no one actually believed that. Was it you who called it in? One of the agents yells over the loud icy winds. Yeah, I think it's a weather balloon or something. The lone man answers. All right, lead the way. The other agent called out as they trudged through the wind and snow. Whatever it is, it's buried halfway into the ice. We only found it a few days ago. The man that was leading them explained as they walked. How long before we can start craning it out? One of the agents asks. I don't think you quite understand. What appears to be a very large airplane wing comes into view, peeking out of the icy floor. You guys are going to need one hell of a crane. What the? After getting over their shock, the agents worked with the research team to find a way into the airship or whatever it was. Almost an hour later while working in the freezing winds, they managed to thaw out a hatch that one of the researchers found. With it thawed, the agents cracked it open and rappelled down, entering the unknown object. The inside was dark and covered in thick layers of frosty ice. The agents had to use flashlights to see as they maneuvered around, exploring what they now could say for sure was an old-school bomber airplane. After only about 10 minutes of exploring, the two agents found the cockpit of the ship, which was huge with a giant glass window that was somehow still intact. Through the glass window, the agents could see the dark ocean under the ice they walked on moments earlier. While one agent was enraptured by the dark ocean view, the other turned his flashlight to investigate further. Sticking out of the ice by the control panel of the ship, the agent's light reflected off of a frosty red, white, and blue circular object. Holy shit! Morag, we're finally finished, Tony says as he admires the metal base. What do you mean, we? Peter says with a bit of sass in his voice. I did all of the work. You just sat around and did nothing the whole time. Hey, I helped with the door. Tony tries to defend his laziness. You handed me a screwdriver. Peter gives Tony a deadpan look under his mask. Whatever, let's explore now. Tony changes the subject in an instant, ready to venture into an unknown planet. I want to take some samples and see if there's any life on this rock. No, we're headed back for now, Peter says as he just wants to rest after a long day's work. Oh, come on, webhead. Tony starts acting like a spoiled child. There's a whole alien planet for us to explore. Not all of us woke up an hour ago. Peter says as he creates a portal next to Tony. We can do everything you want tomorrow. But until then, I want to do nothing but stuff my face with food. Fine. Tony gave in as he wasn't brave enough to go off on his own. Not that Peter would allow him to do so in the first place. As the two returned to Earth through the portal, Peter and Tony's phones instantly started going off like crazy. There was no service on Morag, so as soon as they arrived... Every missed call and text message came in at the same exact time. I can't go away for a single day, can I? Peter complained as he checked his phone, expecting the usual problems. Ha! Huh. Every text and call he received was from Fury and Natasha, who were people that would never spam his phone like this. Usually, it's complaints from staff about the more problematic Avengers like Magneto's bunch. Minus 9 missed calls minus 17 text messages bald pirate. Call me bald pirate. Answer your phone bald pirate. Call me. 
important. Natasha's texts were about the same, but hers made up the majority of them. Same for you, huh? Tony says as he snuck a look at Peter's phone. Moving his phone from Tony's sight, Peter ignores him and calls Fury. Ring, ring, ring. Where have you been? Fury asks angrily as he answers the call. Off planet, Peter says knowing Fury wouldn't believe him. Why have you been blowing up my phone like an angry girlfriend? Fury could hear Tony laughing in the background, which annoyed him to no end. Get to the council room. Fury ignores Peter's words and hangs up the phone. He seems cranky today. Isn't he always? Arriving at the council room, Peter was surprised to find every council member in attendance. What's going on? Peter asked as he and Tony took their seats, waiting to hear what this was all about. Tapping a few buttons on the table, a holographic image of a giant airplane appeared above the table. A team of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents was deployed to the Arctic to investigate an unknown object in the ice. They found this, Fury explains as he gestures to the hologram. A Nazi Hydra bomber plane from World War II. Is it that time already? Peter wondered as he instantly thought of the first superhero in this world's history. Though it's what they found inside the plane that caused the need for this meeting. Fury says as he hits another button, causing the floating image to change to a frozen figure in red, white, and blue clothing. Insert picture of Captain America here. Yup, that's the capsicle alright. Peter confirmed instantly. Is that who I think it is? Professor Xavier asks in surprise. Yes, we found Captain America. Fury confirms as he switches to a close-up of Steve Rogers' frosty face. I see the importance of this, but why are we here? Magneto asks in annoyance, as he was in the middle of something before this meeting was called. Give the guy a proper burial and call it a day. That's the thing. Fury says as he hits another button and a video plays of a sleeping Steve Rogers in a hospital bed. He's still alive. The room goes silent as everyone watches the video, spotting the active heartbeat monitor connected to Steve's hand. Not only that, but his chest would rise and fall ever so slightly as he breathed in and out. That's impossible. Charles mutters in disbelief. No, the ice must have preserved him. Tony says as he starts thinking of an explanation for this. The super soldier experiment must have made it possible for him to survive for all this time. Do we know if he'll wake up? Peter asks, knowing the answer to his own question already. No idea. The doctors are still running tests, Fury says with an unknowing shrug. Once the tests are finished, I'll have him moved here. How should we handle him if he wakes up? Charles raises the question everyone was thinking. He's practically a time traveler. The world has changed significantly, and everyone he knew is most likely dead by now. Let's worry about that later, Peter says as he turns to Fury. Have the doctors keep him sedated for the time being. We can't have him freaking out when he wakes up. He might accidentally kill a nurse or something. It's always best to err on the side of caution when dealing with superpowered individuals. Already done, Fury says as his phone suddenly goes off. Checking his phone, Fury reads a quick text and stashes it away again. The tests are finished. All vitals are normal, including brain activity, and transport is on the way to bring Rogers here as we speak. Fury recounts the message he just received. Well, then we should get ready to welcome our time traveler. We'll send out rescue ships. We'll find you. Peggy Carter's voice plays out over the radio. I don't think there's going to be much left to find. Steve tells her in a resigned tone as the Hydra bomber, he was currently in nosedives toward the icy ground. The love of his life, Peggy Carter, didn't reply. He knew she was using every bit of her brilliant mind to think of ways to save him. Insert picture of Peggy Carter here, Peggy. Steve calls her over the radio. I'm here. Peggy answers with a shaky voice as if she were crying. Steve stares at a photo of Peggy as the nose of the plane grew closer and closer to the ground. I'm gonna need a rain check on that dance. He says with a fond smile. Hey, all right. Next Saturday. The Stork Club. She stutters, hiding her crying as best as she could. Okay, you got it. Steve agrees, ignoring his impending doom while enjoying his time with the woman he loves. 
8 o'clock on the dot. If you're three minutes late, I'm leaving. Do you understand? Peggy warns him jokingly. I still don't know how to dance. He laughs in self-deprecation. I'll show you. I'll show you everything. Just be there. She tells him pleadingly. Clouds whip past the windows as the plane plummets. Steve pockets the picture and slides his mask over his face. As Arctic ice rushes up at the cockpit window. Maybe the band could play something slow. I'd hate to step on your dash boom. In a futuristic looking hospital room. Steve Rogers could be seen shaking in his sleep. He tossed and turned for a few moments. Before shooting up out of the bed with a loud gasp for air. Heavy breathing. Peggy. Steve's first thought was for the woman he loves. While he was getting his breathing under control, Steve looked around the room for any sort of information. Where am I? He mutters as he sees the futuristic medical equipment and a flat-screen TV on the wall. New York, jumping out of bed and to his feet. Captain America turns to see a masked red and blue man sitting in the corner of the room with a glowing device in hand. Smartphone. Who are you? Steve asks, ready to fight at any moment. Spider-Man. Peter answers as he points toward the window behind Steve. You may want to be careful. Even in today's age, hospital gowns are rather revealing. Freezing in place, Steve feels a cool breeze on his backside. The captain acts quickly and does his best to cover up, not taking his eyes off the strange masked man. There are clothes on the nightstand by the bed, Peter says as he stands, which causes Steve to fidget in anticipation of a fight. I'll be waiting outside. I've seen enough of America's ass for the day. Without waiting for a reply, Peter walks out of the room, leaving a very bewildered Captain America behind. As soon as the masked stranger left the room, Steve rushed to get dressed in an Avengers-branded sweatsuit and sneakers. With clothes to cover himself, the captain took a moment to search the room for clues of his whereabouts. Once again, the futuristic appliances and design of the room surprised him. Though what surprised him the most was the view from the floor-to-ceiling windows. Instantly, he knew the man from earlier wasn't lying. This was New York City for sure. He was too high up to see the people and cars below clearly, but the architecture of some of the buildings was somewhat recognizable. Some even had these neon lights which caused them to light up the night sky. What's happening? Steve muttered as he worked up the courage to walk out the door. As he stepped out into the hallway, Steve found the same stranger from earlier leaning against the wall across from him. Welcome to Avengers Tower, Cap, Peter says as he kicks off the wall and strolls down the hall. Follow me. Look, I don't have time for whatever this is, Steve says as he chases after Peter. I have to get in touch with the military and debrief. No, you don't, Peter says as he stops to look Steve in the eye. Just follow me. It'll be easier if you see for yourself. Steve reluctantly followed along into an elevator that went all the way to the first floor. Due to Captain America's late awakening, the lower portion of the tower was empty, as the large majority of Stark Industries employees clocked out of work hours ago. Seeing that he was being taken to the first floor, Steve was more at ease, as it would be easier for him to escape this way. As the elevators opened, Peter took Steve to the main entrance, where the security greeted Peter with the utmost respect, surprising Steve. After all, Peter looked like some sort of masked criminal to him. Stark Industries? Steve muttered as he saw the sign in the lobby. Yep, the lower half of the tower is the headquarters for Stark Industries, while the upper half is the Avengers headquarters. Peter explains as they step out of the building and into the sidewalk. Avengers? Steve thought in confusion. Although it was late, New York was known as the city that never sleeps, so the passing pedestrians instantly recognized Spider-Man and whipped out their phones to capture this rare moment. What are they doing? Steve asks in confusion. I'm a bit famous. Don't mind them, Peter says as he motions to the waiting black car. Hop in. What model is this? Steve asks as he admires the modern car. Did Howard start making cars? Only a Stark could make something so futuristic after all. No. Now hurry up. If we stay for too long a crowd will form and I'll be stuck here for days signing autographs and taking pictures, Peter says as he pushes the captain into the back of the car and hops in behind him. 
Get us out of here, Happy. You got it, Spider Boss. Happy replies as he drives off. Take us to Times Square. Peter tells him as he sits back and watches Steve, who had his eyes glued to the window. Are you going to tell me what's going on now, Spider Guy? Steve turns to Peter and asks, Spider Man, and the fact that you haven't figured it out yet is worrying. Peter says as he takes out his phone and pulls up the captain's medical report. Maybe you do have brain damage? Hey! Steve exclaims with a disgruntled look on his face. I've been extremely patient with whatever this is. I will not dash, we're here. Happy calls out from the front seat. Look out of the window again. Peter instructs. Modern cars honk and roar in the street. Towering plasma screen billboards play advertisements. New Age people rush here and there with cell phones in hand. Futuristic architecture and art fill Steve's eyes, causing him to stagger in his seat. Who are you, really? Steve turns to Peter once again. Spider-Man. Peter answers simply, smiling under his mask. The others wanted to put up a show and break it to you slowly, but I thought it best not to beat around the bush. Break what? Steve asks pointedly. You've been asleep for almost 70 years. Cap, Peter reveals the truth. Steve turns back to the window, stunned by this realization. Seventy years. Steve mutters in dread. What about the war? Steve turns back to Peter. Did we win? Yup. Unconditional surrender. Peter nods as he motions back out the window. If we didn't then you would be seeing a very different world right now. You played a very big part in securing that victory. Steve didn't know how to react to all of this. How am I alive? He asks in confusion. Dr. Erskine's formula combined with the extreme cold of the Arctic somehow preserved you. The second we thawed you out, your heart started beating again. Peter explains. I know it's a lot to swallow, but the world's not as different as it looks. There's still work to be done. Peter says as he reaches into the front seat pulling over Steve's battered shield. The world could still use a man like you. If you're up for it, that is. He would make a good director of the Avengers. Peter thought as he handed the shield back to its rightful owner. Aye, aye. Steve didn't know what to say as he barely knew what was happening. Take your time. You've earned it, Peter says with a shrug. Just know that there's a place for you in the Avengers if you're interested. Of course, Steve had no idea what the Avengers were, but he would learn soon enough. The car goes silent as Happy starts driving them back to Avengers Tower. Are you alright? Peter asks. Yeah, it's just... Steve looked out of the window sadly. I had a date. After dropping the truth bomb on Captain America, Happy drove them back to the tower, where Peter gave him a key card to get into and around the building. You're not a prisoner, Peter says as Steve took the card. Feel free to come and go as you please. Though before Steve could run off to explore the new world he has found himself in, Peter showed him to one of the Avengers' apartments. This will be yours for the time being, Peter says as he shows him around what is basically a penthouse apartment. These apartments are for Avengers members, but an exception can be made for you. Ah, thanks. Steve was blown away by the apartment. No problem. Feel free to stay here as long as you want, Peter says with a shrug. Especially if you decide to join the Avengers. What is the Avengers? Steve finally asks. It's a team of superheroes, Peter answers plainly. It started with me here in New York City, stopping bank robberies and rescuing cats from trees. Now we protect the Earth from both foreign and domestic threats. Huh? Steve was speechless for a moment as he looked Peter up and down. Do you have superpowers? Superhero comic books were fairly popular back in his day, so the idea of superheroes was familiar to him at the very least. Yup. Most people in the Avengers have their own superpowers. Peter nods as Steve looks at him with a skeptical look. Don't believe me? No. It just... Steve says but Peter cuts him off. You know what? Peter says as he smiles under his mask. You've been frozen for a long time, old man. Why don't we head to the training room and break in those brittle bones of yours? A confident smile forms on Steve's lips as he nods in agreement. Let's see what you got. Escorting Steve to one of the many padded training rooms, Peter stood across from the man himself. 
Do you want a shield or something? Peter asks, knowing the captain's fighting style. No, hand-to-hand -hand is fine. Steve shakes his head. Okay. Just let me know if you throw out a hip or your arthritis starts acting up. Peter couldn't help but make old man jokes. Kids these days. Steve mutters in annoyance. Who do you think will win? Clint asks as every member of the Avengers watch through the cameras in the training room. The captain. Coulson answers as he holds his Captain America trading cards tenderly. Your opinion doesn't count, fanboy. Tony laughs from the side, pouring himself a drink. Spidey will win, Natasha says confidently. I've trained him and can easily say that Rogers doesn't stand a chance. Coulson ignored her as he continued to root for his hero, Captain America. Everyone else just looked on in curiosity, hoping to see a good fight. Ladies and the elderly first, so make the firsts move, Peter says as he stands casually, waiting for his opponent to start things off. You asked for it. Steve mutters as he kicks off the ground and rushes at Peter faster than Usain Bolt could ever dream of moving. Sadly, this was Spider-Man he was up against. As soon as Steve appeared in front of Peter, extending a fist toward his face, Peter merely twisted his body slightly. With the ease of handling a toddler, Peter dodged everything move Steve threw at him. Punches, kicks, elbows. No matter what Steve did, every one of his attacks was expertly and easily avoided. Steve felt like he was having one of those bad dreams, where no matter how hard he punched his opponent, they were completely unaffected. A slash in. Anyone else have those dreams? You're pretty quick. Peter comments as he dodges a Spartan kick to the chest. All right, I'll stop dodging for you. Thinking that Peter was underestimating him, Steve rushed forward and doubled his efforts. This time, instead of dodging, Peter met every attack thrown at him and parried them to the side. Punches were slapped away while kicks were punted to the side. This seemed to really put things into perspective for Steve. Though he didn't bother slowing down, as he had some aggression to work out and this was the perfect opportunity to do so. Everyone he knew is most likely dead and he missed the life that he was meant to lead with the woman he loved. The anger and resentment inside of Steve needed to be worked out or else he would go crazy. Ah! Steve exclaimed as he tried a new combination of attacks. Of course, they were all knocked away with relative ease. I think it's time to end this, Peter says as he drops down to the floor and spins, sweeping the captain off of his feet and onto his back. Heavy breathing. Good fight, Cap, Peter says genuinely. But Steve felt a sting in those words. Good fight, he says, still catching his breath on the ground. I didn't even put up a fight. That's only because I have more training and superpowers than you, Peter says with a shrug. Now go get some rest. You have a date tomorrow. Ha! Huh. Steve grunted in confusion as he picked himself up off the floor. What do you? You're about 70 years late, but I'm sure she won't mind too much. Peter says as he walks out of the room, leaving a shocked Captain America behind. Peggy's still alive, in a bedroom with a hospital bed in place of a normal bed. An aged white-haired Peggy Carter lays in bed, smiling at the handsome young man sitting at her bedside. Insert picture of old Peggy Carter here. You should be proud of yourself, Peggy. Steve says as he eyes the many pictures at his old lover's bedside. I have lived a life. Peggy turns her head to the photos before looking at Steve sadly. My only regret is that you didn't get to live yours. Steve goes silent for a moment as he looks down at the floor. What is it? Peggy asks, reading him like an open book. For as long as I can remember, I just wanted to do what was right. Steve says as he stares off into the distance. I guess I'm just not quite sure what that is anymore. With the war long over and the world at relative peace, at least for the time being, Steve didn't know what to do with himself. He was engineered in a lab to fight the good fight, yet here he is in a peaceful future without a clue of what to do with himself. You're always so dramatic. Peggy laughs at her young lover. Look, you saved the world. Yeah, I've heard. Steve smiled in her direction. Grabbing Steve's hand and pulling him closer, Peggy looks him straight in the eyes. The world has changed and none of us can go back. Peggy says as regret and sadness fill both of their faces. 
All we can do is our best and sometimes the best we can do is stay over dash, cough cough. Peggy breaks out in a fit of coughs as Steve rushes to get her a glass of water. As he turns back to hand her the glass, Peggy stops coughing and freezes. She looks at Steve with shock and surprise written all over her face. Steve, she asks as her dementia starts showing, completely forgetting the whole conversation they just had. You're alive. Yeah. Steve plays along as he was warned about this earlier. You came back. Peggy begins to cry and weep as she gripped his hand. It's been so long. Well, I couldn't leave my best girl. Not when she owes me a dance. Steve holds back his own tears as he smiles warmly in her direction. The conversation continued for a short while as the two reminisced, but soon Peggy's dementia started acting up again, causing her to forget who he was completely. At that point, Steve's presence seemed to make her uncomfortable, so he said his goodbyes and left, promising to visit again on his way out. Watching sadly from the window at her bedside, Peggy saw Steve get into the back of a black car, which swiftly drove off. That was a cruel thing you just did. A voice appears in the room. Turning her head to her newest visitor, Peggy found none other than Spider-Man himself standing in her doorway. Cruel but effective, Peggy answers without an ounce of regret. Steve needs to move on with his life, and he can't do that while chasing the skirt of a dying old woman. He deserves a happy life after all that he's done. Peggy didn't have Alzheimer's or dementia. No, she just didn't want to be an anchor in the new life of the man she loved. So she did her best to scare him away. What if I said that I could make you young again? Peter says as he strolls in and takes a seat at her bedside. I would say prove it. She eyes Peter with a skeptical, yet curious glare as the old Agent Carter comes out. Well, you would be the first human test subject. Peter admits as he leans back into the chair Steve was in only moments ago. In a way, you would be the proof that it works. How reassuring. Peggy says with a heaping helping of sarcasm. You're already dying. Peter shrugs uncaringly. Either you die during the process or die naturally a week or two from now. At least my option has a chance of survival, not to mention the perk of regaining your youth. Why? She asks. Why what? Peter asks back. Why are you offering me this? Peggy clarifies. Well, if things go as I plan, Steve will become the director of the Avengers, running the day-to-day -day operations, but he isn't exactly the administrative type, is he? Peter says, causing Peggy to unconsciously smile for a moment. No, he isn't, she admits fondly, though that doesn't mean he'll make a bad director. In fact, I think he would be the best person for the job. Peter admits with a shrug. What does this have to do with me? Peggy asks with a raised eyebrow. You want to make me young so that Steve can have a secretary? Although she said that jokingly, Peter nodded in agreement. Yup, though you would be the vice director, not a secretary, he says, shocking her into a silent stupor. Peggy just stared at him for a moment before speaking. You want to use me as a test subject so you can hire me? Pretty much. You helped build S.H.I.E.L.D. and even became its director, a similar position to what I planned for Steve. I also happen to need a test subject as well, so it's a win-win situation. Peggy goes silent for a moment as she weighs her options. On one hand, she has a chance to be with the man she loves. Peggy is already dying and truthfully doesn't have more than a few weeks left. So dying from a failed experiment a couple of weeks earlier isn't that big of a deal to her. On the other hand, she didn't fully believe Peter's words. He says that he's doing this to hire a younger Peggy Carter and use her as a test subject, but she can't shake the feeling that there's more to why he's doing this. Peggy would be correct in that assumption, though it's not as sinister as she presumed. The main reason behind all of this, other than what's already been mentioned, is two things. One, dragon bones are extremely rare and Peter refuses to test them on someone that isn't worth the loss of such a rare material. Not to mention the fact that that test subject would gain countless new years of life and some minor superpowers. 2. Peter planned to change what happened in Infinity War and Endgame. Meaning, if things go the way Peter is planning, then Thanos won't win and there would be no reason for any time traveler shenanigans. Without time travel, Steve would never get to spend a long and happy life with the woman he loves, Peggy Carter. 
Seeing as his interference would ruin Steve and Peggy's happy ending, Peter thought it best to do the couple a favor. Fine, how do we do this? Peggy finally gives her answer. I'm happy you agreed. Peter smiles under his mask as he stands up and walks to the door. I'll be here tomorrow night to pick you up. Make sure you're alone by 7 o'clock. Peggy didn't expect it to happen so fast. So she was stunned into silence as Peter left. What did I just get myself into? As Peter portaled home, he grabbed all of his research for the resurrection elixir alongside the needed amount of crushed dragon bones and portaled to his old secret lair. I haven't used this place since the Avengers Tower was finished. Peter muttered as he admires his old makeshift extreme gym. The tower had better gym equipment so Peter didn't need this old place anymore. Though seeing it all dusty and abandoned gives him a sad nostalgic feeling. Maybe I should buy this place and turn it into my own base away from the Avengers. Peter thought as this abandoned warehouse held a lot of fond memories from when he first started his hero work. Saving that thought for another time, Peter got to work. He only had until tomorrow night to put everything together after all. First, Peter needed a sealed coffin that wouldn't leak if it were filled to the brim with liquid. He already had plans for this, so at the corner of the room were materials and tools to build it himself. Peter ordered them a few weeks ago, when he figured out how to fix the blood problem for the elixir. The problem was simple, Peter needed fresh blood in large quantities and didn't want to hurt others to get it. So he went to Kamartage too. Hopefully, find a magical solution to his problem. Sadly, blood-related mystic arts seemed to be looked down upon by most of the sorcerers of Kamartage, so he couldn't find anything in their library. Maybe some masters had helpful books in their private collections, but Peter didn't have access to those. Since that was the case, Peter scavenged the library for anything that could be useful, and eventually he found something interesting. It was a simple spell that was built to infinity multiply the amount of water you had on hand. The spell would be placed on a jug or canteen, and the water inside would never run out. Masters use this spell when traveling to dimensions that don't have water, as they need water to survive like any other human being. Peter took this spell and spent a good amount of time studying and tweaking it. It only worked with water at the beginning, but after some fine-tuning, Peter was able to make separate spells that worked for different liquids. Not only did he make one that works on blood, but Peter has other spells like this that work for all of his favorite beverages. It's safe to say that the Parker residents don't pay for their drinks anymore. The fridge is filled with enchanted bottles filled with infinite soda, milk, juice, water, etc. Not only that, but the magic also keeps everything from spoiling, so it's always as fresh as the day it was bottled. This was something that was needed for the blood, as the resurrection elixir only worked with fresh blood. With his infinite source of fresh blood, Peter solved the only problem blocking him from utilizing the elixir. When he told Peggy that there was a chance of her dying in his little experiment, Peter was exaggerating by a lot. Based on his tests and the proof of success from the hand, Peter was about 99% sure of Peggy's survival. The remaining 1% was just there for the off chance that something went wrong, which wasn't likely. The only reason he said that to her was that he didn't want to reveal anything about the hand to Peggy. Without using the hand as a reference, then his little experiment seems extremely risky. As Peter built the metal coffin that would hold Peggy in her bath of resurrection elixir, he was undecided as to which blood to use for her. Peter has three sets of blood which he could mix with the dragon bone powder for Peggy. First is normal human blood that Peter stole from a blood drive. With it, the elixir would have the same effect that it's always had. Superhuman strength and endurance alongside a longer lifespan. Possibly some cheer-related powers as well, but Peter would have to see about that. Second, Peter's own blood. Due to his enhancements, the effects of the elixir would most likely change dramatically. The possibility of minor spider-related powers emerging would be highly likely. Third, Steve's blood. Before taking the captain off of his sedatives, Peter took a sample of his fresh blood, which he immediately placed in a spell jug. Once again, the effects of the elixir would most likely change. Minor super-soldier-related powers would be likely to develop. If she's going to be with Captain America, then why not use his blood? Peter thought as he finished the coffin alongside a tube, 
where the elixir would pour in from a connected container. Once he was finished with that, Peter didn't have anything else to do for now. He couldn't make the elixir just yet, as it had to be fresh. That would have to wait until tomorrow. If this works, I can finally give MJ and Ned their superpowers, though maybe I should wait and give them the super soldier serum first? Peter muttered in thought. After all, the elixir might freeze them at their current age, which wouldn't be good. I'll have to run some tests on Peggy after tomorrow. Returning home that night, Peter didn't tell anyone about Peggy or his plan with the elixir. In fact, he has kept the elixir a secret from just about everyone for all this time. Peter didn't want to get his loved one's hopes up, but mainly he wanted to keep the existence of the elixir as quiet as possible. Immortality is a dangerous thing to go around advertising after all. If tomorrow's experiment is a success, then Peter could tell his loved ones and possibly a select few in the Avengers, as Peggy may not be able to keep her mouth shut. Hopefully, she's a good secret keeper, though I can expect Steve to know about it sooner or later, Peter thought. Of course, Peter won't be telling anyone about the contents of the elixir, as not even Peggy will know. They'll only know that he has a way to reverse aging, prolong life, and give minor superpowers. Drifting off to sleep that night, Peter wondered whether he should tell his loved ones about the elixir or not. After all, he may not use it on them for a while. Eh, whatever. I'll just go with the flow. Peter thought as he texted MJ goodnight and fell asleep. Waking up the next day, Peter attended school as usual, before rushing over to the Avengers Tower to pick up Tony for their Morag exploration. He still had a few hours before Peggy's experiment, and Peter promised Tony that they would explore today so he couldn't just ditch. Before heading to Tony, Peter checked in on Steve and found him working out his inner feelings on a heavy punching bag. Asterisk bang bang bang. Boom. Asterisk he threw a combination of punches that ended in a haymaker, which launched the heavy bag off of its chains and into a nearby wall. Maybe he needs more alone time? Peter thought as he slipped away. Sometimes people just need to be left alone to work out their feelings so Peter would leave Steve B for the time being. Heading toward the elevator, Peter arrived just in time for Tony to step out with his Iron Man suit on and his face mask open. Good, you're here. Tony says excitedly. Quick, open a portal. I want to fly around and explore that planet. How did you know I was here? Peter asks with a tilt of his head. Jarvis told me. Tony answers with a shrug. Now let's go. I want to discover some alien life forms. Once again, Morag is an abandoned planet. There's nothing left on that rock, but you're welcome to try, I guess, Peter says as he opens a portal. Without even acknowledging Peter's words, Tony shoots off into the portal, leaving Peter behind as he flies off into the distance to explore Morag. Peter watched and sighed in annoyance as his friend used him as a glorified taxi service only to ditch him seconds later. At least he has his suit. Ignoring Tony's behavior, Peter enters the metal base he built and starts running tests with the equipment he brought. He needed a lot of data in order to start understanding and predicting this world's ocean tides. Why does it always turn out like this? Peter muttered as he got to work. Tony gets to run off and have all the fun while I do all of the work. Sadly for Tony, their time on Morag was cut short, as Peter's alarm went off, letting him know that it was 6.30 p.m., only half an hour before he had to go and pick up Peggy for her procedure. After spending a good 10 minutes to find Tony, Peter had to drag him back to Earth kicking and screaming, which was annoying as hell to deal with. Leaving a disgruntled Tony Stark behind, Peter escaped before he could hear any more of his friends bitching. Arriving at his warehouse lair, Peter got straight to work, mixing Captain America's blood and the dragon bone powder. He needed it to be ready for when Peggy arrived. Once the clock hit 7 p.m. on the dot, Peter portaled into Peggy's bedroom, though his sudden and magical appearance didn't seem to shock the elderly woman as he expected. No fun. Peter jokingly whined like a child. You're supposed to be shocked by the portal. Oh my god. How did you do that? Peggy sarcastically pretends to be surprised from her hospital bed. Okay. Don't rub it in. Peter whines some more. If she knows about my portals, then Peggy must still have access to high-level shield information. Are you here to complain about my reactions or make me younger? 
Peggy asks with a raised eyebrow. That's right, Peter says excitedly as he banished his former attitude. The granny before me has a studly soldier with a well-rounded booty waiting for her arrival. We should hurry, as America's ass waits for nobody. Who knows how many harpies or succubi are eyeing him as we speak. Succubi? Peggy asks as her lips cork upward involuntarily. It's plural for a succubus. Peter answers as the portal closes behind him. Right? Peggy says, giving up on this conversation. Can we get going? I want to get this over with quickly. Either I die tonight or I start my life anew. Sure. Take this. Peter says as he walks over and hands her a few pills. What is it? Peggy asks as she eyes them warily. A sedative. Peter says as he dumps the pills into her hand. You'll be asleep for the entire procedure. Is this necessary? She looks up from her pills and asks. Yes, you'll have to be asleep for the procedure anyway. But mostly, I'd like to keep the whole thing as secretive as possible. Peter answers as he motions for her to take the pills. Sighing in defeat, Peggy pops the handful of pills into her mouth and grabs a nearby glass of water to wash them down. I don't know why I'm trusting you. Peggy mutters under her breath. But Peter heard her loud and clear. Because I'm your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, Peter says with an exaggerated thumbs up. Sure. Peggy mutters as she starts to get drowsy and leans back into her soft pillows. Just don't cut me open and sell my organs on the black market. Yes, ma'am, Peter says, as her eyes slowly droop shut, and her breathing becomes even and repetitive. Seeing that Peggy was fast asleep, Peter opened a portal to his warehouse lair and carefully carried the elderly woman inside. As the portal closed behind them, Peter walked over to the metal coffin he created yesterday and gently placed her inside. She's so old that this feels like a weird funeral, Peter thought as he looked down at her sleeping figure. Though she won't be old for long, I suppose. Without further ado, Peter starts cutting off her clothes with a pair of sharp scissors, as he didn't know if clothing would affect the process whatsoever. Throughout the whole process, he did his best to be quick and not look at her old and wrinkled body, though that was easier said than done. In order to be as respectful as possible, Peter shut the lid on the coffin as soon as he was done stripping her naked. I don't know if I can ever get the image of wrinkled, saggy, granny breasts out of my head. Peter thought as he did his best to erase what he saw from his mind. Maybe I can ask the Ancient One to erase my memories later. Pushing all of these thoughts aside, Peter quickly gets to work. Connected to the coffin by a small pipe was a big metal oil drum, which was currently filled to the brim with a thick black liquid. This liquid is the Resurrection Elixir. Peter carefully mixed the elixir only moments before leaving to pick up Peggy. So everything was ready to go. All he has to do is turn the lever beside the pipe and the coffin would fill with the elixir, starting the process. Good luck, Peter muttered as he turned the lever. Instantly, black liquid from the oil drum flowed through the pipe and into the coffin, slowly covering Peggy's sleeping body. Within moments, the oil drum was empty and the coffin was full. Peggy's body was completely submerged, drowning in the thick, viscous liquid. It's nothing but waiting now, Peter muttered as he found a place to sit and took out his phone. Are there any new YouTube videos out today? After hours of watching YouTube videos beside Peggy's coffin, Peter started to get worried that she may not survive the process. Maybe the reproduced blood doesn't work for some reason. Peter muttered as he started pacing around the metal coffin. It was already morning, meaning Peggy spent the entire night submerged in the elixir. Peter wasn't sure if she was still alive or not. It's not like he had anyone that he could call and ask about this, either. All the people that knew the ins and outs of the resurrection elixir are nothing but little specks of ash in the ocean. The dragon bones had become a very rare and finite resource for the hand, so the only people that were allowed the use of them were the fingers, who are long gone. I'm starting to regret killing all of them right about now. Peter thought, as he now knew, that he should have at least kept one of them as a prisoner for information. Though sacrificing them did stop a thousand-year war with the chaste. So I don't regret it too much. At this point, 
Peter started to second-guess himself and was thinking of opening the coffin to check on Peggy. Though, for all he knew, doing so could interrupt the process and mess everything up, possibly killing her along the way. Peter battled these thoughts up until midday, when he couldn't take it anymore and gave up. Walking up to the metal coffin, Peter reached over and slowly lifted it open. Just a peek won't hurt, right? Peter thought as the lid fully opened, revealing a rectangular box full of thick black liquid. Just as Peter was leaning in to get a closer look, the black elixir rippled as if someone had dropped a stone inside and disturbed the calm liquid. Ha! Huh. Peter watched the elixir move in confusion. Does that mean it's working? Just as Peter thought this, a black tar-covered Peggy Carter emerged as swift as a bolt of lightning, gasping for air. Heavy breathing. Oh, shit! Peter exclaimed as he was jump-scared by the sudden occurrence. I can't see. Peggy spoke in fright as she starts to catch her breath. You should be able to see, Peter says as he rushes to get her a nearby towel. You're only having trouble because of the liquid. Peter was careful not to use the word elixir, as he doesn't want Peggy to know anything more than she has to. What? Peggy asks, as her ears were also clogged with the black substance. Giving up on speaking, for the time being, Peter starts wiping her face with the towel, which she grabs from him out of instinct and takes over. After a few moments, Peggy's face was somewhat clean, but her eyesight was blurry and she still couldn't hear a thing. Though from what Peter could see, the process seemed to be a success. Peggy's face was far more youthful than it was before. Her skin was much tighter and without a single wrinkle in sight. Peter couldn't tell for sure, as there were still a few black smudges on her face, but Peggy looked to be in her mid to late twenties. Okay, I didn't fully prepare for the cleanup portion of this, so let's just take you home so you can shower, Peter says, but she didn't respond, as everything sounded like she was underwater. Was it a success? I feel different, Peggy says loudly, as she can't hear her own voice either. As Peggy says this, she grabs the sides of the metal coffin with each hand in order to stand up. Tightening her hands on the coffin for stability, the metal instantly bends and twists in her grip as if it were nothing but a thin piece of paper. Ha, huh, I was right about the power-up due to the blood. Peter thought as he opened a portal straight into Peggy's shower back at her house. The second Peggy stood up, she slips and fell out of the coffin, hitting the concrete floor. Bang. If you were still old, that fall would be life-ending, Peter said as he reached over and helped her up. Thankfully, her entire body was covered in a thick layer of elixir, so he couldn't see any of her naughty bits. Peter is a taken man and Peggy is a taken woman after all. It was different when she was old and unappealing. Knowing that she couldn't hear him, Peter guided her through the portal, which led directly into her shower, turning it on immediately. As the water washed over her skin, the bloody black elixir started to wash off and make its way down the drain. Peter took this as a sign to get the hell out of there. She could figure out the rest herself, but from what little he saw on his way out, Peter knew that the experiment was a complete success. Her body was younger and the power-up was obvious from what she did to the coffin only moments earlier. As he left the bathroom, Peter closed the portal as well. He didn't want Peggy investigating his secret lair after all. I guess it's just waiting now. Peter muttered as he walked into her living room and turned on the TV. Peggy Povey, although her sight was blurry, Peggy knew where Peter brought her. It's hard not to recognize your own shower after all. Though Peggy has been on a strict sponge bath routine lately, as she didn't have the strength to leave her bed anymore, so it has been a while since she's been in her own bathroom. Thank God I'll never have to do that again. Peggy thought as she stood on her two legs without any signs of fatigue. She couldn't remember the last time her body felt so young and spry. Speaking of sponge baths, as a 90-year-old adult woman that has lived through war, having another person wash you in bed because you couldn't do it yourself is downright degrading. Due to the black liquid infesting every crevice of her body, Peggy took almost an hour in the shower before finally turning it off and stepping out. While in the shower, she saw the youthful appearance of her body, but she hadn't gotten a look at her face just yet. Walking over to the sink, Peggy wipes the steam off of the mirror above and froze in shock. It's one thing to look down and see a pair of arms and legs, 
but it's a whole other to see the face you once had 70 years ago. Insert picture of young Peggy Carter again. Am young again. Peggy exclaims as her eyes go wide and she clasps a hand over her mouth. I sound so different. Before, Peggy had the shaky and broken voice of a dying 90-year-old woman. But now she looked and even sounded young again. After staring at her naked form in the mirror for a long while, Peggy grabbed a nearby towel and covered herself as she rushed out of the bathroom. Peter Povis Peter was watching Looney Tunes in Peggy's living room. He suddenly heard the sounds of wet feet pacing his way. Lowering the volume and standing up, Peter turned just in time to see Peggy rush in with nothing but a towel on. It worked. She practically screamed as she ran over to Peter and wrapped him in a hug. Thank you so much. Uh, no problem, Peter says as he keeps his arms at his sides. As I said before, this is a win-win for both of us. I just hope that you accept my job offer. Yes, of course. Peggy nods as she releases Peter and straightens her towel. I would be more than happy to become the vice director of the Avengers. Anything beats laying in a hospital bed every day until my eventual death. Soon. An awkward silence fills the room as Peggy looks down and realizes that she was only wearing a towel. I'll be right back. She blurts out and rushes toward her bedroom. A few minutes later, Peggy returned in clothes that would only fit the style of a 90-year-old granny. How do I look? Peggy asks, unsure of her current wardrobe. Like you spent the night at your grandmother's house and had to borrow her clothes, Peter answers truthfully. But all of my old clothes are in storage back in the UK. She says with a defeated sigh. Well, you can't go meeting the love of your life dressed as an old granny. Peter says as he came to the only logical conclusion. You need to go shopping. Since Peggy was far too excited to meet Steve again as her younger self, she rushed to the nearest store and bought the first outfit that looked good on her. Meanwhile, Peter hid in the car as he didn't feel like being swarmed by Spider-Man fans. If he went in with her, then soon enough they would be stuck in a sea of people asking him for autographs and pictures. Although Peter liked interacting with his fans, it can easily get very overwhelming. Even in a small clothing store, if he stayed long enough, word would spread and thousands of people will converge on his location. With all of them hoping to meet Spider-Man, it just wasn't worth the hassle. After waiting for only 10 minutes, Peggy came walking out in a much more modern outfit. She wore a slim black women's pants suit with black high heels. The little swing in her hip along with the pep in her step said it all. Peggy felt young and beautiful again, which boosted her confidence far above what it's been lately. It's been so long since I've been able to wear heels, Peggy says with a smile as she gets into the driver's seat. Well, I'm just happy that I could make that possible for you again, Peter says as he enjoyed her happy mood. He felt a strong sense of accomplishment for helping Peggy. Yesterday she was a dying old woman and now she was on her way to living a long and happy life. Find an empty road and I'll open a portal into the underground parking lot in Avengers Tower, Peter says as she starts driving. As they drive through traffic, Peter explains some things to her. All right. I know we're kind of rushed, so let me explain a bit about your new body, he says as she listens carefully while keeping her eyes on the road. First, you should have a much longer lifespan than a normal human. It's not infinite, but you'll live for a long time. How long is a long time? Peggy asks curiously. I'm not sure, Peter says with a shrug. I'll have to run some tests to find out, but that can wait for another day. Okay. Anything else? She asks as they stop at a red light. Yes, you may not have noticed it yet, but you have super strength, Peter says, causing her to turn to him with a raised eyebrow. Really? Peggy asks with a small hint of excitement in her voice. Yup, you should have more than just super strength as well, Peter says as he explains her earlier destruction of the thick metal coffin. You should have other powers too, but I would have to run some tests to find out exactly what they are. Peggy got quiet as she looks down at the steering wheel and gripped it tightly. Instantly, the wheel started to bend and crack. Before it could break and ruin their current mode of transport, Peggy released the wheel and stared at her own hand in shock. Asterisk beep, beep, beep. Asterisk the sounds of car horns break Peggy from her stunned silence. 
The light turned green and the drivers behind them were getting pissed that they were blocking a lane. Pressing the accelerator, Peggy starts driving as she contemplated the fact that she now had superpowers. Not only did he give me my youth back, but superpowers as well. Peggy thought as she glanced at Peter through the rearview mirror. Peggy would never be able to repay him. The car remained silent until Peggy found an empty road, where Peter opened a portal big enough for her to drive through. When they passed through it and entered the underground parking lot, the portal snapped shut behind them. I don't know if I can do this, Peggy mutters nervously as she parked the car. I've waited 70 years for him. What if my stunt the other day ruined everything? What happened to the confident Agent Carter? Peter taunts with a tilt of his head. You have 70 more years of life experience compared to Steve. This should be easy for you. Hell, you could probably just stroll up and kiss the guy without a word and that would be enough. Peggy goes quiet as the steering wheel cracks under her nervous grip. You're right. Good. Let's go. Peter says as they get out of the car and walk over to a nearby elevator. Putting in his security code, Peter presses the floor number that Steve is staying on. No turning back now, he says as the elevator doors close. Steve POV. Pow pow pow. Ever since Steve visited Peggy and witnessed what time had done to her, he couldn't shake this feeling of rage within himself. Steve was angry, which is why he spent every waking moment in the tower's gym, destroying countless punching bags. Bang. Boom. With one fully powered punch, Steve knocked the punching bag off of its chains and sent it flying into the wall. This would be the fifth bag he has done this to. Thankfully, the gym had another five for him to use. At least until he broke those as well. Although Steve was angry, that anger was placed on no one but himself. His mind kept replaying the moments leading up to the crash, finding all sorts of ways that things could have gone different. Thoughts littered with the phrases, could have, and should have, filled his mind constantly. All of these thoughts lead to the same outcome. Steve makes it back in time to take Peggy out on their planned date, but thoughts of what could have and should have can't change the past. No, the past is set in stone. He is stuck with the stupid decisions that he made, and the punishment for that is the loss of the love of his life. Steve may not be the brightest mind in the world, but he could see that Peggy didn't have much time left. The fact that she made it all the way to her 90s is already impressive. So, how does an angry super soldier deal with all of these emotions and realizations? He trains until the equipment can't handle his strength anymore. Hence the pile of five broken punching bags in the corner of the room. With another punching bag destroyed, Steve decided to call it a day and started walking back to his apartment. Along the way, his mind continued formulating alternate plans that would have reunited him with the love of his life 70 years sooner. It's all my fault. Steve muttered as he walked with his gaze sullenly pointed downward. What's your fault, Captain? A familiar female voice filled the hall. Ha! Huh. Steve grunted in confusion as he looked up to see a very familiar woman, which shocked him into a frozen stupor. It wasn't the arrival of the woman that shocked him, but the fact that she didn't look as he remembered seeing her only a couple of days ago. What's the matter, soldier? She says with a teasing smile. Cat got your tongue? Aye, aye. Steve stuttered as he was lost for words. Standing before him is the spitting image of the Peggy Carter, he remembered from 70 years ago. His heart pounded as he took in her image with his mouth hung open in shock. Let me help you with that, Peggy says as she walks up and takes Peter's earlier advice. Grabbing Steve by the scruff of his shirt, Peggy pulls him down and smashes her lips onto his. The already shocked Captain America was clueless as his eyebrows shot upward. Before he had the time to reciprocate the kiss, Peggy pulled back and admired the stupid look on Steve's face. God, I missed that look, she says with a fond smile. How? Steve finally gets a word out. Spider-Man helped me, Peggy replies as he pulls her into a tight hug. It's a long story. Well, I have all the time in the world, Steve says as he refused to let her out of his grasp. You're sweaty, Peggy mutters as she notices his wet clothes. Yeah. I've been in the gym all day, Steve explains, still refusing to let her out of his hug. Suddenly, 
Peggy shoved him backward with a bit more strength than he was prepared for, which caused him to release her and stumble back a few steps. How did you do that? Steve asks as no normal human could do that to him with a simple shove. I'll tell you after you get cleaned up, Peggy says as she grabs his hand. You still owe me a date after all. Peter watched from down the hall as Peggy revealed herself to Steve. As soon as they started to kiss, he knew that they should have some alone time and walked away. Peggy has already been told to keep the details of her youthful reemergence a secret, though Peter said that she could tell Steve as long as he keeps it quiet as well. Of course, Peter allowed them to say that it was his doing, as the building's cameras have already seen them enter together. Anyone who looks into it would see that he was the one to bring Peggy into the building in the first place. Peter also instructed her to contact him or have Steve contact him in case of any emergencies related to the procedure. You can never be too careful. Truthfully, she should be under a sort of house arrest right now so that Peter could study her body and make sure everything went smoothly, but he knew that wasn't going to happen. Peggy is a very headstrong woman. Nothing would keep her away from Steve right now, which is why Peter allowed her some time directly after the procedure. She better enjoy it too, because as soon as the next day arrives, her life will be nothing but medical tests for at least a week. Blood tests, x-rays, CT scans, biopsies, etc. Peter would run every test he could dream of in order to understand what the elixir actually did to her body. Thankfully, as Peggy was an old and dying woman, her medical history is filled with such tests so he would have a good reference to see what changed. Leaving the two love birds in the tower, Peter returned to his warehouse lair and started cleaning up. There were small pools and trails of black blood elixir alongside an open coffin full of the stuff. Of course, he did keep some samples of the used elixir for testing, though he already knew that the chi was completely gone by now, as it was absorbed into Peggy's body. Once the place was completely clean, Peter could finally return home to get some sleep. After all, he spent the whole night watching over Peggy throughout the whole process. Peter may have superpowers and could go days without sleep, but those days wouldn't be very happy for him and especially those around him. A tired Peter Parker is a moody mess of a man. Just as Peter laid his head onto the soft pillow of his bed, ready to close his eyes and go into a 12-hour long coma, his phone started ringing. Ring, ring, ring. Mother schmucker. Peter cursed as he grabbed his phone and answered it with his eyes still closed. What? Someone's cranky today. The voice of his beautiful girlfriend was heard over the phone, which woke Peter from his tired stupor. Sorry. I spent the whole night working on something for someone, and now I'm trying to sleep, Peter says truthfully but doesn't go into detail. I can explain more later if you want, but I'm too tired for that right now. Truthfully, he expected it to be Tony or Fury calling him about Peggy, not his girlfriend. Okay. I'll let you sleep then, MJ says understandingly. You could come over and sleep with me? Peter offers, but soon realizes the innuendo in his words. Well, not that kind of sleeping. I mean, actual sleeping and not sex. I mean, you said you're not ready yet, so... MJ couldn't contain herself anymore and broke out in a fit of laughter. She loved the way Peter could go from the smartest person she knew to a blabbering idiot like flipping a switch. Hey! Don't laugh at me, Peter protests as he turns in his bed. I've been awake for like 40 hours. Sorry, you're just so cute, she says, completely ruining his manly image. Hey, never call a man, Peter says seriously, though he could hear her laughing again. I'm handsome, rugged, or dashing. Never cute, whatever you say, cutie. I'll be there after I have dinner with my mom, MJ says and hangs up before Peter could say anything. I'm not cute, Peter muttered as he put down his phone and closed his eyes to sleep for a second time. Ring, ring, ring. Is she calling again? Peter thought in annoyance as he grabs his phone once again. My love, stop calling me. I'm trying to sleep. Well, sorry darling. A surprisingly manly and sarcastic voice answers back, shocking Peter out of his bed. I was just sitting here wondering what you did to the former director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Peggy Carter. Fury? What do you want? Peter asks as he feels a bit embarrassed. What about her? Don't play dumb with me. Fury wasn't in the mood to beat around the bush. She's young again. Explain. 
Maybe she started a new skin routine? Peter may be tired, but he's always happy to annoy Fury. She told me that you were responsible. Though she refused to go into detail, Fury says suspiciously. Well, she is 90 years old. Who knows what delusions are going on in that head of hers? Peter says it gets ready to hang up. Anyway, I'm heading off to bed. Have a good night, Baldy. Don't you dare dash, just as Fury started to yell. Peter hit the red phone symbol, cutting the call. Hehe. <laughs> Messing with Fury never gets old. Peter muttered as he put his phone on, do not disturb, and finally was able to sleep. Don't you dare hang up on me. Fury yelled, but it was too late. Sat across from him were both Steve Rogers and Peggy Carter. Though maybe it would be Peggy Rogers soon. The two spent a grand total of about 30 minutes together before they bumped into Fury, who was shocked to see his mentor and predecessor in perfect youthful shape. Of course, now they had some explaining to do, as Fury wouldn't just let them go. He had tons of questions, yet almost none of them could be answered. Peggy kept her word, though she didn't know much in the first place, and only said that it was Spider-Man's doing, while Steve didn't have time to ask. So he knew about just as much as Fury. Mother Schmucker. Fury muttered angrily as he put down his phone and stared straight at Peggy. I told you he wouldn't say anything. Peggy knew calling Peter would be a waste of time. Just give me something. Fury was practically begging at this point. Truthfully, I don't know much. Peggy reveals and receives a skeptical eyebrow raise from both Steve and Fury. It's true. He was very secretive about the whole process. I was asleep before even leaving the house. Why though? Fury asks. Yeah, he doesn't even know you. He barely even knows me. Steve joins in on the questioning. He said that I would be the vice director of the Avengers. Peggy explains with a shrug. That's it. Fury asks with some heavy skepticism. We don't even have any director candidates yet. Hearing this, Peggy looked over at Steve. This action didn't go unnoticed by Fury, either. I see. Fury nods, confusing Steve, who didn't notice Peggy's look. It's not the best reason, but at least things are starting to make sense, right? Peggy stands from her chair, pulling Steve up to his feet with her. Steve and I have an overdue date, so if you'll excuse us, Dragging Steve to the door, Peggy didn't want to wait any longer. Wait, we need to run some tests. Fury tries to stop them, but a very pointed glare from his former boss stops him in his tracks. I was a dying old woman yesterday. Do you know what's the worst part about that situation? Peggy asks out of nowhere. Fury didn't answer. It's the regret. She answers her own question. My biggest regret was missing my date with this big idiot. I've already wasted my precious time here, and I refuse to waste a single second more, grabbing Steve's arm, who wasn't sure how to feel about being called an idiot. Peggy pulls him out of the office, leaving a disgruntled bald pirate behind. R18 warning, warning. While Peggy and Steve went out for their long-awaited date and Fury was wondering how to explain this to the World Security Council as they would find out about Peggy sooner or later, Peter slept like an oversized baby. As a busy person, sleep is one of the most important aspects of his life. Well, that and eating. It's hard to find the time to eat and sleep when you have a million things to do, especially when you enjoy those things so much as well. Speaking of eating, Peter didn't eat a single thing for about 17 hours before going to sleep, either. Thankfully, he has superpowers to help tide him over. Otherwise, Peter would have been dead a long time ago. An hour after dinner time came and went, a dark female figure skulked into Peter's bedroom. As this figure tiptoed through the room and arrived at Peter's bedside, they froze and seemed reluctant for a moment. After almost a minute of frozen silence, the figure began taking off their clothes, starting with her shoes and working up from her pants to her jacket, shirt, and bra. Within seconds, the figure ran out of clothes to remove and stood completely and utterly undressed. As she stood there, naked as the day she was born, the clouds in the night sky parted, revealing a bright full moon. The light from the moon shone through the window, brightening the room only slightly. Instantly, the nude intruder was revealed. Michelle Jones Watson stood beside her sleeping boyfriend's bedside, 
The moon's lights illuminated her previously hidden body, as well as the nervous look on her face. MJ has been working up the courage to sleep with her boyfriend for a while now. Not the same sleeping that Peter so eloquently explained on the phone earlier today, either. Taking a deep breath in order to steal her resolve, MJ crawled into bed and under the covers, throwing one leg over her boyfriend's sleeping body, draping herself over him. I just want to be clear that if you don't stop, I'm not going to be able to control myself. Peter suddenly speaks with his eyes closed. You were awake. MJ squeaked in surprise. I have super senses. Even the stealthiest ninja couldn't sneak up on me. Peter opens his eyes and wraps his arms around her waist, doing his best not to grab a handful of her perky. Ahem. Calm down. I'm stronger than this. Be gone dirty thoughts. Dead puppies. Hairy spiders. MJ didn't know what to say or do as she just lay there with her naked body melded closely to his. Okay. It seems like we've found ourselves in a predicament, Peter says as he smiles down at her. I'll give you ten seconds to get dressed. Otherwise, we'll continue what you started. Reluctantly removing his arms from his beautiful girlfriend's waist, Peter slowly counts to ten in his head, waiting for her to make the decision. Eight, nine, ten. Peter voiced the last three numbers, yet MJ hasn't moved a muscle. I see you've made your decision. Nodding up to Peter, MJ just lay there, hoping that Peter knew what to do. The morning sun shot through the bedside window, shining a golden spotlight on two sleeping lovers. Peter and MJ stayed up for most of the night. Well, it was Peter who kept MJ up all night with his unending stamina. To a normal human like MJ, Peter's unending libido was both a blessing and a curse. For the first half of the night, she loved his non-existent cool-down time. But as the night went on, she started wondering when it would end. She truly went through a hell of pleasure last night and loved every second of it. As for Peter, there's no doubt that he enjoyed himself. He especially appreciated the research he did beforehand, which helped him make the experience a lot more enjoyable for both of them. As a bead of light shone into his face, Peter's face twitched as he blocked his eyes with his only free arm, as the other was taken by MJ. I should have closed the blinds. Peter thought as he turned to see MJ sleeping with her head in his chest and her arms locking his arm in place. Cute. After admiring his morning view, Peter maneuvered his way out of MJ's grip without waking her. Lovingly covering her in his blanket and closing the blinds so she wouldn't be rudely awakened as he was, Peter got dressed and left the room. Taking care of his morning rituals, Peter walked downstairs and found his Aunt May in the kitchen cooking breakfast. As soon as she saw the smile plastered on Peter's face, May knew something happened. She just needed to figure out what that was. Good morning, May says as she flips a pancake and studies her nephew's face. Where's MJ? Usually, you two come down together. How'd you know she's here? Peter asks as he pours himself a big glass of orange juice and downs it within seconds. Is breakfast almost done? After all, he worked up quite the appetite last night. Soon, will MJ be joining us? May asks as she starts to put the pieces together. Probably not, Peter says as he didn't know what to say. Sorry, I shabbowinged her into oblivion last night, and she probably won't be awake until noon. Yeah, no. Even if Peter said that MJ was up late or that she didn't get much sleep, it would still sound bad so he decided to just keep his mouth shut. Why not? Though May wouldn't let up. Because she's sleeping? Peter answered back, acting like May's question was dumb. Well, go wake her up, May says as the puzzle pieces were coming together. I'm sure she doesn't want to miss breakfast. No, let her sleep, Peter says dismissively. Ding dong. Just as May was about to start grilling Peter like a detective, the doorbell rang and an image from the front door camera appeared on the TV in the living room. Turning to look across the kitchen and into the living room, Peter saw the image of MJ's mother, Grace, standing at the front door. Oh shit! Peter muttered with a shocked look. As soon as May heard those words exit Peter's mouth, she knew exactly what was going on. Her little boy lost his virginity. I'll get the door, May says as she tosses aside her spatula and walks off. Make sure the eggs don't burn. Ah, uh, yeah, Peter says as he mindlessly got to work. 
A minute later, both Grace and May came walking into the kitchen. May was smirking while Grace had a curious look on her face, though she did her best to hide it. Hey, Peter, Grace says as she looks him up and down. Is MJ upstairs? I'll go and see her. Without giving Peter a chance to reply, she paced across the kitchen and down the hall to the stairs, eager to hear about her daughter's first time. Wait, Peter tries to salvage the situation at the last minute, but May grabs his arm. It's too late, she says with a chuckle as she shook her head from side to side. Go set the table. The food's almost done. Ah. All right, Peter gave up and listened to his aunt. MJ wouldn't mind anyway. She and Grace are more than just mother and daughter. They're best friends, so Grace would know soon enough either way. Feeling someone shaking her arm, MJ turned in her sleep and muttered incoherently. Peter, feel so good. Spank me again. She practically moaned in her sleep. He was that good. Huh? Grace asks, which causes her daughter to stiffen under the blankets. And mom, MJ stutters as she turns to see her mother standing beside the bed with a knowing smile on her face. After sitting through an awkward breakfast, to say the absolute least, Peter retreated and left MJ to the wolves. He would never forget her honorable sacrifice. It would always be remembered. Meanwhile, Grace and May were getting ready to kick him out, so they could talk to MJ alone. They didn't mind his tactical retreat one bit. As for MJ, she was both extremely embarrassed and wanted nothing more than to follow Peter away from this situation. She stared at his fleeing form with feelings of both jealousy and betrayal. Explain everything. Peter could hear the questioning begin as he flees out of the house. Arriving at the Avengers Tower wearing his spider suit, Peter made his way straight to Steve's apartment and knocked on the door. Knock knock soon enough. He heard some shuffling on the other side of the door before it swung open revealing a disheveled-looking Captain America. Yes, Steve asks awkwardly as if he was hiding something. Where's Peggy? Peter asks as he slips past Steve and strolls into the living room. She's not here, Steve says as he quickly catches up. I escorted her home last night, right? Peter says sarcastically. Do you think I'm an idiot? What? Steve replies in confusion. Cap, your hair is messy. Your shirt's on backwards, and your zipper is down, Peter lists off as he points to the closet by the door. If that wasn't enough, I can hear someone in the closet over there. I don't know what dash, Steve decides to double down on his lie, but he was interrupted by the closet door swinging open. Gigs up, huh? Peggy says as she exits the closet wearing nothing but one of Steve's dress shirts. Yup, go and get dressed. We have a lot of tests to run. Peter says as he wanted to get this day's tests done before Tony woke up, as they would be heading off to Morag. Yes, sir. Peggy gives a mocking salute and walked off to the bedroom. Turning back to Steve, who fixed his shirt and zipped his pants closed, Peter saw an embarrassed look on his face. Have a fun night? Peter asked as he smirked under his mask. Peter needed to pass on the embarrassment he felt this morning to someone else. Thankfully, Steve offered himself as the perfect target. Uh, yeah, Steve answered as he looked away. First time, Peter asked as he leaned on a nearby wall. See, that's a bit personal, don't you think? Steve stutters. I mean, was it your first date? Peter clarifies, though that obviously wasn't what he was asking. Oh yeah, it was our first date. Steve answered as his embarrassment increased. What did you think I meant? Peter asked, enjoying this almost as much as he enjoys annoying fury. Aye, aye. Steve stuttered and was about to answer, but luckily for him, Peggy came back wearing the same clothes as yesterday. All right, I'm here. You can stop embarrassing my soldier now, Peggy says as she pecks Steve on the cheek and confidently walks out of the door. I'll be back when we're done. Well, see you later, Cap, Peter said as he pats Steve on the shoulder and follows her out. So, where to? Peggy asks as they walk the halls of the tower with Peter taking the lead. The tower has a sort of hospital floor dedicated to medical testing so we don't have to go far, Peter says as they get into an elevator and go up. That's convenient, Peggy states as she looks at Peter eagerly. How long until today's tests are over? 
I want to spend as much time with Steve before the other shoe drops. Why, you know something I don't? Peter asks with a raised eyebrow. No, but I do know the cycle of life or at least the cycle of my life. Peggy says as the elevator stops and the doors open. When good things happen, the bad will always follow sooner or later. So what? You and Steve are young and together so now we're about to get invaded by aliens or something. Peter says, jokingly dropping a hint about the next event he thinks will happen. No, it doesn't have to be aliens. But soon enough something will happen that'll break up our current calm life. Peggy says as if she were some sort of psychic. Sure, and you can read my palm later. Peter says jokingly as he leads her up to an MRI machine. This thing is as magnetic as it gets. So remove any and all metal jewelry, clothing, etc. before hopping in. I want to be clear that I'm not psychic. Peggy says with a roll of her eyes as she takes off all of her jewelry. I guess we'll see, won't we? Standing on an asteroid floating through space. A blue man in all black hooded clothing with purple eyes and black face paint looked upward respectfully. He held a large war hammer in hand, resting the butt of it on the asteroid below. Insert picture of Roman the Accuser here Ronan the Accuser, a radical Cree warlord and former member of the Accusers, which were a high-level specialized military force of the Cree army. They would take the missions that normal soldiers wouldn't be able to complete or return home from. Although Ronan kept his title as an Accuser, he defected from the Accusers and the Cree Empire as a whole after the end of the Cree Nova War, as he disagreed with the peace treaty signed by the Cree Emperor and the Nova Empire though it didn't take him long to find another cause to serve. Floating above Ronan is a throne that held a giant purple man garbed in gold armor. He sat above Ronan like a bored king looking down on a lowly peasant. Insert picture of Thanos here, Thanos, the Mad Titan. Thanos is a genocidal warlord from the planet Titan, whose objective is to bring stability to the universe by wiping out half of all life at every level as he believed its massive population would inevitably use up the universe's entire supply of resources and perish. Although this goal of his may be a bit outlandish and extreme, his belief comes from personal experience. Titan, Thanos' home world, was plagued by overpopulation, which caused a drain on its resources and sent the Titan race hurtling toward an inevitable demise. Thanos saw this problem early and proposed an extreme but necessary solution. By randomly killing half the planet's population, they would preserve their finite resources and save the remaining half. Of course, his plan was rejected as being too extreme, and Thanos was cast out as nothing but a raving madman. Soon enough, the predicted catastrophe hit Titan, causing the mass extinction of most of the planet's life forms, with Thanos being one of the few remaining survivors. One of the last Titans alive in the whole universe. I only ask that you take this matter seriously, Ronan projects his voice up to Thanos. The only matter that I do not take seriously is you, boy. Thanos looks down at his newest subordinate in utter annoyance. Your politics bore me and your demeanor is that of a pouty child. Ronan tightened his hands into tight fists as he held his tongue, afraid that any thoughtless reply would get him killed. Who cares whether some weak empires form a treaty? Thanos said as if the Nova and Kree empires were two ant hills joining together. At the end of the day, they were just more ants. You wish for the destruction of your enemy's home world. Yes? Thanos says, breaking Ronan from his self-imposed silence. Yes, Xander must be turned into nothing but a cloud of dust floating along the void of space. Ronan answers as his blood starts to boil in hatred. And I can do that. For a price... Thanos offers as if he were the devil. What do you want? Ronan asks, ready to pay as long as he was able. You will lead one of my armies as well as your own to a certain planet. Thanos explains as a small smile appears on his face. Conquer the planet, kill half of its population, and bring me a certain item. What's the combat level of this planet? Ronan asks as he needed to know what to expect. They've barely left their own atmosphere, Thanos says with a dismissive look. If you're unable to conquer the planet in a single day, then you aren't worth the air you breathe. I won't disappoint, Ronan declares with conviction. Good. My daughter Nebula will be accompanying you, 
Thanos declares without any room for argument. When she returns, you will set out. She'll be given all the information you'll need. Time skip two weeks. Two weeks passed as Peter's life became peaceful once again and a rough schedule was formed. After school, Peter went to the tower where he would run tests and collect data on Peggy. She and Steve were practically living together at this point, as he would always find her at his apartment in the tower. During one of his many visits, Peter offered Steve a job as a member of the Avengers, where he would be groomed for the position of director, but Steve seemed unsure of what to do with his life. He was alive and had his girl by his side, so the war hero part of him was currently put on the sidelines. That will change soon enough, Peter thought, as he knew that something would happen to trigger his involvement. Whether it be the possible invasion, the remnants of Hydra, or some other villain's appearance, Peter knew that Steve would join the Avengers sooner or later. Once Peter was done running his tests, he would go meet Tony, who would usually be getting out of bed by that point. The man either spends the whole night partying or crafting something in his workshop. After Tony eats his breakfast, which is usually a glass of some fancy liquor and a Pop-Tart, the two would head over to Morag, where Tony would ditch him to explore the wasteland of an abandoned alien planet. Since Peter would usually be left behind due to the needed research to find the orb's location, he decided to make use of Tony and ask Jarvis to scan the planet as his adventurous creator flew around. With this, Peter was able to get a complete and accurate map of the entire planet, which Jarvis turned into a convenient hologram. Thanks to this, Peter's time on this planet was virtually cut in half, speeding up his search for the Power Stone by a large margin. Who knew that Tony's slacking would actually pay off for once? Peter thought as he studied the holographic replica of Morag. Sadly, the scans don't go below sea level. If they did, then Peter would have found the orb already, though he should have everything he needs to find it within another week or two. Other than that one bit of helpfulness, Tony didn't really get involved much in Peter's study of Morag and its tides. He wasn't exactly motivated, as Peter made it very clear that he wouldn't be sharing the treasure he was searching for. Whatever, he helped more than enough, Peter thought as he swung through the skyscrapers of New York City at night. After his daily research on Morag, Peter usually had some free time, where he would either relax or go out on patrol as he is now. Due to the knowledge that New York was protected by Spider-Man, a lot of the professional criminals left for other, more defenseless places to work. Of course, not everyone left as people like Wilson Fisk smartened up and started doing their dirty work behind closed doors, shrouding their crimes behind the guise of legitimate business. Though, Peter was far too busy to investigate the smarter criminals, so he planned to create a division for that in the Avengers. Aid? Avengers Investigation Division. He would recruit some of the less powerful heroes and saddle them with detectives from the NYPD, as they had experience in these sorts of investigations. A council meeting has already taken place on this subject and the votes were unanimously in Peter's favor, which is why Peter was out tonight. Yes, he planned to stop any crime that he may run into, but his destination was the NYPD headquarters. Aid would expand past just New York, but that would take time and the existence of more Avengers. I could also use aid as a way to absorb the hand into the Avengers. Arriving at his destination after stopping a mugging and an illegal street fight, Peter swung down and landed at the entrance to the NYPD headquarters. A few beat cops were outside smoking cigarettes when he landed right in front of them and waved hello. Yo, good to see you guys again, Peter says as he remembered them from the bombing incident. A Spider-Man? One of them jumped in surprise. Spider-Man, sir? Is there something you need? Another officer asked respectfully. Yeah, can you take me to your boss? I'm here on Avenger business, Peter said as he points to the door. Ah, uh, yeah, follow me, one of them says and they lead Peter inside, surprising the police inside with their entrance. What happened, Richards? The desk sergeant calls out in a joking manner. You catch a Spider-Man wannabe? Hearing this, Many of the officers laugh, as no one expected the real Spider-Man to show up at their door. Before the men leading Peter inside could explain, a bald, mustached man in a highly decorated police uniform came stomping out of his office. Quit playing around and get back to work! He yelled in anger, as this wasn't the first time they were slacking off today. Hey there, Chief! Peter says as he strolls over. It's good to see you again. 
I see why they were messing around now. He says, not believing it was the actual Spider-Man either. Someone get this clown out of here or into a cell. We don't have time for this. There's work to be done. Under the horrified gazes of the few officers that knew the truth, two nearby cops rushed over to Peter, ready to throw him out so they could earn a couple brownie points from their boss. Sadly for them, they didn't get very far before their legs and arms were entangled with webs, causing them to fall face first into the hardwood floor. Bang. That's not a very nice way to greet a guest. Peter says a bit menacingly as the chief face goes pale in realization. I, I didn't dash. He stuttered as he tried to explain himself, but Peter started laughing out of nowhere. I'm just messing with you, Peter says as he walks past the chief and into his open office. Come inside. I have a proposition for you. Hastily following Peter into his office, the chief closed the door behind him and shut the blinds as well. I apologize for that, he says as he takes a seat and offers Peter one on the opposite side of his desk. They've been messing around all day, so I thought someone called in a Spider-Man look-alike as a joke. Don't worry, I don't mind, Peter says as he shrugs uncaringly and takes a seat. Good, the chief sighed, relieved that he didn't make an enemy out of the most influential and powerful man in the world. Now, what can I do for you? Well, Peter says as he explains the general idea of aid. And I want your best detectives to become liaison officers assigned to this division. Ideally, each detective will be paired off with a low-level Avenger. So, you Avengers want to go after local crimes as well? I thought you were set on higher-level stuff. The chief mutters as he takes everything in. Not that I mind, of course. We could use the extra help with criminals like Fisk walking around freely. Yes, some Avengers aren't as strong as others, so they wouldn't be called for any higher-level stuff as you said. Of course, that doesn't mean they can't be put to work, which is why I'm putting together this division. I'm on board 100%, though I'll have to run it by the commissioner before anything can happen on my end. The chief explains powerlessly. That's fine, Peter says as he stands up and walks to a nearby open window. This is all in the early stages of development and I have to get some things moving on my end as well. In the meantime, you should get approval from your higher-ups and start putting together files on the detective that you think are worth applying. Yes, I'll get right on that. The chief nods in agreement as Peter dives out of the windows and swings away. Returning to the tower, Peter takes out his phone and makes a call. Yes, the feminine voice of Mystique answers. Get to the tower. I have another mission for you. While waiting for Mystique's arrival, Peter started going over all of the data that he collected from Peggy. They just had their last day of testing yesterday, which means Peggy is now free to spend her days in leisure, cuddled up with Captain America. At least until the other shoe drops, as she so eloquently stated a couple of weeks ago. As Peter just started to go over everything, Tony saunters into the room wearing a Gucci robe. He looked to be completely naked underneath as he sipped a glass of brown liquid. Spidey! Tony calls out as he walks over. Just the man I was looking for. What's up? Peter says as he looks up from his reading material to see his tipsy friend's appearance. You thought that you could hide it from me? Did you? Tony says as he points at Peter accusingly. I have no idea what you're talking about. Peter says as he leans back in his chair. Did he figure out my identity or something? Don't play dumb. Tony says as he takes another sip of his alcohol. You made that woman young again. How? Huh? I thought you knew that already. Peter says as he internally sighs in relief. How'd you find out? Peter never thought to tell Tony or anyone else for that matter, as he thought Fury would do that for him. I saw the tests you were running on her and asked around. Fury was happy to explain everything. Tony reveals as he took a seat across from Peter. Well, what about it? Peter asked. I want to know why you keep hiding things from me. Tony says as he finishes his drink and slams it down onto the table between them. First, it was the thing you're looking for on that planet. And now, you experimented on someone without me. Am I not your best friend? Of course you are. Peter couldn't help but smile at Tony's inebriated state. Then why do you keep hiding things from me? Tony asks as he pouts like a petulant child. Because I, like everyone else in the world, 
have a few secrets that I'm not ready or willing to reveal at the moment, Peter says with a shrug. Mine just so happened to be a bit out of the norm compared to others. Sigh, you're insufferable. You know that? Tony sighs heavily as he stares at his best friend. Why can't you just trust me a bit? I do trust you. Peter raises an eyebrow under his mask. You're one of the handful of people that know I use magic. Yeah, but that's because I would have blown myself up studying runes otherwise. Tony rebuts. The room goes silent as Peter stares at Tony in contemplation. Eh, dang it, Peter thought as he resolved himself. Okay, how about I share a secret with you? Will that make you feel better? Yes, Tony's former depressing drunk mood disappeared as he agreed happily. All right, follow me, Peter says as he waves his hand and opens a portal to the mirror dimension. Where the hell is this? Tony muttered as he followed Peter through the portal. The mirror dimension, Peter reveals as the portal closes behind them. A parallel dimension to our own. Cool, Tony says as he turns in place, admiring the view. Is this the secret? No, this is. Peter shakes his head as he reaches his thumb under his mask and pulls it off. Tony's eyes go wide as Spider-Man's real face is revealed before his very eyes. Peter's hair falls messily without the mask holding it in place. Ugh. I hate mask hair. Peter grunts in annoyance as he runs his fingers through his hair, fixing it as best as he could. Though Tony didn't give a shit about that. He was too busy staring at Peter's face to reveal with his mouth wide open. You're young. Tony blurted out. The man that he became such good friends with was either a natural baby face or just really young. Yup. I'm 16. Peter nods without much care for his age. S-16? Tony exclaims in bewilderment. What? Are you in middle school? Tony's image of the man below the mask was completely ruined. He thought that Spider-Man was around his age, but that idea turned out to be completely and utterly incorrect. High school? But I only still attend because of my friends. Peter shrugs uncaringly. Tony freezes for a moment and studies Peter's face. Wait, I know you. A look of realization appears on his face as Tony points at Peter accusingly once again. You snuck backstage with your girlfriend. What was her name? He says, trying to remember the names they gave him. Yup, Peter Parker and MJ. Pete says with a smile. She wanted to meet my best friend. So we snuck in and played the part of your adoring fans. You're so young. Tony still couldn't get over Peter's age. We've been following a child. Tony realizes that the leader of the Avengers was more than half the age of everyone on the council the whole time. I wouldn't say I'm a child. That's a bit harsh. Peter says, as it was his turn to pout this time. I may be young, but I'm very mature. That can easily be seen by how shocked you are right now. That's true. Tony mutters as he goes silent. Well, now you know, I guess, Peter says to break the awkward silence. Don't tell anyone and don't leave any trails if you look me up. I have loved ones that would be in a lot of danger should certain people learn of my identity. Yeah, I get it. Tony waves off Peter's warnings. I'm not an idiot. No, but you can be on occasion. Peter smirks as he puts his mask back on. This is good, though. Now you can meet my girlfriend. She's a bit of a Tony Stark fan. So maybe I can bring her over for dinner sometime or something. We'd have to be careful, though. Why? Tony asks. Well, other than the fact that my identity could be tracked if she's seen with me, MJ happens to be Fury's daughter. Though that's another secret you'll have to keep. Peter reveals yet another shocking piece of information. Wait, did you just say what I think you said? Tony didn't know whether to laugh like a madman or be afraid for his friend's life. Your Fury's daughter's... Boyfriend, yes, Peter says with an awkward smile under his mask. You're so dead. Tony states as if he was already planning Peter's funeral. Eh, I think I'll be fine, Peter shrugs. That depends. Have you shabowinked with her yet? Tony asks as he stops to think for a moment. Because maybe then he'll only maim you a little before letting you go. Ah, uh, Peter didn't know what to say to that, which spoke for itself. Oh my god. You're dead. After swearing Tony to secrecy, 
Peter returned to the meeting room in the tower, where he continued waiting for Mystique to show up. Tony may have been making jokes about his relationship, but Peter could tell that he felt a bit odd about the whole age thing. Having a best friend that's more than half your age is probably a bit weird, so Peter understood. Hopefully, he gets over it soon, Peter thought as Mystique came walking in with a confident sway in her hips. What's the mission this time, boss? Raven asks as she stands across the large table with a hand resting on her hip. This one is especially secret and a bit more dangerous than the last. Peter says as he turns on the surveillance jammer just in case. I'm talking completely off the books. Well, tell me about it, she says confidently and curiously. All right, but I want to be clear, Peter says as he leans forward and stares directly into Mystique's eyes. No one should know about this, not even Eric. If you can't accept that, I understand and will dash. Fine, just explain already. Raven cuts Peter off, eager to know what this is all about. Mmm. Peter didn't know if he believed her, but he'll still give her the mission anyway. I don't really mind Eric knowing, as long as he keeps quiet, of course. Opening a folder, Peter pulls out a picture of a glowing blue cube and pushes it across the table. That is an artifact known as the Tesseract. Peter explains as she looks down at the picture curiously. It was used in World War II by Hydra to supply the Nazi war effort with futuristic weaponry, among other things. You want me to get the cube? Mystique asks. Yes and no, Peter says as he slides the whole folder across. I want you to go undercover as you usually do, and find the exact location of the Tesseract. Once you've found it, you'll alert me, and we'll steal it together. How so? She asks. Something like the Tesseract will be locked up under a crazy level of surveillance and security. All that I need you to do, is be in place to shut down the surveillance. Without cameras, all I have to do is open two portals. One for you and another to grab the Tesseract. Peter explains the plan. And no one would know who took the cube. Raven was impressed. That would be the point, yes. Peter nods. Who has the Tesseract? She asks. Reaching over the table, Peter opens the folder, revealing many classified papers with the S.H.I.E.L.D. logo. The folder contained everything that Peter has managed to find about the Tesseract since he started working with S.H.I.E.L.D. It's not much as Peter has been busy, but it should be enough to find the thing especially with Raven's help. Shield. Mystique was certainly surprised. Yup. Will that be a problem? Peter asks questioningly. No. But I want something in exchange for my silent services. She gives Peter an ultimatum. Sure, as long as it's doable and doesn't go against my morals. Peter agrees easily. That'll do. Mystique nods as she takes the folder and walks to the door. Wait. You didn't say what you wanted. Peter called out, but she merely waved over her shoulder. You can pay upon completion of the mission. Time skipped two weeks. Another two weeks passed while Peter was waiting for Mystique to contact him about the mission that he gave her. Throughout these two weeks, Peter has stuck to a very similar schedule. Except now his time after school was open since Peggy didn't require any more tests. Speaking of her test results, Peter was finally able to go over them without interruption. And boy did he learn a lot. First, the physical enhancement to her muscles, organs, tendons, bones, etc. is on a level a bit below Captain America. Peter didn't think that her body would reach that level of power, but the combination of dragon bones and super soldier blood seemed to do the trick. I wonder how powerful she would have been if I used my blood instead? Peter wondered as he looked over the results. After all, Peter is far stronger than Steve. Secondly, the results also allowed Peter to see the longevity effects of the elixir, which was amazing, to say the least. The human body is composed of trillions of cells. They provide structure for the body, take in nutrients from food, convert those nutrients into energy, and carry out specialized functions. Cells go through a natural life cycle that includes growth, maturity, and death. This natural life cycle is regulated by a number of factors, but that doesn't matter right now. As cells age, they function less well. Eventually, old cells must die, which is a normal part of the body's functioning. New cells take their place with time, but the capacity to continue replacing cells with fresh ones reduces over time. This causes aging and inevitable death. 
Peggy's cells seem to be moving through that same cycle but at a much slower pace. So slow, in fact, that she may be able to live for 300 to 400 years before either dying or needing another dose of the elixir. Hmm. I wonder what Steve's lifespan is? Peter wondered if the super soldier serum affected Steve's aging at all. I'll have to give him the elixir otherwise. After all, two lovers being separated by death is a pretty sad reality. Peggy has already had to live 70 years without Steve, so adding to that already large number seemed cruel. Eh, I'll worry about that when I have a larger stockpile of dragon bones, or possibly a more viable replacement for them. Peter thought dismissively, as Steve is still fairly young. Next, Peter covertly scanned Peggy with a spell that tested her body for traces of chi energy, which was said to enhance due to the elixir's use. Everyone has chi in their bodies, but only those that were trained to harness it could wield their inner energy. Since every living human had chi, Peter cross-referenced Peggy's chi levels compared to some random people, which he stealthily tested during his patrols. If he could give a ranging number for the normal human chi level, Peter would place that around 23 to 37. Meanwhile, Peter had a whopping 186, and he hasn't taken the elixir yet. As for Peggy, she had a chi level of 153, which was only a little less than Peter, so it had to be good. Of course, Peter didn't know the average chi level of someone from Kunluin, so for all he knows, this could be a very meager amount. Maybe I can test one of the chi masters from Kamartaj? Peter thought, hoping that they wouldn't find it disrespectful or something. Although Peggy had all of this usable chi, Peter battled with the idea of telling her or not. Revealing this to her will open up a whole new world, as Peggy would no doubt search for someone to teach her how to harness her energy. On the other hand, Peggy already has super soldier powers and Peter didn't want to deal with the questions that would follow. No doubt, everyone would want the elixir even more than they already do. Peter thought as he remembered Tony asking if he could get the immortality drug next. Thanks to Jarvis, who runs everything in the tower, Tony saw every test that Peggy went through, especially the tests on her cells. When Tony learns that the elixir also gives energy powers as well, he would become even more annoying and insistent than he already is. Peter lamented over the decision to tell her or not. After thinking for a good while, Peter concluded that he would play it by ear. If the Ancient One reveals herself fully and joins the Avengers, then Peter would offer Peggy's name to one of the Chi Masters of Kamartaj as a possible disciple or something. As Peter was thinking this, Peggy's POV. Peggy Carter was given a second chance, which she would not throw away carelessly. A second chance to be young and with the man she loved was all Peggy could ever ask for after all. Since she decided to take the second chance seriously, Peggy has jumped right back into her former army and shield training. Thankfully, the procedure not only made her young again but packed on a good amount of lean muscle as well. The transformation reminded her of a minor version of the experiment that transformed Steve into the man he is today. Although Peggy was instantly given the body of a super soldier, the same couldn't be said for the former skills she picked up throughout her long life. The worst of it all was her martial arts, which were extremely rusty due to a lack of use. Peggy couldn't exactly practice Krav Mega from her hospital bed, after all. Now that she was able-bodied, Peggy made constant use of the advanced gym equipment in the Avengers Tower, sharpening herself back into the warrior that she used to be. Which is where she was at this very moment, covered in sweat and striking out at a human-shaped dummy. Bang bang bang. Using the practice combinations that she remembered from her training, Peggy stuck the target non-stop. As she was doing this, Peggy felt an odd sensation run from her core, through her arm, and toward her clenched fist. Boom! When that same fist made contact, the dummy's head snapped off and flew across the room, only stopping as it embedded itself into the wall. What the... Peggy muttered as she didn't use enough power to do that. Yes, as a super soldier, Peggy could do such a thing with raw strength alone, but she was especially careful not to ruin any of the equipment. Unlike Steve, who breaks at least one piece of gym equipment a day. Looking at her hand in confusion, Peggy found a tiny speck of golden light coming from under her fingernail, though it disappeared so quickly that she wasn't sure if it was real or not. Maybe I'm just seeing things? Peggy thought but wasn't convinced. Looking between the damaged wall and the destroyed training dummy, Peggy didn't know what to do. 
I'll just blame this on Steve. Peter's POV. Other than going over Peggy's test results, Peter has officially studied planet Morag and its neighboring moons and sun enough to predict the tides fairly accurately. That combined with the very in-depth map of the planet was all Peter needed to find the orb. Through all of his research, Peter learned one very important thing. Every 300 years, which just so happens to be when the tides recede enough to reveal the temple that holds the orb, an odd event occurs in Morag's solar system. The sun, moons, and Morag itself become completely aligned. Obviously, this alignment affects the tides heavily and causes them to recede for a short while, before coming back full force and covering the whole planet in water for some time. Thanks to this revelation, Peter took all the research he gathered and made a simulation of this event. Jarvis was very helpful in this step as well. Once the simulation was complete, Peter pressed a button and a big hologram of Morag appeared. The planet was about 97% ocean, with the only piece above water being the area he built his base. Run it, Jarvis. Peter calls out. Yes sir. Running simulation now. Jarvis responded, and the hologram began to move. Immediately, the tides receded, and the planet went from 97% water to 91%. Not a huge change, but it was certainly enough. We did it! Peter exclaimed to Jarvis, who helped him a lot during this expedition. Congratulations, sir! Jarvis replied normally. Now all we have to do is search the coasts based on this simulation. Peter says happily. With this, Peter narrowed down the search for the orb by a lot. Before knowing this, Peter would have searched a much larger part of the ocean, wasting tons of valuable time. Especially since a few islands appeared in the simulation as well, which Peter wouldn't have thought to search, as they weren't there beforehand. Now, all he has to do is search the simulation's receded areas. I'll have the orb within the week. Weeks before Peter started his search through the coastlines of Morag alongside the few islands that appeared in the simulations, only days away from possessing one of the Infinity Stones, Mystique disappeared without a word to anyone. This wasn't very normal for her, either. Usually, when Raven disappears for a mission or something, she would at least inform Eric, but even he was left in the dark this time. Mystique promised Peter secrecy and would do her best to deliver on that, especially since her stipulation was at stake. Using the information that Peter provided, Raven did what she does best and infiltrated multiple shield bases. Kidnapping her victims, she would impersonate them and slowly dig up any information on the cube that Peter was looking for. Two weeks passed since receiving the mission, and Mystique infiltrated five different shield bases, yet information about the Tesseract was few and far between. One after another, Raven followed the tiniest crumbs that barely kept her hunt going. Moving from base to base, she learned that the cube was on the move for a while before settling down in one place. The World Security Council decided to restart something called Project Pegasus, but all other information wasn't available. Raven had no idea what the World Security Council or Project Pegasus was, but at least she knew that the cube wouldn't be on the move anymore, which was good for thieves like her. With this newfound knowledge, Mystique knew that she had to impersonate someone really high up on the food chain if she ever wanted to learn the Tesseract's location. He's going to be pissed if he finds out, Mystique thought as she walked into a S.H.I.E.L.D. facility in perfect disguise. As she passed S.H.I.E.L.D. employees, they would stop and make way, saluting respectfully as she walked by. Raven already infiltrated this S.H.I.E.L.D. base so she knew the layout like the back of her hand. The reason that she chose this one out of all five bases she visited in the past two weeks was quite simple. When looking into the Tesseract here, Mystique learned that the security clearance of the man she was impersonating wasn't high enough. The computer prompted that the information she was looking for was level 10 restricted. This was something that she didn't see at any of the other S.H.I.E.L.D. facilities. She didn't know how she would find a S.H.I.E.L.D. member with level 10 clearance. So Raven took the riskier, more dangerous path and impersonated someone with the highest clearance. Nick Fury. Taking the elevator up, Mystique was surprised to find a group of high-level S.H.I.E.L.D. agents waiting for her as the doors opened. At the front of them was the commander of the base she was currently infiltrating as well. Director Fury, we didn't expect your visit, sir. The leading man said nervously, I didn't exactly plan this visit. Something came up, and I need something from lockup. Fury says as he, 
steps out of the elevator confidently and starts walking down the hall. Jumping into step behind him, the group of men and women start asking questions. What do you need, sir? One asks. Classified. Fury answers, keeping a fast walking pace through the halls. Do you need our assistance? The commander asks. No, just return to your duties. I won't be here long. Fury tells them as they arrive at a metal vault-like door. Thankfully, the door in front of Mystique didn't require any codes, as she had no idea what Nick Fury's access codes would be. No, at the side of the door was a retinal scanner. The group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents stopped in their tracks and watched suspiciously as Fury walked up and bent over, aligning his eye with the scanner. The only reason they were suspicious was one thing. Director Fury never visited their base before. Some of them have never even met the director, so they thought he might be an imposter wearing a prosthetic mask or some other possible disguise. As the light of the scanner waved over Fury's singular eye, the men and women waited with bated breaths, ready to draw their weapons should the scan reject access. Chime access granted. A mechanical voice called out from the scanner as the vault door started slowly opening. Welcome, Director Fury. The watching crowd internally sighed as they saw the door open. Huh? You're still here? Fury turns to send a glare at his subordinates. I thought I said to get back to your duties? Yes, sir. The commander kept a cool head as he shuffled away along with the others. Idiots. Mystique thought in disdain as she walked into the vault. As the doors closed and locked behind her, one by one rows of lights illuminated a giant warehouse-sized room. Long aisles of shelves were filled with boxes and crates. Each box or crate was either evidence from a shield operation or some sort of high-level confiscated materials. Mystique didn't even bother looking at the shelves in these aisles as she walked to the back of the warehouse. On the way, she passed many interestingly labeled boxes and crates. JFK, Jimmy Hoffa, Ark, Tupac, Dyatlov Pass. Each of these boxes represented a possible unsolved mystery. Assassinations, mysterious deaths, a disappearance, an ancient treasure, and they certainly weren't the only interesting things in lockup. Although any normal person would stop and take a look out of curiosity, Mystique wasn't your average person. She was on a mission and nothing else mattered at the moment. Arriving at the back of the room, Mystique found a wooden door. Opening it up, Raven walked inside and saw a small room with a wooden desk and an old-school desktop computer. Time to see if all of this was worth it, she thought. Taking a seat at the desk, Mystique searched for information on the Tesseract. At this point, scavenging for information on S.H.I.E.L.D. servers has become second nature for her. Instantly, a prompt appears on the screen. Level 10 Restriction As the pop-up filled the screen, the drawer beside her opened on its own revealing a device with the imprint of a hand indented into it. Hand print required. Surprised by this, as she never had access to lock up on her last visit, Raven smirked triumphantly as she placed her hand on the scanner. I thought they would use a passcode. Mystique thought as she planned to call Spider-Man if that situation arose. After all, there weren't any cameras in this room, so he could easily portal over and put his smarts to use. If he could work with Stark and understand the nonsense that comes out of that man's mouth, then he could get past some measly password protection. Thankfully, it looks like she won't need any help, though. Access granted. Now what do we have here? Mystique thought as the screen changed to a file filled with a bunch of other files, though one stood out more than the rest. Project Pegasus V2. Knowing that this was the project that was using the Tesseract, she clicked the file and many classified papers filled the screen. Reading through everything as fast as possible, Mystique learned a bit more about what Project Pegasus really was. Project Potential Energy Group, Alternate Sources United States, abbreviated as Project Pegasus, was the name of the joint project between SHIELD, NASA, and the United States Air Force to study the Tesseract and harness its power. In the 1980s, Project leader Wendy Lawson used the Tesseract's energy to create a light-speed engine. Following Wendy Lawson's death in 1989, the project was terminated. At least until the project was reopened and moved to the Joint Dark Energy Mission Facility in the Mojave Desert. Finally, a location. Raven thought as she closed everything, 
turned off the computer and took her leave. Sir, one of the men from earlier calls out as he rushes into an office. Yes, the commander of the S.H.I.E.L.D. base asks as he looks up from his desk full of paperwork. We have a problem, the rushed subordinate says as he places a laptop on the desk. Director Fury said he needed something from lockup. Yeah, I know. The commander nods confusedly. Then why did he access the computer room and leave empty-handed? The subordinate asks as surveillance footage plays on the laptop. The commander watches the video carefully before taking out his phone and making a call. Connect me to the director. He yells over the phone and waits a moment. What? An angry voice answers. Sir, did you get what you needed from lockup? The commander asks. Lockup. The confusion in Fury's voice set off alarm bells in his head. What the hell are you talking about? Lock down the building. Walking out of the building at an even yet swift pace, Fury made it to his black sports car as alarms started sounding from the building. Too late. Mystique thought as she started the car and sped off before anyone came looking. Her body morphed into that of a beautiful blonde woman as she drove out of the parking lot and disappeared down the street. Following the results of the simulation, Peter started his search for the underwater temple of Morag. Starting his search with the coasts surrounding Morag's only current landmass, Peter looked down at this planet's dark, murky ocean water. Even the smell coming from the water reminded him of a garbage dump. That doesn't seem safe, Peter muttered to himself. That's because it isn't, a metallic voice said, turning to the side. Peter saw Tony use his suit's thrusters to land beside him. His face mask snapped open as he exposed his nose to putrid waters, causing him to scrunching his face in disgust. While you were studying the solar system's orbit and solving Morag's mysteries, I was exploring and taking samples from everything, Tony said haughtily, as if he accomplished something amazing. The water here is almost the exact equivalent to the juice you can find at the bottom of a New York City dumpster. Mix in a little bit of flesh-eating bacteria and you have Morag's ocean. You, I think I'm going to throw up, Peter says as a strong wind blows the ocean breeze in his direction. Feel free to let it out in the ocean. It's not like it'll make a difference. Tony quips as he looks out at the dirty water. The people that abandoned this planet left it in a disgusting mess. Talk about a bunch of slobs. Do you think this was all caused by pollution? Peter asks curiously. Probably. Tony nods as he closed his mask to block the smell. Maybe we should work on a fix for that on Earth. Peter solemnly thought out loud. Yeah. Tony agreed as he pats Peter on the shoulder. Well, have fun swimming in that mess. I'm heading home. There's nothing left on this planet worth exploring. And since you're not sharing your treasure, exploring the dumpster juice ocean doesn't sound very appealing. I just hope that I don't catch anything here, Peter says as he waves his hand and opens a portal back to Earth. I'll be back sooner or later. After saying their goodbyes, Tony left and Peter got to work. In order to search the ocean floor without catching some sort of alien HIV or COVID, Peter created a bubble of eldritch energy around himself. Thanks to the copious amounts of tedious training and practice, he was able to control the ball of energy to fly or roll, but in this case, it would act as a sort of submarine for his undersea exploration. Descending into the black poison water, Peter took out his phone and opened the GPS app. Thanks to the scans that Jarvis took during Tony's exploration, which mapped out the whole planet, and a few makeshift satellites that he built and launched into orbit, Peter could use the ghost phone's GPS as if he were traversing on Earth. With this, Peter marked off the areas he had to search, making this whole underwater expedition about a million times easier. Dropping into the water with a loud splash, Peter couldn't see a damn thing as the water was far too dark. He could only see about six feet in front of him, which certainly wasn't enough for his needs. Hmm, let's try that spell. Peter thought as he waved his hands and two fairly simple spell circles were drawn in front of him. As the spells finished forming, they began to shrink to the size of a quarter before launching back at Peter and into his eyes. Ugh! Peter grunted in discomfort as he felt a burning sensation on his eyeballs. The book didn't say anything about pain. Opening his reddening eyes, Peter found that he could see much better than before. 
instead of the measly six feet, he could see around 150 yards all around him. Though, with this new enhanced night vision came a constant burning pain in Peter's eyes. I'll just have to live with it, Peter thought as his eyes started to water. For now, at least, not wanting to waste any more precious time, Peter looked at his GPS and started his search, controlling the eldritch bubble with a thought. He swept across the underwater coastline at a swift pace. Like this, two days passed and Peter searched the entire coastline, finding nothing but some crumbed ruins. Of course, that was exactly what Peter was looking for, but these ruins weren't anything special like the temple. They were just a few corroded homes left over from long-forgotten cities and towns. I knew that I should have started with the islands. Peter thought as he traversed through the open ocean and toward the closest underwater island marked on the GPS time skip three days. After five full days of searching the rocky ocean floor of planet Morag, Peter was starting to lose hope that the damn temple even existed in the first place. Where the hell is the stupid thing? Peter internally groaned as he continued following the GPS. Mm, what's that? As he continued his tedious search, Peter caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a toppled over pillar. Eager to finally leave this damn ocean, Peter floats the eldritch bubble toward the pillar. As he got closer and closer, his excitement grew as a crumbling, decayed building appeared in his sight. The building looked exactly like the one from the beginning of the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. It was surrounded by pillars on the outside and covered with some underwater vines, which had to be extremely resilient to survive in this hell of an ocean. This has to be it. Peter felt an overwhelming sense of accomplishment. Circling the corroded stone temple, Peter looked for a viable entrance. The place was full of holes, but he needed one big enough to fit through with his bubble. After all, he didn't want to cause this place to collapse. That would only delay him even further. Finding the front entrance, which was big enough for him to fit, Peter was reminded of Star-Lord's entrance in the movie. Come and get your love. Peter sang in his head as he entered the temple and started looking around. The place was even more dilapidated on the inside than it was on the outside. There was even a very deep ravine that divided the temple in half between front and back. If I recall correctly, the vault that held the orb was on the other side of the ravine, Peter thought as he floated over to the backside of the temple. At the back wall of the temple, the only thing that hadn't eroded away was a huge double door, which was locked shut. Tapping the bubble into the door, Peter hoped the corrosion from the water would have weakened it enough to break, but sadly it didn't. Inspecting the door for a second, Peter found a circular keyhole in the center, but sadly he didn't know how to pick open an ancient alien door. I guess... Force is the only option, Peter thought as he backed up a few yards and began to tweak his mode of transport. Instantly, a long point appeared at the front of the bubble. Hopefully this place doesn't collapse, Peter thought as he launched the eldritch bubble point first into the door's lock. Bang with only a single ram, the point pierced through the door's lock. Expanding the point, the doors began to crack and crumble into pieces as Peter made his own entrance. Within seconds, the door was nothing but rubble that floated to the floor, leaving a hole big enough for Peter to float through. Though, the vault didn't seem to have any water inside, so as soon as an opening was made, water was sucked in like a vacuum, filling the small space in no time at all. As the water settled, Peter floated inside and found a small room covered in odd glyphs with a pillar in the middle. This pillar had its own carvings as well, but the most attractive part of it was the softball-sized metal orb that was floating, suspended behind some sort of force field that seemed to keep the water at bay. Insert picture of the orb here, floating up to the pillar that held his prize. Peter took a moment to admire it. Finally, my first infinity stone, Peter thought as a smile bloomed on his face. After basking in his accomplishment, Peter now had to figure out how to get the thing out, as it was locked behind the force field. Didn't Star-Lord use some sort of overpowered magnet to pull it out? Peter thought as he tried to remember the movie. Eh, let's give it a try. Peter muttered as he waved his hand and a spell circle wrote itself onto the outside of the bubble he was in. If this doesn't work, I'll go with the forceful approach. After all, it hasn't failed me yet. As the spell finished its formation, 
Peter moved closer to the pillar as it activated. Immediately, the orb jerked toward Peter as it strained against the force field. Only seconds later, it broke through multiple barriers and smacked into Peter's bubble, sticking to the magnetic spell on its surface. Ha ha! Peter laughed as he eagerly exited the temple and returned to the surface. Breaking through the ocean surface and back into the open air, Peter morphed the bubble into a platform to stand on as he deactivated the magnetic spell. As the spell disappeared, the metal orb fell into Peter's waiting hand. I have it. Peter smiled as he grips the orb tightly. Sadly, his moment of accomplishment is ruined by the toxic perfume of Morag's ocean breeze. I never want to come back to this planet again. Peter thought as he opened a portal to his bedroom and left Morag for, hopefully, the last time. Standing in his bedroom with the orb in hand, Peter couldn't escape the dirty ocean smell that clung to his body. Maybe a shower is in order? Peter muttered as his phone started to go off. Ring, ring, ring. Is it the ancient one? Peter thought as he expected an earful from her about messing with her timeline. Hello. Peter answers without looking at the caller ID. I found the cube. A familiar female voice replies. Looking at his phone, Peter confirmed who he was talking to. Two stones in one day? I found the cube. Mystique says over the phone. Two stones in one day? Peter thought, hopefully. Where is it? Walking out of his room with one hand gripping the orb, refusing to let it out of his grasp, Peter entered the bathroom. In some place called the Joint Dark Energy Mission Facility in the Mojave Desert, Mystique answers as Peter turns on the shower. I have the exact coordinates for the facility. Good work. Peter congratulates her as he starts getting undressed. Did you run into any trouble? No, but S.H.I.E.L.D. is most likely aware of my meddling. Mystique reveals as she explains how she obtained this information. I'm sure Fury wasn't happy with someone impersonating him. Peter muttered with a laugh as he sat on the restroom, waiting for the call to end before hopping into the shower. They don't know it was you, though, right? No, but Fury may be suspicious of me. Mystique guesses thoughtfully. I'm probably among the top of the list when it comes to suspects. You should be fine, Peter says with a shrug. Just don't say anything and cooperate with any investigation Fury brings to you. We can come up with a good alibi later on as well. I agree, but that isn't the real problem. Raven says as Peter's bathroom starts to steam up. It's only a matter of time before S.H.I.E.L.D. looks into what I was doing. If we don't act quickly, they may move the Tesseract, and finding it again will be far more challenging. I'm sure. Okay. So we need to speed up our heist. Peter mutters as the gears in his mind start turning. Where are you right now? California. Mystique answers swiftly. Text me your exact location, and I'll portal over in about 20 minutes. Peter says as he hangs up the phone before she could reply and hops into the shower. Throughout his hot shower, Peter was trying to think of the best way to steal the Tesseract. His original plan required some allotted time for Mystique to infiltrate the facility and shut down the surveillance cameras, but that may not be viable anymore. I'll just wing it, I guess. As Peter was about to leave to see Mystique, he was left with a very glaring problem. What should I do with this? Peter thought as he looked down at the orb on his computer desk. A fancy paperweight, perhaps? Of course, Peter was joking. The power stone may be contained, but it's far too dangerous to be left behind on his desk, holding some papers in place. It could either get stolen, which wasn't likely with the magic Peter has protected his house, or one of his loved ones could misplace it or accidentally cause some sort of catastrophe by messing with it. I need a place to safely store it. Peter didn't think this far as he set all of his attention on finding the damn thing. That might work for now. After a few moments of thought, Peter came to a decision and walked down to the basement. The last people to live in this house left behind a big safe in the basement, which just so happened to be bolted to the floor. The realtor that sold Peter and May the house said that the former owner didn't want to pay to have it moved, and left it behind. Now the safe belonged to them, and May used it to hold some of her more expensive jewelry and sensitive documents. Peter's social security number and birth certificate were in there as well. Cracking open the safe, Peter takes everything out and starts working his magic. 
Spell after spell, Peter enchanted the metal safe with every defensive and offensive enchantment that he could think of. After all, he was protecting one of the most powerful objects in the world, so he made sure to use everything he knew. I feel bad for any thieves that somehow get in. Peter thought as he put everything back into the safe, including the orb, and locked it up. Keeping his eyes on the now very dangerous safe, Peter slowly backed away until he was out of range of the defenses. Peter! May's voice calls as he hears the sound of footsteps moving down the stairs. Are you down here? Yes. Don't come any closer. Peter exclaims, stopping his aunt from leaving the stairs. What? May looks at Peter in confusion as she stops at the bottom step. Why? I may have enchanted the safe to obliterate the souls of any would-be thieves. Among other gruesome defenses, Peter explains horribly. Looking across the basement with a horrified look, May stared at the safe warily. W.Y. May asked even more confused than before. I needed somewhere to store something dangerous. Peter answers vaguely. This is only temporary. I'll remove the enchantments in a few days. Just stay away from the safe until I say otherwise. Okay. Sure. May nods as she retreats upstairs, with Peter following closely behind. I'll keep the basement door locked, just in case. That's probably smart. Peter nods as he watches her shakily lock the door. You should tell MJ and Ned. They visit a lot. Especially MJ, who practically lives here now. May says teasingly, momentarily forgetting about the death trap in her basement. She does not live here, Peter says, causing his aunt to roll her eyes at him. She spends almost every night in your bed has two drawers in your room for clothes, and let's not forget her shelf in the bathroom cabinet, May says as her smirk grows with every word. Fine, she lives here. Peter reluctantly gives in to her logic. Is that a problem? No, of course not. May says genuinely. I love MJ. If you two broke up, I don't know what I'd do. That's good to know, I guess? Peter says, unsure how to feel about her confession. After dealing with the orb's momentary security, as Peter planned to move it to a better location with much more intricate protections, Peter called MJ and Ned and made it very clear that his basement is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. At first, they thought that he was joking, as Peter was quoting Dumbledore for some reason, but they soon realized that he was being deadly serious. Once they fully understood the danger, Peter donned his suit, turned it black, and teleported over to Mystique, who was impatiently waiting for his arrival in an empty parking garage. What took you so long? Raven glares as Peter walked through the portal. You said 20 minutes. That was an hour ago. Sorry. I was dealing with something. Peter says vaguely as the portal closes behind him. Do you have the coordinates? Yeah, in here. Mystique taps a finger on her forehead. Good. Let's go. Peter says as he takes out his phone. Not so fast. She says, stopping Peter in his tracks. What? Peter asks in confusion. I believe now is a good time to reveal my payment. Mystique says with a smile as she leans on the trunk of a car she stole to get here. Can this wait? Peter asks with an annoyed sigh. I'd rather take the Tesseract before Fury figures anything out. No. I need to know that you can deliver what I want. Raven says with a shake of her head. As long as you agree, then it shouldn't take long. Fine, lay it on me, Peter says as he leans on a nearby pillar. I've lived a long life and will continue to live far longer. Mystique reveals as she morphs from a brunette woman to her blue original form. It's a part of my mutation. Her metamorphic powers and low-level healing factor have slowed the degenerative effects of her aging process, allowing her to biologically stay in the prime of her life for a long while. Okay, what does that have to do with your request? Peter asks, ready to leave already. Ignoring his rushed attitude, Mystique continues. Due to this, many people I've grown to care about over the years have aged and passed before me, she says, and Peter started to understand where this was going. I would like for that to stop. You want me to extend the life of everyone you care about? Peter asks incredulously. I should have figured out a different way to perform Peggy's tests. 
Now everyone in the Avengers knows about the elixir's effects, though getting access to all the medical equipment the tower has without leaving any traces would have been a challenge of its own, and they would have figured it out sooner or later anyway, especially when they found out that Peggy used to be a granny. No, Mystique denies and holds up two fingers. Only Charles and Eric. After running away from her own family, Mystique became an adopted sibling to Charles. So they have a loving brother and sister relationship. As for Eric, the feelings in her heart were anything but brotherly love. Raven loved Eric as a man, which is why she made the reluctant choice to abandon her adopted brother and his ideology all those years ago and take the side of the man she loved. Are two sets of elixirs worth an infinity stone? Peter thought jokingly. Of course they are. With enough of the infinity stones, Peter could make an ocean of resurrection elixir with a snap of his fingers. The trade was heavily in his favor. Not to mention the fact that Peter didn't mind helping his fellow Avengers. Watching Peter with a calm face, Mystique's inner emotions were turbulent as she hoped for an affirming answer. Sure, but the resources needed for such an operation are beyond rare. They'll have to wait until I can collect everything. Peter mixes the truth with lies. Yes, the dragon bones were a rare resource, but he had enough to make the elixir for four people at the moment. Those four people are himself, MJ, May, and Ned. Peter also needed to get some for Tony as well. He wouldn't waste the stash that he set aside for his loved ones on anyone. So Raven would have to wait. Peter planned to hunt for more dragon bones in the future, while looking into alternative ingredients along the way. But she didn't need to know all of this. As long as you promise that they'll get the same treatment as Miss Carter when the time comes, Mystique looks to Peter for affirmation. Of course, you have my word. After closing the deal with Mystique, Peter was finally given the coordinates, which he swiftly put into his ghost phone's GPS. Hmm. The map shows nothing but empty desert, but I'm sure that's shield doing. Peter comments as he studies the terrain through his phone. Their secret base wouldn't be very secret if anyone can just pull it up on Google Maps. Raven comments with a roll of her eyes. True, Peter said absent-mindedly as he looked over what little the GPS showed. I wouldn't put it past Fury to change the terrain on the GPS as well, so this is likely a waste of time. Stuffing his phone away, Peter looked toward Mystique with an undecided expression under his mask. Should I do the rest myself? Peter wondered. On one hand, Raven's powers would be useful, as she can easily impersonate a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Though, on the other hand, that plan was scrapped the second S.H.I.E.L.D. was alerted to Mystique snooping. Now the plan is to basically storm the base and take the Tesseract. So, how are we stealing the cube? She asks, ready to fulfill her end of the bargain. Hmm, you can head back home, Peter says after a second of thought. I'll take it from here. Huh? What about our deal? Raven asks worriedly, thinking Peter was backing out of their agreement. You did enough already, so don't worry, Peter says with a shrug. It's just that the new plan is a bit more forceful, which isn't really your strong suit. I see. Mystique sighed in relief. She was more than happy to ditch the dangerous base rating and still get her agreed upon payment after all. Are you sure? Walking to her car door, Mystique turns back to ask. You could cause a distraction and I can slip in and out? Mystique didn't know why she was asking this, as it would give her more work. But for some reason, she felt obligated to earn her payment. Nah, Peter says with a shake of his head. You may get caught on camera or something. It'll be easier if I just do it. Thanks, though. All right. Mystique shrugs and gets into the car. As she drives away, her body morphed into a random woman. Now, who should I impersonate for this heist? Peter thought as a light bulb goes off in his head. Chum. That's a good of idea. Ronan the accuser stood in the observation deck of his flagship. All the space spread out before him as he stared off into the distance. Are you sure your father said Planet C-53? Ronan looks over his shoulder and asks specifically. Yes, why do you keep asking that? A gruff female voice answers. Standing across the room, a beautiful bald, blue-skinned woman crossed her arms in utter annoyance. She wore a tight black and purple combat suit with many weapons strapped to her. 
from the tiniest of knives to the large blaster rifle across her back. Insert picture of Nebula here. Nebula's many cybernetic enhancements were hard to miss, and so was her prickly personality, which Ronan has had to deal with ever since their armies departed. Before their journey started, Ronan had his men look into Nebula's background. She was a former Lufamoid assassin, an adopted daughter of Thanos as well as the adopted sister of Gamora, the Mad Titan's favored daughter. She would serve as the right-hand woman of Ronan the Accuser during his quest to retrieve the Tesseract, which angered her to no end. Why must he be in charge? I'm supposed to be your daughter. Nebula lamented the lack of trust her father had in her. Always the failure, which is shown by the countless cybernetic changes Thanos has forced on her body. Upon hearing her answer, Ronan got quiet and stared off into space once again. Vare shouldn't be on planet. Ronan has visited planet C-53 before, and he barely made it out alive. A very pesky woman destroyed many of his warships. He watched her glowing form do so from the very spot he stood now. Of course, he swore vengeance for such actions, but achieving such a feat at his current strength would be almost impossible. How much longer until we arrive? Ronan asks without looking back this time. 37 hours. Though we can half that if we increase speed and leave behind some of the slower Chitauri ships. Nebula answers as she tightens her fists. I hate this man. Nebula hated being treated as a subordinate but would act her part. Otherwise, her father may schedule another surgery when she returns. Hmm. Do it. Ronan commands after a moment of thought. What? Nebula didn't expect him to agree. Increase every ship's speed to maximum. Ronan turns and walks to the door, passing Nebula along the way. Half of our army will arrive late, but that won't change the outcome. Okay. Nebula agrees in confusion. Fetch me when we arrive. Ronan commands as he walks out of the room. We have to strike quickly before Ver is notified. In the middle of the Mojave Desert, a purple-skinned giant of a man walked along the hard rocky floor toward a mountain in the distance. Insert picture of Thanos here. At the bottom of this mountain was a huge compound, surrounded by gates and tall towers. On top of these towers were shield personnel, who held rifles in hand as they guarded the surroundings. Inside the compound, multiple buildings were erected. One for the research facility that held the Tesseract, another for the soldiers, and a few others for other employees. Director, I'll guard this place with my life. An aged military man in an office of the barracks swears resolutely over the phone. Good. Reinforcements will arrive soon. Just keep a close eye on the cube. Fury's voice could be heard over the phone. Yes, sir. The man steals his resolve. As the call ended, the military man had only a moment of silence before the compound's alarms started blaring. It's happening already? He thought as he looked out of the window beside him, only to see a huge purple human crash land past the walls and guard towers. What the hell is that? As soon as the dust cleared, revealing a tall, muscular purple alien, the sounds of gunfire filled the desert air. Usually, the soldiers were trained to try and peacefully detain any trespassers, but that didn't happen today. A few jumpy operatives opened fire out of fear, which triggered everyone else to join in as well. Though something odd happened. As the guns started to go off, the giant purple man started to move at a speed far faster than his size would suggest was possible. With the grace and skills of an Olympian acrobat, the alien, metahuman, or whatever he was expertly dodged everything thrown his way. Lock down the research facility. Breaking from his shock, the aged military man grabbed his radio and started barking orders. I want every door leading to the containment room sealed and barricaded. While the orders were given out, Thanos rushed toward the research facility and barreled through the front door, knocking it off its hinges with ease. As soon as he appeared, more soldiers were waiting on the other side and opened fire in his direction. As the bullets flew by, Men and women in lab coats huddled in the corner like frightened rats. They were just getting ready to clock out and head home before this happened. Standing still this time, each bullet hit the giant monster, but sadly they couldn't break through his skin. As the bullets impacted Thanos and dropped to the floor with light clinking noises, the soldiers ran out of ammo. 
Weak? Thanos muttered in disgust as he marched forward and threw the guards across the room with a swipe of his hand. Similar situations unfolded as the purple giant invaded deeper and deeper into the research building. Block door? Break them down, deal with those inside, and move on to the next. Though this routine changed as he broke yet another door and the sound of something rolling across the concrete floor was heard. Looking downward, five grenades slid along the floor and stopped perfectly around his feet. Resisting the urge to kick them back at the soldiers ahead, Thanos did nothing as they exploded in a big fiery blast. Did we get him? One man asks as he looks into the smoke with his assault rifle lowered. Finally changing tactics. A voice says from the smoke as the sound of footsteps head their way. I commend you for your effort. Walking out of the smoke, the purple giant was completely intact. Not even his armored clothes were damaged. Now step aside. He towers over the humans and orders menacingly. Why yes sir. One of them squeaks out as they shuffle out of his way. Behind them was a big vault door with a keypad on the wall to the side. Turning back to the frightened soldiers, Thanos gives them an offer. Open this door, and I'll spare your lives when my army arrives to cull this planet, Thanos says, but no one steps forward to do so. Either they didn't have the access codes or they're very loyal soldiers. I'll do it myself. Thanos tisked in disdain as he reached back and slams his monstrous fist into the metal door. Bang! Crunch! The metal door was instantly dented as his fist opened a head-sized hole. Grabbing the door by the hole, he ripped it backward and tore the whole thing off of the wall. Inside, a few scientists were working around a glowing blue cube, which was wired up to countless machines. Insert picture of Tesseract here. W, who are you? Eric Selvig, a scientist that S.H.I.E.L.D. found during the whole Thor debacle, asked in shock. I'm inevitable. He replies, but goes quiet and marches toward the cube at the center of the room. Maybe I laid that one on a bit too thick. Plucking the cube from the metal table with his giant hand, Thanos admired it for a moment before turning to the people and cameras inside the room. Two down, for more to go, Peter thought as he spoke in his Thanos voice. I'll be back. Leaving those words behind, he kicked off the floor and crashed into the ceiling, breaking through and disappearing. Only seconds after he left, a heavily armed team of soldiers breached the room, followed by a very angry-looking Nick Fury. The hell just happened? Retreating to the desert mountain beside the Joint Dark Energy Mission facility, Peter kept up the illusion that covered himself as he looks for a cave. After a minute of leaping around the mountain, Peter found a cave and slipped inside, away from the onlookers as well as any spying satellites. As soon as he was alone in the cave, Peter dropped the illusion. Instantly, the figure of the towering Mad Titan faded away, leaving Peter in his blacked-out spider suit. Smiling down at the cube in his hand, Peter now had two of the three Infinity Stones that were currently on Earth. I wonder how I'll convince the Ancient One to hand over the Time Stone? Peter thought as that was the only one left on the planet. While admiring the glowing cube, Peter's super hearing picked up the sounds of armed search parties making their way up the mountain. They're acting quick, huh? Peter thought as he opened a portal to his bedroom and stepped inside. By the time the armed soldiers made it to his cave, they would find nothing but the oversized footprints left behind by Peter's illusion. The second Peter got home, he went down to the basement and disarmed the safe, so that he could admire the two Infinity Stones together. Also, for the safety of his loved ones and anyone that enters his house. Though Peter wasn't thinking about that at the moment. This is so cool. Peter muttered as he sat on the basement floor with the shining tesseract and the metal orb in his lap. My precious. Peter felt his inner Smeagol coming out. You've changed a lot today. Again. A familiar voice appears in the dark basement. Jumping in fright, as he didn't expect the Ancient One's arrival, Peter holds both of the Infinity Stones behind his back. I won't let you lay your dirty hands on my precious collectibles, Peter blurts out without thought. Ahem, dangerous objects. That's right, I won't let these dangerous objects fall into the wrong hands. His teacher just stared at him as if he were an idiot. If I wanted your precious collectibles, 
I would have taken the orb while you were out. Impressive enchantments, by the way. I could have broken them in seconds, but other masters would have risked their lives disarming that safe. Thanks. I plan to create a better hiding spot for them. Peter said, happy to hear her praise, which isn't given lightly. You can give them to me? She offers a helping hand. I'll take good care of them for you. No, you'd most likely just return them, Peter says as he guards his collectibles closely. Well, would you blame me? The Ancient One says with a sigh. The Tesseract isn't that big of a deal since you already screwed up the invasion timeline, but Peter Quill and his team can still be formed if the orb is returned. She gives her student a pleading look, hoping that he would see things her way. That's what you're worried about? Peter mutters incredulously. Just create a replica of the orb's casing and put it in the temple. The power stone isn't needed for them to come together. All interested parties only have to think that the stone is inside. The Ancient One goes silent as she reluctantly agrees with her student's assessment. Fine, I'll have a copy put in its place. I have no problem with that. Peter smiles in her direction. See, we can work together. No, you messed up a good part of the future, and I'm cleaning up your mess. She rebuts with a roll of her eyes. I like to think about it a bit differently. I took a very powerful weapon away from our enemy before he could take it, and you agree with my decision and wanted to help. Peter twists her words into a better light. Yeah. No, she says flatly. They say denial is the first step. Peter says in a know-it-all tone. I'm not in grief. The ancient was starting to get annoyed with her student. Oh, is that anger? Peter continues messing with her. That's the second step, I think. Not wanting to entertain Peter's idiocy any further, the Ancient One left without another word, disappearing into thin air. Okay, enough messing around. Peter turns much more serious when he was left alone. Time to make a portable container for these. First, Peter didn't want to leave the Infinity Stones in a single location. He would much prefer to always have them on his person, which would add an extra level of security. Though this would also add a level of risk as well. If Peter were to lose a fight, then the stones could be stolen from his body. Or he could misplace the container, but that's unlikely and can be solved with a tracking enchantment. Either way, Peter would stick to this idea, as the alternative is something like the safe which he didn't like very much. Spending the rest of the day working on this, it didn't take Peter long to make the perfect container for his valuables. Standing over his desk tiredly, Peter admired a silver necklace with a small leather pouch that hung from it like a pendant. The pouch itself is something that Peter found in Camartage and tweaked to fit his needs. It's pretty much a tiny bag of holding. The inside was expanded to about 4 cubic meters which is more than Peter needed so he didn't change that at all. What he did change, however, was the runes that covered the spacious inside. These runes are multiple energy containment spells that are there to keep the Tesseract from being tracked. Peter knew that the Tesseract could be tracked by its energy signature, as Tony and Banner did so in the Avengers movie. Knowing this, Peter has already placed similar runes around his house, as Fury is no doubt doing everything he can to find his stolen property. Other than the energy containment spells, Peter did his best to make the bag as sturdy and resilient as possible. As for the security that comes from the silver chain which has so many security and defensive spells that it isn't even funny. Using a magnifying glass, Peter could see the tiny etched enchantments he placed along the individual chains of the necklace. Each small chain is one singular enchantment that is all connected to protect the pouch. I went a bit overboard with this, didn't I? Peter thought as he cut his finger and placed a drop of blood on the chain. A dim light pulses through the chain as the blood is absorbed and disappears. Now that I'm registered as the owner, Peter reaches out and grasps the chain, hoping that he did everything right and it doesn't explode or something. Nothing. Sighing in relief, Peter grabs the pouch and pulls it open like a bag of chips. Instantly, the pouch stretches open wider than what seemed possible. Looking over at the two contained infinity stones, which were currently being used as paperweights on his desk, Peter placed them inside the pouch and closed it up. Done. Peter smiles as he puts the necklace on. I'll need to change this when I get the other stones, though. 
the power and space stones could be stored in the pouch thanks to the fact that their power is already contained by their respective vessels. The orb and tesseract. The pouch would likely disintegrate over time if he placed any loose infinity stone inside. I'll worry about that later, he thought with a shrug. Admiring the look of his new jewelry in the mirror, Peter noticed how tired he looked and started getting ready for bed. As he laid his head on the pillow after a warm shower, Peter checked his phone and found a bunch of calls from Fury, alongside texts that pretty much spelled out one thing. Avengers assemble. Of course, Peter wouldn't be answering that call right now. He knew what the calls were about. After all, he was the cause. His little stunt as Thanos probably sent the bald pirate into overdrive, but that was a problem for the morning. At least the Avengers will be wary of Thanos. Peter thought as his eyes began to droop sleepily. Bang. Just as he was about to fall asleep, someone slammed Peter's bedroom door open. What the? Peter sat up and found a smirking Tony Stark standing at his door. Why are you here? Fury's freaking out about some sort of Barney the Dinosaur alien. And you weren't picking up your phone, he says as he strolls in and sits in Peter's computer chair. So, I thought that since I know your super duper secret identity, I could stop by and see what's up. Who let you in? Peter asks, as the house has protections for unwanted visitors. Only someone keyed in can grant other people access. Mr. Stark. May's voice yells up the stairs. Do you take milk and sugar in your coffee? That would be your hot aunt. Tony says teasingly. Yes, please. Oh, God. Peter mutters as he puts a pillow over his face and groans. This has to be a bad dream. Hee <laughs> hee. I love knowing who you are. Tony enjoys the moment. Maybe I'll ask your aunt on a date? Tossing the pillow aside, Peter looks at Tony seriously. You stay away from Dash, Mr. Stark. May enters the room with a big mug and handed it to their guest. I hope it's good. I recently started using a French press. As I said downstairs, just call me Tony. Taking a sip, Tony smiles up at her from his seat. It's wonderful. Tony sends her a flirtatious smile as Peter glares into the side of his head annoyed with this entire situation. Knock, knock. Metallic knocking could be heard as Nebula stood outside Ronan the Accuser's sleeping quarters, tapping the locked door with her knuckles, though there was no response. Soon, the knocking turned to banging as Nebula lost her patience. Bang, bang. This seemed to get Ronan's attention as the doors swished open, and a fist flew at Nebula's face, knocking her backward and into the ship's metal hallway wall. Quit that incessant banging. Ronan commands. You. Nebula wipes some blood from the corner of her mouth and draws her blaster rifle on him. You were the one who ordered me to get you when we arrived. Not only was she acting as a servant, but she was struck for her efforts as well. Nebula was really starting to hate her father's newest subordinate. We're here. Ronan asks as he ignores the gun pointed at his chest and walks down the hall turning his back to Nebula. He knew she wouldn't fire. Afk! Nebula screams in anger as she forces herself to lower her rifle. Her father wouldn't be happy if she killed his latest lackey. Are you sure you're Peter's aunt? Tony starts flirting with May right in front of Peter. Because you don't look a day over 25. Oh! You don't have to lie like that. May says abashedly as she looks away for a moment. I've come to terms with being an old lady. Ugh! Peter groans quietly as he forces himself out of his warm and enticing bed. May, you're 36. That's hardly an old lady. Gasp, Peter. You should never reveal a woman's age like that. Tony fake gasps as he admonishes Peter. You shut up and stop trying to seduce my aunt. Peter says crankily as he pointed an accusing finger at Tony. What? May questions as Peter starts getting dressed. I would never... Tony denies swiftly, but Peter just scoffed at him. I wouldn't mind. May squeaks out as the plot of her favorite Korean drama, show plays in her mind. I could date a handsome and cold CO2. While May was off in her own imagination, the room froze as Peter and Tony stared at her in shock. Neither of them expected to hear that. Suddenly, Peter's computer screen lights up with a red message as a beeping sound starts playing through the speakers. Not only that, 
but a similar sound starts coming from Tony's phone as well. Turning to the computer screen, Peter and Tony instantly forgot all about what May just admitted. Visitors. Visitors? What does that mean? May was pulled from her daydreams. This is earlier than expected. Peter thought as he and Tony turned to look seriously at one another. During the summer, Peter and Tony both modified the Stark Industries satellites. They made it so the satellites would scan outward and notify them of any possible alien invasions. Peter was able to convince him to do this by mentioning the former Kree invasion that Fury told them about, which worked perfectly. Obviously, he did this to combat the New York invasion, as well as any other attacks on Earth that would follow. It could be an asteroid. Tony ignores May and offers up a viable excuse. No, we already fixed that bug. Peter replies negatively. Besides, I doubt it's a coincidence that Fury is raving about a purple alien, and now our satellites pick up something headed towards the planet. Talk about perfect timing. Peter thought. Aliens are coming to Earth? May says as she starts to freak out a little. Maybe, Peter says as he whips out his phone and dials a number. Hey Peter, I'm on the subway right now. I'll be there in a few minutes. I picked up some Chinese food from that place you like as well. MJ answers the call. Good. Come directly here and be quick about it. Peter doesn't clarify any further and hangs up the phone. With a wave of his hand, Peter opens a portal on the ceiling and out falls MJ's mother, Grace, who screamed in fright as she fell safely into Peter's computer chair. Huh. W what? Grace stutters in shock as she looks around and realizes where she was. Why am I? Is that Tony Stark? Yes, hello beautiful. Tony takes the shocked woman's hand and lays a quick kiss on her knuckles like a true gentleman. You can call me Tony? That's Fury's wife, Peter states with a knowing smile. Instantly, Tony drops her hand as if it were a big hairy spider and backs away, wiping his mouth with his sleeve for good measure. What's going on? Who's Fury? Grace asks in utter confusion. I'm really starting to regret keeping her in the dark. Peter thought with an internal sigh. That doesn't matter right now. Peter says as he waves his hand and a portal opens above his bed. Ah! Ned falls through the portal with his phone in hand, which was playing a familiar hentai video. He lands in the bed and instantly figures out what happened. As he locks his phone, hiding the porn and silencing the sweet moans that played through the speakers. D-dude. Ned stutters in embarrassment, though he was thankful that his pants were still on as he was only browsing. A little warning next time would be appreciated. Can't. Aliens are invading the planet. Peter reveals as another portal opens underneath him. Be right back. Peter disappears and the portal closes, leaving the shocked group alone in his bedroom. Did he say aliens? Grace asks fearfully. Is that Tony Stark? Ned starts fanboying out of nowhere. Before he could pester Tony too much, another portal opened and Peter walked through with multiple people over his shoulders. Is that my mom? Ned forgot about Tony and rushed over to what appeared to be his entire family. What happened to them? They're unconscious, Peter says as he lays them all on his bed carefully. Why? Ned asks in confusion. Was I not clear when I said alien invasion? Peter asks as he looks around the room. We get that, but why are you gathering everyone here? May asks. Because I don't need to worry about any of your safety. While I'm out there repelling an alien armada, Peter explains as his spider suit appears on his body. Why you're Spider-Man? Grace exclaims in shock. Before Peter could answer her, he could hear the door downstairs slam shut and some angry footsteps walking up the stairs. Peter Parker. You better have a good explanation for... MJ stomped into the room, expecting to give her boyfriend a piece of her mind after the way he spoke to her on the phone. Instantly, the wind was knocked out of her sails as she saw everyone in Peter's room, especially her mother, who was currently looking at Peter in his Spider-Man suit. Good you're here. That should be everyone, Peter says as he walks over to the wall by the door and touches it. As soon as his whole hand was on the wall, golden spell lines and runes lit up and spread throughout the entire house. What was that? Grace asks as she admires the golden nonsense on the walls. This house is now in lockdown, 
Peter explains as he walks over to Tony and opens a portal beside them. No one is allowed in or out until I return. Just keep the doors and windows shut, and the enchantment will keep you safe. There's enough food in the fridge and pantry to last a few months. But I shouldn't be gone anywhere near that long. Wait! MJ stopped Peter just as he was about to leave through the portal. What's going on? Why are you locking down the house? Smiling under his mask, Peter walked over and took MJ into his arms. There's a possible alien invasion. Peter says as he pulls up his mask and surprises her with a quick kiss. This house is the safest place to be. So I brought everyone over. That's why you were such a prick on the phone earlier. MJ mutters in realization. I wasn't a prick. I was rushed and I'm still rushed. Peter says as he pulls his mask back down and separates from MJ. Be safe. MJ wanted to follow after him, but knew that she would only get in his way. I always am. Peter smirks as he follows Tony through the portal, and it begins to close. May, if we all survive the aliens, I'll take you out to dinner. Tony calls out through the portal before it is fully closed. Peter was Spider-Man all along. Grace turns to her daughter and asks, Um, yeah, at the top of Avengers Tower. I'll take you out to dinner, Tony says as a slap connects to the back of his head. Ow! Stop hitting on my aunt, Peter says as Tony rubs his head in pain. She's like my mother, you sick bastard. What? She's a beautiful woman, Tony defends his actions. Don't you have pepper? Peter asks. Yeah. But she hasn't really been reciprocating my advances lately, Tony says embarrassingly. Oh, the great Tony Stark can't pick up a woman, so he has to try and seduce my aunt. Peter's words seem to hit a nerve. I'll have you know that I can seduce any woman, Tony says as a teasing smile adorns his face. And I'll prove it with your aunt. I hate you so much, Peter groans as he somehow lit a fire under Tony's desire for his aunt. I love you too. Just remember to call me Uncle Tony from now on. Tony says as he opens up the roof access door. Now come along. I'm sure Fury will be happy to see you. I may have to kill him. Peter thought darkly as he followed Tony onto the building. Outside Earth's orbit, 20 giant ships rushed toward the planet. At the head of these ships was an even larger and more majestic flagship. In the observation deck of this flagship, Ronan the Accuser watched as the green and blue planet grew larger as his army grew closer. Sir, we're in range for scans, a Kree subordinate says from across the room. Good. Scan for the Tesseract's exact location, Ronan orders and his subordinates get to work at their stations. Sir. The energy signature disappeared. One of the more brave Kree broke the news of their failure. Do it again. Ronan turns to glare at his subordinate and orders. WEV scanned for the Tesseract ten times. Sir. Another reveals. Ronan goes quiet as he looks at Earth questioningly. Did someone else take it already? Nebula asks, hoping that wasn't the case, as her father would probably blame her somehow. They must have found a way to contain the cube's energy. Ronan thought of the only other conclusion. How will we find it then? Nebula asks in annoyance. Don't tell me we have to scour the entire planet? No, that would take too much time. Ronan refused, as he wanted to be off of C-53 as soon as possible. Then what? Nebula asks. I have an idea. They aren't waking up. Ned says as he walks into the living room, where May, MJ, and Grace were sitting. The TV showed a random news channel, though no one was watching at the moment. It's probably one of Peter's spells. He must not want them knowing about the whole Spider-Man thing. MJ says as Ned takes a seat on the couch. Then why does your mom get to know? Ned asks as he points toward Grace. Well, other than the fact that we're together. My mother is married to a member of the Avengers Council. She would have learned about this sooner or later. MJ explains which caused Ned to huff a bit. I just wish that I could tell them. Ned says dejectedly though he understood the reasoning behind it. Your father is an Avenger. Grace asks in disbelief. That's not possible. Yes, it is. MJ says as she explains her father's background. 
Nick Watson isn't even his real name. It's Nick Fury. Grace goes silent for a moment as her mind processes all the lies she's been told up until now. How long have you known this? Her tone carried a hint of betrayal, as she felt that MJ should have told her this already. I, I, MJ didn't know what to say. Thankfully, they were interrupted before her mother's glare could do any more damage. Suddenly, the TV cut to a black and white mess as a loud static sound played through the speakers. Though this didn't last long. Before May could grab the control to fix the TV, the static disappeared and a picture of a blue-skinned man took its place. Behind him was a big window with the image of the Earth in the background. Greetings citizens of C-53. The blue man spoke with an air of superiority. I am Ronan the Accuser. I have come to this insignificant backwater planet in search of a cube known as the Tesseract. Bring me this object within the next 18 hours or my army will invade and I will take the Tesseract from the rubble of your barren home world. Your time starts now. Greetings. Citizens of C-53. I am Ronan the Accuser. The same speech replayed over and over. What the? May mutters as she changes the channel, but no matter which one she chose, they were all playing the same thing. We're going to be okay, right? Grace asks worriedly. Yeah. Peter will take care of them. Your time starts now, Ronan says as the live broadcast ended. Ronan chose that time frame specifically, as they left the Chitauri half of his army behind. Of course, he would rather just scare the planet into handing over the Tesseract, but if they don't give it up, he would rather attack with his whole army. Do we just wait now? Nebula asked from the side. No, you will lead a stealth team to the planet. Ronan says as he turns to her and waves, shooing her off. Make yourself useful and find the cube. Nebula seethed silently at her treatment as she begrudgingly turned and left the room. Walking into one of the larger meeting rooms in the tower, Peter and Tony found it filled with every current Avenger. Yo! Peter called putting with a wave. What's the occasion? You'd know if you answered your damn phone. Fury says angrily. Well, I'm here now. What's up? Peter asks as he takes a seat beside Mystique, who was looking at him funny. Tony said something about Barney the dinosaur? Fury glared in Tony's direction. What? I'm not allowed to joke? Tony asks with a shrug. No, now shut up. Fury says as he starts explaining about Peter's heist of the Tesseract. Banner and Beast have been trying to track its energy signature. But that hasn't been going well. Fury's gaze immediately turns back to Tony as he glares in annoyance. We could have had a breakthrough in this by now if someone didn't run off without informing anyone, he says. Sorry, I thought that having our venerable leader here would help morale. Tony defends as he points toward Peter. Who made him leader? Sabretooth asks with a scoff. Shut your mouth, Victor. Logan barks at his brother. Sabretooth glares and begins to growl, which is soon matched by Logan. If you two start fighting... I'll chain you both to a mountaintop for a month in the 69 position. Peter's commanding voice fills the room. Don't worry though, you'll never go thirsty. After all, you can drink each other's, well, you know. Instantly, the growling stops and the two look in the opposite direction. The room goes silent for a moment before Jarvis's voice appears out of nowhere. Sir, there's a foreign signal broadcasting across the world. The AI informs. Show us. Tony orders. Yes, sir. Jarvis says as a video plays on the large flat screen for all to see. Greetings, citizens of C-53. I am Ronan the Accuser. Ronan appears and explains his hunt for the Tesseract. Bring me this object within the next 18 hours or my army will invade, and I will take the Tesseract from the rubble of your barren home world. Your time starts now. It repeats after this. Jarvis says as the video paused. This message is being played on a loop through every television channel and radio station. What is Ronan doing here? Peter thought in confusion. Shouldn't he be after the Power Stone? The ripples from the waves of Peter's actions have begun to really show themselves. Without Loki, Thanos was forced to send out Ronan the Accuser. I wonder if Nebula is with him? Peter thought, as she was assigned to him during his search for the Power Stone in the movie. 
Nebula is one of the few characters that Peter felt bad for. Yeah, her sister Gamora was better than her in combat, but that doesn't mean Thanos had the right to do what he did to her. Forcing cybernetic enhancements onto your own daughter is just sick, especially an adopted child. Peter thought as he remembered the idiots from his past life that agreed with Thanos' cause and saw him as a good man. A good man would never mistreat his family. Looks like our satellites were correct. Tony says, drawing everyone's attention. What do you mean by that? Fury asks and Tony explained the alert that they received. But, this doesn't make any sense. Professor X says. Yes, if they already have the Tesseract, then why are they broadcasting this? Magneto agrees. The room goes silent as no one had a viable answer. We could be dealing with multiple enemies, Peter says offhandedly. He is the reason for this confusion so he should clear it up. Of course, he didn't think the day he impersonated Thanos, an alien invasion would take place. One stole the Tesseract already. While the other was a bit late to the game, Peter explains his thought-out lies. Makes sense. Mystique agrees as she tries to cover for Peter. Yes, but how do we handle this? Natasha asks next. We don't have what they want. At this rate, we have 18 hours until an alien invasion starts. 17 hours, 53 minutes and 22 seconds to be exact. Jarvis informs them. The room went silent again as everyone tried to come up with a plan. Why wait? Peter was the first to speak. What do you mean? Storm asks from beside Charles. Quickness is the essence of the war. Peter quotes Sun Tzu. Waiting for the enemy to attack is pointless. We should strike swiftly before they can even break into Earth's atmosphere. I love the art of war as much as the next guy, but I don't think old Sun Tzu was writing about an alien invasion. Tony says with a laugh. No, but he was writing about war, which this is. Peter says matter-of-factly. Just think of this as a foreign country at our border. A foreign country with blue soldiers and alien tech. Should be easy. Tony says jokingly. I never said it would be easy. But there isn't an alternative. Peter says with a shrug. Either we attack now or we wait for the timer to run out and they attack. Either option is war. We could give them the cube. Charles offers his thoughts. Okay. Where is it? Peter asks sarcastically. Oh, that's right. We don't have it. And for all we know, it could already be off-planet with Barney the freaking dinosaur. All doubters went quiet without a word to say. Mystique was especially quiet as she wrestled with the idea of revealing what she knew. Though after a few moments, she decided to keep her mouth shut. After all, Peter wouldn't feel very inclined to fulfill her request anymore should she out him. I know that we aren't soldiers, but this is war. A war that we are going to fight either way. It just so happens that my way will save a lot of innocent lives. If we can contain the fighting off the planet, that is. Did I hear someone say war? Peggy says as she walks in with Steve beside her. Need any help? Steve asks as he and Peggy stroll into the room. Yeah. Feel like kicking some blue alien butt? Peter responds excitedly. Are they really alien? I mean, they could be metahumans, right? Like James? He asks in confusion as he points to Logan. I told you to stop calling me that. Logan yells gruffly from across the room. I don't have those memories anymore. You two know each other? Peter asks as he was out of the loop. Yeah, he was a member of the Howling Commandos, James Howlett. He, Bucky, and I fought against Hydra and the Nazis together. Steve pauses for a moment as he remembers the sad loss of his best friend, Bucky. Peggy senses his dampening mood and places a reassuring hand on his shoulder, which seemed to snap Steve out of his funk. James was the only man in my unit that could keep up with me. I thought that it was just amazing genetics and training at the time, but now I know he's a metahuman. Steve says as he smiles over at Logan, who grunts and looks the other way. I see. Peter says as he looks over at Logan and chuckles to himself. Well, don't worry about Logan. He may seem all gruff and uncaring, but he's a big softy on the inside. He'll warm up to you soon enough. Just keep pestering him and he'll give up. Hearing this, Logan couldn't help but sigh in annoyance. I'll keep that in mind, Steve says with some renewed vigor. Please don't. 
Logan mutters to himself, but those with enhanced hearing picked it up clearly. Especially Steve, who flashed a big smile at his old friend's attitude. You may not remember, but you haven't changed, he says as he looks at Peter. So, they are aliens, right? Yep, our satellites picked up their arrival. Peter explains as he continues, stopping Steve from asking another question. And before you ask, no, we don't have the object they're looking for. After quickly bringing the two love birds up to speed, Peggy's nods her head and speaks up. Yeah, we should attack as quickly as possible. Peggy agreed with Peter's reasoning. I'm usually not for throwing the first punch, but I agree as well. Steve follows after his lover. Besides, as you said, containing all fighting outside the planet will save countless lives. With the extra nudge from Peggy and Steve, the whole room came to an agreement. They would attack as quickly as possible. All right, what's the plan? Tony asks. Hmm. Peter took a moment to think as almost everyone in the room turned their gaze to him. Tony, get me the exact coordinates of their ships. On it, he says as he swipes at the table in front of him, causing a holographic keyboard and screen to appear in front of him as Tony was typing away. Peter turned to Magneto. Based on the fact that their ships are most likely made of metal, your powers will be invaluable in this mission. Peter says as Magneto who nods in agreement. Though, I'm thinking of sidelining you for this mission. Why? Eric asks in confusion. Well, I don't want the Avengers' new spaceships to be ruined. Peter says offhandedly. Instantly, Tony stops typing and turned his head with a crazy smile forming on his face. Though he wasn't the only one, a few others looked interested in Peter's words as well, especially Beast and Banner. You are brilliant! Tony exclaimed as all sorts of thoughts started forming in his head. We would need to take at least one of them apart for studying. Not to mention the fuel. What if they run on some sort of alien diesel? We'll have to find out what they use. Ahem. Steve clears his throat, stopping Tony from continuing his rant. As much as the thought of exploring space is exciting, can we please focus on neutralizing the threat before anything else? You're right. Tony back to work. Peter nods in agreement. Just remember that the faster you get the coordinates, the faster we can acquire our new toys. Yes, sir. Tony gives a mock salute and gets right back at it. Though he seems to be typing a bit faster than before. I can contain my power from destroying their ships. There's no reason for me to stay behind. Magneto explains as he wants to participate in the war. That would be very appreciated. Peter nodded towards him and turns to Banner. Sadly, you won't be able to join this mission. I wasn't planning to. Banner scoffs with a self-deprecating smile. Not only would Hulk destroy those ships, I run the chance of being sucked into the cold vacuum of space. No thanks. Before anyone could reply, Tony jumps out of his seat. Got it. He exclaims as the coordinates appear on the screen for everyone to see. Twenty different coordinates. All of them for each ship in orbit around the planet. Okay. Suit up, everyone. Peter yells to the surrounding Avengers. We're leaving in 20 minutes. Um, I don't have any combat gear. Steve says to Peter as everyone was rushing out of the door to get ready. Neither do I. Peggy speaks up next. Follow me. Leading the loving young couple to Tony's lab, Peter invites them in to find the man himself doing some last-minute checks on his Iron Man armor. Ha! Huh. Tony picks up his head to see some uninvited visitors. What are they doing here? They need their equipment, Peter says cryptically. Oh yeah. Immediately, a look of realization appeared on Tony's face as he gets up and walks to an empty wall across the room. Question mark. Steve and Peggy watched in confusion as Tong tapped the wall. Suddenly, it opened up to reveal matching his and hers dark blue Captain America-themed suits. Wow! Steve muttered, as he still wasn't used to the futuristic technology of today's age. Though he was also awed by the cool suits as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Tony says excitedly as he taps the wall again. What about Captain America's trusty shield? Once again, the wall opened a bit more, revealing the captain's red, white, and blue pristine disc-shaped shield. 
How? Steve asks in confusion. I thought the metal your father used was beyond rare. Oh, it is. Tony nodded in agreement as he points to the Peter. Spidey stole your old shield from your room, and we reforged it. Steve turned and gave Peter an accusing look. What? Peter says a bit defensively. It was just taking up space broken at the back of your closet. Besides, now you have a perfectly functioning shield. And for the lovely lady, Tony smiles toward Peggy and gestures to the two pistols below the shield. Two matching matte black dessert eagles. We tried to make you a shield too, but vibranium is hard to find. Even for me, Tony says as she walks over and takes the guns. Thanks. I'm more used to guns anyway, Peggy says as she looks down at her new weapons. Without her recent power-up, handing akimbo desert eagles would be impossible. After all, they are one of the highest caliber pistols you can buy. The kick would be too much for a normal human to manage. But not anymore. Hmm? Steve looks around a little embarrassedly. Is there a place that we could change? In a tiny transport ship, Nebula and a small Kree recon squad stealthily launched off of Ronan's flagship and descended to the blue and green planet below. Ronan the Accuser watches the ship depart with a cruel smile on his face. He knew that sending her down to the planet was nothing but a wild goose chase. Nebula would find nothing and simply waste her time. Even she knew that. Without the Tesseract's energy signature to follow, it would take an army to scour the planet to accomplish. Sir, is it wise to treat the daughter of Thanos like this? One of Ronan's grunts asks worriedly. After all, Thanos wasn't a being that anyone could offend. Heh. Even Thanos doesn't respect her. Ronan says with a small laugh. Why should I? As Nebula's recon ship left the flagship, three golden portals opened on three separate Kree ships. As portal number one opened, Professor X rolled on in alongside Nightcrawler, Storm, Beast, and Hawkeye. Each X-Men were dressed in black tactical gear with a yellow X on their chest. On a separate ship, Portal number two opened, and out strolled a confident Magneto, followed by Victor, Logan, Mystique, and Natasha. They all wore black tactical gear, though Logan's had the trademark yellow X on his. Why am I stuck with you? Logan muttered, annoyed at his team placement. Shut up. Victor barks back angrily. Finally, on the flagship at the head of all 20 Kree warships, the last portal opened, and out walked Peter followed by Tony, Fury, Steve, and Peggy. Steve and Peggy donned their newly gifted suits, while Fury wore the same trench coat he always does. Tony was, of course, armed in his newest Iron Man suit, the Mark VII. Insert picture, Team 2 and 3, do you read me? Peter tapped his ear and spoke in a hushed tone. Loud and clear, Charles answers back. Yes, Eric follows soon after. Good. Let the war begin. As Ronan the Accuser stared out of the observation deck, a nearby alarm went off, which caused the Kree grunts at their stations to start busily working. What is it? Ronan asks in annoyance. Um, there seem to be intruders on two of our ships, sir. Someone explains as another alarm starts going off. They're on our ship as well. How did they get in? Ronan asks with a deep frown. The scans should have picked up any ships in the area especially boarding ships. Ronan's tone was accusatory as he wondered if his followers were growing lazy and incompetent. After all, his ships are the latest and greatest of Kree technology. Their scanners could detect the slightest movement for thousands of miles. Even stealth ships stood no chance against Kree technology so in his mind, they had to have been slacking off. As the pressure surmounted on them, the Kree soldiers got to work trying to figure out how this happened. After all, the displeased face of their leader was not something that any Kree soldier wanted to see. Many Kree have been executed after seeing that face. Sir, the ship's life signs show them appearing on Sector 5. Someone informs as an image of a hallway blueprint appears on the screen for all to see. One second the hallway was empty, and the next, five red dots appeared, being picked up by the motion scanner in the hall. How odd. Ronan mutters as he looks over at the armed guards at the door. Sound the alarms and retrieve the intruders. Kill them if you have to, 
but leave at least one alive for questioning. Do the same for the other ships as well. Yes, sir. Let the war begin. Peter says over their encrypted comms before turning to his team. All right, should we split up or... Just as Peter was talking, a loud alarm filled the hall. Well, I think they know we're here. Peter mutters as the door in front of them opens and some lasers bolts come flying out. Jumping in front of Fury, Steve held up his shield, which deflected a few of the lasers off to the side. Everyone else dodged except for Tony, who fires a thick energy beam from his chest. The larger energy beam seemed to swallow the rest of the red blaster bolts, countering the attack and pushing forward toward the blue Kree soldier on the other side of the door. Not expecting the sudden counterattack, the Kree stood shocked as the energy beam tore through their ranks, drilling a gruesome hole through one after another. As the chest beam died down, the limp bodies of the first responding Kree soldiers toppled over, dead. Damn, is that new? Peter asked in awe. Tony would usually attack with his thrusters, but his chest didn't have a thruster, so that was most likely the pure energy of his arc reactor. Yeah, the bedassium made that possible with a few tweaks, of course. Tony explains. Cool. Peter muttered as they ignored the dead bodies and pushed onward through the ship. As they continued, the slaughter of blue aliens continued. With their firepower, clearing the hallways of the ship was easy work. The only one in the group that needed a bit of looking after was Fury, though he could handle himself for the most part. Especially after he looted the Kree for their weaponry. Peter felt no guilt for the deaths of these Kree. He knew from the movies that Ronan was a bloodthirsty warmonger, who would slaughter planets of innocent people if they stood in his way. Those that chose to follow this sort of leader deserved zero pity. Though the same couldn't be said for Steve, who knew nothing of these aliens. As more and more blue humanoids were killed mercilessly, the good-hearted captain would look away from their bodies and push forward. The only thing keeping him from cracking was the fact that these were aliens, not humans. Killing fellow humans had a sort of dirty feeling about it, but aliens weren't as bad for some reason. As for Tony, Fury, and Peggy, they seemed to not care one bit. Two of them are old, hardened soldiers, while the other grew used to killing in his own personal war in Afghanistan. Ronan watched on the screens, as his men, which were represented by blue dots, rushed to their inevitable deaths over and over. Each time they would engage the red-marked intruders, they would disappear from the scanner, as their life signal would end. Ronan began to grow angry as he watched in silence. How could he not? Almost 200 of his soldiers died already. For nothing. Useless. He muttered loud enough for his surrounding grunts to flinch. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Taking a breath to dissipate his anger, Ronan turned to his subordinates and ordered, Change of plans. Order those useless idiots to retreat to my position. Ronan commands as he grabs his war hammer and walks to the door. Use the hallway doors to lead the intruders to the arena. Uh, yes sir. One responds as they jump quickly to comply with his orders. Leaving the room with his hammer over his shoulder, Ronan makes his way to the arena with ten fully armed Kree soldiers at his back. That number would continue to grow as he maneuvered through the halls unimpeded. Mmm. Peter hummed as they hadn't run into any Kree for a few minutes. It's quiet, Tony says as he looks toward Peter. Too quiet. You had to say that, didn't you? Peter sighs at his friend's shitty sense of humor. What? It's a good movie line. Tony argues as the door to their right suddenly swishes open. Exclamation point. Instantly, the group was ready for another battle. Sadly, they were met with nothing but an empty metal hallway. This definitely isn't a trap, Peter says with a healthy chunk of sarcasm. I would say otherwise, Steve says not understanding. Do they not have sarcasm back in your day? Peter asks over his shoulder. Oh, Steve grunts in realization. Well, into the obvious trap we go. Tony exclaims as he walks down the hall. Meh, whatever, Peter says as he follows after him. Uh, shouldn't we? Steve wanted to speak up against this, but Peggy and Fury already walked past him and into the trap as well. With no other option, the captain follows behind Peggy, alert to his surroundings and ready for anything. As they followed the obvious enemy plan, 
Countless doors opened for them over and over, leading the group through the ship and down a large elevator. When the elevator opened, a giant stadium-shaped room came into view. It was a circular stadium with countless seats surrounding what appeared to be a combat area, based on the bloodstains and weapons lining the walls. The elevator opened on the wall of the arena, where they could see a tall blue man with a war hammer in hand, waiting at the center for their arrival. The seats in the crowd were filled with Kree soldiers, each aiming their various alien weaponry at the open elevator. You finally arrived, Ronan says irritably. Well, it takes time to follow a badly thought out trap. Peter comments as he walks out of the elevator fearlessly, followed by Tony, Steve and Peggy. Fury stood behind and leaned into cover at the corner of the elevator with his new alien blaster rifle in hand. He couldn't dodge lasers like the rest of them so he would provide cover from the safety of the elevator. Ronan seems to notice this and tilts his head to the side to peek at Fury. Oh, don't mind him, Peter says as he knew what Ronan was thinking. Fury's just a bit shy. As Peter says this, he shoots a few webs around the open elevator doors, lodging them in place. He didn't need to deal with a kidnapped Nick Fury after all. What was that? Ronan asked curiously as the doors to the elevator tried to close, as Peter thought, but sadly for them, the web held it back. Sorry. Whenever I see a handsome blue man like yourself, I just start shooting web, Peter says jokingly. Premature ejaculation, Tony says with a sympathetic nod. Men are disgusting. Peggy scoffs at their little joke. Enough. Ronan roars in anger. You will dutifully answer my questions or else. Instantly, the crowd of soldiers readied their weapons. In close quarters, the intruders may have had the advantage, but not anymore. Oh, is it starting? Peter says excitedly. I think it is. Tony answers. Is what starting? Ronan asks in confusion. The badass fight scene. Peter says like it was the most obvious thing in the world. You know, the bad guy leads the heroes into a trap, the trap is sprung, but the heroes fight back. Hence, the badass fight scene. I'm really disappointed with this villain's service, Tony says as he puts on his best Karen impression. Where's your manager? Meanwhile, the whole crowd of aliens stared dumbly at the odd intruders. They didn't understand a single thing they were saying. Enough of this nonsense. Ronan lost his cool and points at the intruders. Fire! As soon as Ronan gave the order, the small stadium of Kree soldiers opened fire. Thousands of laser bolts fired in Peter's group's direction all at once. Sadly for them, each of their targets swiftly dodged out of the way. Tony activated his hand and feet thrusters and shot off into the air. Thankfully, the ceiling was extremely tall in this portion of the ship. As he ascended into the air, small hidden compartments on the Iron Man armor started opening up. Countless weapons appeared on Tony's body as his helmet's HUD starts to lock on to a large portion of the Kree soldiers. Lock on engaged. Jarvis' voice echoes from his suit. As the last Kree soldier was confirmed with a green square around them, Tony said a quick prayer in his head to whichever alien god they may follow. Fire! Tony commands. Instantly, countless bullets, rockets, and even a good amount of lasers were let loose at around one-sixth of the crowd. Bullets pierced heads with expert accuracy. Bombs were strategically fired at areas that would reap the most lives. Lasers sliced through whole rows of blue men and women, cutting them in half in a single moment. Every target that the HUD locked onto was killed without a problem. Damn, Peter muttered as he dodged the lasers and rushed toward Ronan, who was waiting with his hammer in hand. Tony really upgraded his firepower. Huh. Ronan who watch all of this play out, was both shocked and enraged. The whole point of this little trap was to cut down the unnecessary losses that were taking place earlier. Noticing the red and blue spider-themed man that was rushing challengingly towards him, Ronan turned his hatred and anger toward Peter. Once I'm finished with you intruders, I will cleanse your world with the might of Cree justice and burn it to IT's core. Ronan bellowed as he gripped his hammer with two hands, preparing for a fight. Why are you yelling? You mad? Peter comments as he kicks off the ground and launches at Ronan feet first. Seeing this attack coming, as a hardened war veteran should, 
Ronan pointed his hammer at Peter and twisted it slightly. Instantly, Peter could feel some sort of minor kinetic force collide with his leg, trying to snap his ankle before he could land his kick. H.M. What's that? Peter thought as he eyed the long-handled hammer in Ronan's hand. Ronan is the wielder of a powerful hammer known as the Cosmirod, which is a large staff-like warhammer. In addition to using it as a melee weapon, he can also fire some sort of force from it to attack his enemies. Sadly for him, Peter's body is far too enhanced to be affected by some minor kinetic energy attack. All Ronan's attack did was push Peter's foot to the side a bit, though it was enough to throw his kick off course. Cool hammer, Peter comments as he flies past Ronan, missing his attack, though that didn't mean he couldn't recover. Abandoning his original attack plan altogether, Peter pulled his fist back and punched Ronan square in his blue face as he passed by. Ronan instantly dropped his hammer and launched off of his feet as he flew into the wall across the room, smacking into it with a loud metallic thud. The metal wall behind him dented inward as some blue blood dropped from his mouth, possibly due to internal injuries. Of course, Ronan was a Kree blessed with enhanced strength, durability, agility, etc. So one strike from Peter, which would kill any lesser man, was shrugged off after a few breaths. Standing with the help of the wall behind him, Ronan seethed as he looked across the arena, but couldn't find the man that sent him flying. What he did see, however, only fed into his already explosive rage. Not only was Iron Man constantly raining death upon his fellow Kree, but Steve and Peggy stuck together and ran around the arena, slipping past laser fire and using Cap's shield for cover when necessary. Everywhere they would go, Steve would take care of the close quarters fighting, while Peggy would stick close and use her new oversized pistols to decimate the more distant enemies. Each time a loud bang would go off, a Kree soldier would drop to the ground with a .50 caliber hole in their body. Meanwhile, Fury stayed in his safe elevator, clinging to the wall. He would peek out on occasion and pick off as many Kree soldiers as he could before he drew too much attention and hit again. This would repeat over and over as Iron Man and the Super Soldier couple were good distractions for him. Looking for someone? Ronan heard over his head and looks up. Standing on the wall sideways with his arms crossed over his chest, Peter looks down at Ronan with an air of amusement. I can tell it angers you that your men keep dying, Peter says, as the vengeful and rage-fueled look on Ronan's face was prominent. How about you surrender and we won't kill anymore, Cree? Of course, they would have to surrender as well. Ronan silently seethed as the man above him offered him a way out. Surrender is for the weak, and the Cree are not weak. He exclaimed and rushed to his hammer, which was only a few meters away. You asked for it, I guess. Peter mutters as he bends and launches himself off into the air. Just as Ronan was about to bend down and swipe his hammer off the floor, Peter flew over him and shot a web. As the web stuck to Ronan's trusted weapon, Peter yanked it back. Ronan could do nothing but watch as his hammer was stolen before his very eyes. As I said before, this is a cool hammer, Peter says as he lands in front of Ronan and twirls the staff-like hammer around his fingers. I used to have a better one, but I had to return it. I think I'll keep it this time, though. After all, the dead have no use for material things, right? Peter says as Ronan's heart began to beat erratically as throbbing veins start to appear on his blue face. Ronan was pissed off when Thanos called him, boy, and treated him as a child. He was also pissed off when his grunts died pointlessly. But this was a whole other level. Kill him? Ronan has destroyed entire worlds. Yet this masked buffoon wanted to kill him? You think that you could kill me? Ronan asks as if it were impossible. I am Ronan the Accuser. I have brought reckoning to more planets and peoples than anyone can count. You're nothing but some enhanced ape from a backwater world. Hmm. How did he do it again? As Ronan was ranting, Peter ignored his every word and pointed the staff forward. Is it just a movement? Twisting it slightly as Ronan did, a kinetic force fired from the staff-like hammer. Snap crack. The force seemed to connect with the ranting Ronin's neck, twisting it at an odd angle with a sickening sound. Before he could finish his long-winded rant, Ronin toppled over onto the cold, hard metal arena floor. That, well, I gave him a chance. 
Peter muttered as he walks over to check for any vital signs. Although Peter was able to pretty much bat away the kinetic attack earlier, the same couldn't be said for Ronan. Comparatively, Ronan's enhanced body was far weaker than someone like Spider-Man. The whole arena stilled, and the fighting paused as every Kree soldier looked over to see Peter check the pulse of their downed leader. He's dead, Peter confirmed loud enough for all to hear. The rest of you can either follow in his footsteps or surrender and be spared. Choose wisely. The whole arena descended into silence as the Avengers gave the Kree soldiers a moment to decide whether they wanted to live or die. If they chose wisely, as Peter said, the surviving Kree would be imprisoned. At least until Peter could figure out what to do with them. Of course, the only other option was death. Soon, the first soldier dropped his rifle and held his hands up. This triggered a widespread chain reaction as one by one more Kree began to surrender. Traitors! One Kree yelled as he turned his gun on his own comrades and fired. Seeing this, other radical Kree started joining in as a sort of civil war broke out between those that wanted to surrender and those that would rather die. Jarvis, lock on. Tony Commander as his HUD highlighted all of the people that refused to surrender. Fire. With one last volley, Tony swiftly dropped the more radical half of their impromptu civil. The surviving Kree looked at the dead bodies of their former comrades in both shame and relief. Shame that they gave up in order to preserve their lives, and relief that they weren't the ones dead on the floor. Team 1, this is Team 2. Charles's voice suddenly sounds through Peter's earpiece. We've taken control of our first ship and captured about a quarter of the aliens on board. We've done the same. Eric speaks next without any form of radio etiquette. Though I'm afraid we've taken no prisoners on our end. That's fine. Peter holds his hand to his ear and says with a shrug. Here, waving his hand, Peter opens portals for the two teams to move on to the next ships on the list. Three ships down, 17 more to go. While the two other teams started their assault on the next ships, Peter and his team started the cleanup process. Someone needed to deal with the remaining Kree soldiers, after all. There's no doubt in Peter's mind that they would probably try and escape if left to their own devices. Especially since the alternative would be leaving them in their own escape vehicles. This isn't as fun as I thought it would be. Tony says as he and the others escort the surrendered Kree through Peter's portals and into the Avengers Tower detainment floor. Just as he was saying this, the comms in their ears sounded off. Team 2 has captured our second ship with prisoners once again. Charles informs them. Same here. Eric says only seconds after. We spared a few this time as well. Good job, portals incoming. Peter says as he waves his hand and more portals appear. Including one in front of Tony and the rest of his team. Go ahead. I know you want to. What? Steve asks in confusion. Well, maybe not you. But I know that Tony wants to fight more aliens, so go capture another ship. Peter says in a resigned tone as he gestures to the portal. I can handle the prisoners myself. Yes. Tony says excitedly as his helmet's face mask snaps shut. Thanks, Tingles. Hey. I told you about my spider senses in confidence. Peter protests jokingly as Tony shoots off into the portal. Ready for a fight. Should we follow him? Steve asks as Peggy huffs in annoyance. Let's go before he gets himself killed. Unholstering her pistols, Peggy steps through the portal, followed by Steve. Fury was currently preoccupied, so he wouldn't be joining them. Have fun, I guess. Peter shrugs as he continued escorting prisoners from multiple ships. Thankfully, the other ships haven't been notified of what's happening so far, or else they would probably escape as quickly as possible. This is all thanks to Peter, who convinced the Kree on the flagship to send out some fake messages. After all, the flagship is where all the orders come from in the first place. After sending these messages, which kept all the Kree in the other 20 ships calm, they cut the communications between the ships, making it only possible for them to get information from the flagship, which Peter already had under complete control. Meaning, no one outside the flagship knew that their glorious leader Ronan the Accuser is dead. Though they do know that three of the ships had some unforeseen intruders, as Peter didn't have control at the time that information was circulated. Of course, Peter was sure to inform the other ships that the intruders were dealt with, 
before warning each ship to be on the lookout for any more possible stowaways. After all, he had to make sure everything was believable. It's not like they have a chance, Peter thought uncaringly. Of course, after misinforming all of those ships, Peter left Fury with the Kree in charge of communications. These Kree would be imprisoned with the rest when they weren't useful anymore. Of course, he had his new favorite weapon in hand, the Kree laser rifle. Who better to leave in charge of their misinformation tactics than a super spy? Peter thought, reassured by this choice. With the best of the best running disinformation for them, the war continued, but by this point it was more of a one-sided steamrolling. It's too bad that I'm stuck here doing grunt the work, Peter thought as he continued managing portals and escorting prisoners to the detainment floor. As the Kree would flood through the portals, Peter made sure that they saw two things specifically. These two things immediately squash any thoughts of rebellion from their minds. First, as Peter escorted the Kree like a warden of a prison, he held Ronan's hammer in hand for all to see. Instantly, the idea of being saved by Ronan the Accuser became doubtful, as all other ships didn't know about his death. Second, displayed on the floor beside the portal leading to the detainment floor was the cold and lifeless body of their leader, immediately proving that planted doubt in their minds. Thanks to this small tactic of his, Peter only had to deal with some small defiance here and there. No large-scale riots took place which he was thankful for. Of course, Peter could have handled that, though he probably would have had to kill some of them in the process. After all, Charles and his team left a lot of the Kree alive, but luckily Eric's group seemed to offset this as they emptied their first ship of all life, and then started leaving a few alive so as not to look bad. Hours later and the last ship was under their control. Peter spent all of these hours stuck as a babysitter for blue aliens. I need to find another Avenger that can be the portal bitch for occasions like this, Peter thought as he finished locking up the last of the Kree. Sighing in relief as he returned to the flagship, Peter found the battle-hardened Avengers standing in the observation deck, watching the world below in silence. Everyone seemed to be in one piece, though that was hard to tell for both Logan and Victor, who were both covered in blue blood. Whoa! You two look like someone spilled paint all over you, Peter comments as he can smell the odd-scented alien blood wafting off of them. You could have been less messy, you know? Ugh. They both grunt and don't bother answering, as Peter wasn't the first one to say something like that. That's what we all said, Tony states with a nod as he keeps his distance from the two. Are the prisoners detained? Fury asks. Yeah, though we may need to expand our prison by another floor or two. We're currently at capacity, Peter says with a tired sigh. It's been a while since Peter has gotten some rest, as he was rudely interrupted by Tony. So dealing with the boring grunt work has only made him miss his nice warm bed even more. What should we do with these ships? Charles asks from his wheelchair. Hmm, we'll have to learn how to fly them before anything else. Peter says thoughtfully. We could try to connect Jarvis to their systems. Tony offers with an excited look on his face. He should be able to learn the controls instantly. What if it's all in an alien language? Peter asks as he contemplates that idea. I think he can figure it out, Tony says with a shrug. Fine, you work on that, Peter says as he turns back to the other Avengers. The rest of you can return to the tower and relax. What about you? Tony asks before getting to work. Off to bed. No, I have a planet full of people to calm down, Peter says as he sighs in annoyance. We don't need any nukes launched at our new ships after all. Receiving a sympathetic nod from Tony as he gets to work, Peter waves his hand and leaves with the rest of the Avengers. Only Tony remained on the flagship. Are we sure it's a good idea to leave him in space? Alone? Charles asks as the portal closes behind them. Yeah. Won't he drift off or something? Clint speaks up as well. No, he'll be fine, Peter says with a shake of his head. The ships are all in orbit so they won't just fly off. Unless he does something stupid. Back in space. Okay. Jarvis. Tony says as he looks between all the alien controls panels. Let's take this all apart and make a port to connect you. As he didn't have any of his tools, Tony used his Iron Man suit to rip the control panels apart and study the insides. 
Sparks fly as he tears apart the control room without a care for any of the possible consequences. But Tony's smarter than that. Peter says as many Avengers give him skeptical looks. Yeah, you're right. I'll check on him once I'm done calming the masses. Good idea. Fury nods. All right, off I go. Peter says as he turns to Fury. Can you start questioning our new alien guests? We could use all the information we can get. Yeah, I'll start now. Fury nods as he walks out of the room, followed by Natasha and Clint. Leaving the rest of the Avengers to do as they pleased, Peter left the room and took out his phone. Checking Twitter as he maneuvered through the tower's halls, Peter found everyone freaking out about Ronan's message. I should have posted something earlier. Peter sighed as he wrote a tweet. At Spider underscore man. Press conference at Avengers Tower in 30 minutes. Just as things were calming down on Earth, the Chitauri army soared through empty space, trying their best to catch up to the faster Kree army. 10 hours, 23 minutes and 39 seconds. 9 hours, 40 minutes, 52 seconds. Standing at a podium in a room filled with cameras and microphones, which were all pointed in his direction by various members of the press, Peter started explaining the latest mission that the Avengers undertook. Hello, everyone, Peter says as he waves, his image being broadcast across the world. Before locking up the Kree that helped spread misinformation for them, Peter had them shut down the replaying message that looped all over Earth. If he didn't, then this whole press conference would be blocked, making the whole thing pointless. I'm gonna get straight to the point and then leave to deal with other things, so listen up, Peter says, as he was too tired to deal with the questions of hungry reporters. The alien army that was threatening our planet through our TVs and radios has been dealt with. They were in orbit around our planet, waiting to invade. We, the Avengers, acted quickly and launched an attack before they could enter Earth's atmosphere. As that would keep all of you away from the fighting, the world was shocked, as most people didn't actually believe in an alien invasion. They thought it was some sort of hoax orchestrated by some hacker or something. Even hearing the words from Spider-Man's mouth didn't sway many of them, as it was just too outlandish of a tale. Peter went into a little more detail and explained about the Kree and Ronan the Accuser, though he didn't say much more before walking off stage. That's it for now. When we have more information, either I or Tony will call another one of these, Peter says as he waves and walks off. I can hear my bed calling for me. Wait! One of the more loud-mouthed reporters yells as they step in front of the crowd. You really expect us to just believe all of this without a single shred of proof? This seemed to incite the other reporters and journalists in the crowd, as they all started shouting their own questions. I said no questions, didn't I? Peter thought in annoyance as he sighed and walked back to the podium and glared at the crowd under his mask. Quiet. Peter didn't raise his voice, but the annoyed tone along with the dangerous feeling he was radiating at the moment seemed to scare the crowd into silence. Tony is currently doing his best to figure out how to fly the Kree ships that we commandeered, Peter says with complete confidence. In space, sparks go flying as Tony sat in the middle of hundreds of alien wires from the destroyed control panels of the flagship. Hmm. Not that one either. Tony mutters to himself as the lights on the ship suddenly shut down, leaving him in darkness. That's not good. I'm sure that many of you will see them when we bring them down to Earth. As for other forms of proof, we have many survivors from the battle that are currently detained and undergoing interrogation as we speak. Maybe we'll release some recordings from these interrogations later, Peter says with a shrug, shutting down the doubters for the moment. Now I have to get back to the tower. See ya. This time, the crowd was silent as Peter walked off stage, leaving them with the idea that aliens actually may have planned on attacking them. The same could be said for many around the world as well. 8 hours, 49 minutes, 39 seconds. In a dark interrogation room in the tower, Fury sat across from a chained Kree soldier. Neither said a word as Fury just stared at him in silence. Using his plethora of experience, Fury first set his sights on the more cooperative Kree, dragging them in and out, looking for the one that would either brag about themselves or break and start spilling everything. Either way, he would get the information they needed. He could have just started torturing the Kree, as they weren't humans or from Earth, so technically, they had no human rights. 
Too bad torture is unreliable. Fury thought as he waited for the Kree before him to speak first, continuing the staring contest. Torture in interrogation yields poor information, as the victim would say, and admit to anything just to make the pain stop. Not to mention the fact that it sweeps up many innocents. The soldier you're drowning, cutting, or starving could just be a man that was drafted and forced into service. The possibility of torturing an innocent prisoner just wasn't worth it. Though there is a time and a place for torture tactics, though that's in extreme and dire circumstances, but this wasn't one of those situations. Are you just going to stare at me all day? The Kree finally asked. Yes. Now why did you come to my planet? Fury answered and throws out his first question. The Kree man stays quiet, refusing to answer. Was it actually the Tesseract? Or was that just a ploy Ronin cooked up? So he could justify invading a peaceful world? Fury asks pointedly. Justification? The Kree laughs as the chains tying him down rattle. We do not care whether your world is peaceful or not. The Kree take what they want. The question is whether the other party hands it over respectfully, or well. You heard Ronan's words in the message. Yeah, but he's dead now. Fury comments as he places a picture of Ronan's dead body on the table. Instantly, the Kree prisoner starts to glare as he looked toward the picture of his former leader. Ronan's head was snapped sideways, and a bone could be seen poking through his neck. For some big bad alien warlord, your leader died almost instantly, Fury says, purposefully angering the alien across from him. It was so anticlimactic, too. He was ranting about how he couldn't die. Then my comrade used Ronan's own weapon against him and snapped his neck like a twig. This Kree was from a separate ship, so he was just learning about what happened to Ronan. You know nothing about Ronan the Accuser. The Kree seethed as he pulled on his restraints, trying to attack Fury, who was completely unfazed. He is the perfect Kree. Ronan embodies all of our most sacred ancient customs. Well, I think you mean he was the perfect Kree. Fury continues poking at a hornet's nest. Truthfully, from your explanation of him, I was expecting more. After all, he died so easily. Shut your mouth, you dirty ape. The Kree bellowed hatefully as he strains against his chains. You know, I've been called some pretty racist shit by a lot of humans, but never an alien. Fury commented as he found this scenario entertaining. Watching from the cameras, Natasha and Clint couldn't help but gape at what the Kree said. Can an alien even be racist? Natasha asks with a thoughtful look. Probably, but I think he was throwing that insult at all humans, not just well. You know, Clint replies as they go back to watching the monitor. Seeing that the man before him found his outburst funny, the Kree continues to thrash against his restraints for a moment before finally giving up. Heavy breathing, you think? It's over, don't you? The Kree says as he catches his breath. You think? Your planet's safe? Fury doesn't answer and waits for him to explain. We were only the first to arrive, the Kree says with a triumphant smile. When Thanos' army descends on this pitiful planet, you apes won't stand a chance. Who's Thanos? Fury asks, but the smug Kree refused to speak any further. Five hours, 20 minutes, 55 seconds. A golden portal opens in the dark flagship's control room, illuminating the destruction that Tony inflicted on the poor ship. What the? Peter mutters as he steps through. A few seconds after he stepped through, the lights suddenly flicker back on, lighting up the whole place. Yes, Tony yells as his head pops up from below the floor. Let there be light. I see that you've trashed the place. Peter reveals himself as his portal closes behind him. Oh Peter, where have you been? Tony uses Peter's real name as no one else was around. I had a press conference to calm the masses and took a quick power nap. Peter reveals as he looks around the destroyed room. Otherwise, I may have snapped upon seeing this mess. Well, I have to connect Jarvis somehow, Tony says with a shrug. Right? Peter says as the speakers in the ship go off. Jotlmi H. Mugwai, Gaich Jatlhol, Chi Hol, Pag Hak Jijal, Gabi Wadich So, Vaj Ij Filai Jatl I Chi, I Ak, Ej Gabi Desovi, Mugmi H. Say Hak Gabi. A weird, 
angry-sounding alien language plays through the ship's control room. Where is that coming from? Peter asks as Tony looks at the mess around the room. I have no idea. Where is that coming from? Peter asks after hearing the odd alien language. Is it the Chitauri? I have no idea. Tony asks as the ship goes silent. Though I think we should find out. Heh, you think? Peter says sarcastically. The Chitauri are a sentient species of cybernetically enhanced beings. Most of them are simple-minded dogged creatures, similar to insects, operating under a hive mind intelligence. They are the personal army of Thanos, which he mainly uses to throw at his enemies or cull half the population of entire planets. Whatever the job may be, as long as it pertain to war and death, the Chitauri will follow the Mad Titans every order faithfully. Let's get to work, I guess, Peter says as he starts to familiarize himself with the exposed control panels. Give me a quick rundown on what you figured out so far, while Peter and Tony put their heads together to, hopefully, get the ships moving. Fury spent hours interrogating as many Kree soldiers as he could. Through these long hours of unending questioning, he started to get a good picture of what was happening. Who's Thanos? Fury would ask every Kree this same question. Most would clam up and refuse to speak, each of them too scared to say a word, which was odd as the Kree seemed fairly confident in every other area. It was only the name of the Mad Titan that seemed to bring out this collective fear in all of them. Though that didn't mean Fury didn't get an answer to his question. Out of the thousands of captive Kree, one of them had to break. The Mad Titan isn't someone you should be asking about. A more talkative Kree woman said in a hushed tone. Why? Fury asks curiously. Mad Titan? Thanos is one of the strongest beings in the universe. You may have beaten us and Ronin the Accuser, but when it comes to Thanos, even the Great Kree and Nova Empires must be respectful. Otherwise, the consequences would be astronomical. She explains with a trace of fear in her tone. Of course, since Fury found a cooperative Kree soldier, he made sure to milk her for all of the information she had. Sounds like a scary man. Fury comments as he asks further. Is it true another army is coming? Yes, a small portion of the Mad Titan's personal army. She goes on to give a small explanation about the Chitauri. You should leave this planet while you can. Encountering the Chitauri is a mark of death. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose this battle. Thanos already set his gaze on your planet. If his army fails, he'll send another or worse. Worse? Fury asks, loving how open this Kree is being compared to the rest. He could visit this planet himself, she says as a shiver runs down her spine. Either way, I'm sure we'll be killed for our failure. Huh? Fury grunted as he leaned back in his chair. How long until this army gets here? They were supposed to arrive 18 hours after our arrival. She answers without trouble. Instantly, Fury realized that they were on a short clock, as they had a bit less than five hours before another alien army arrived at Earth's borders. How many ships do they have? He continues fishing for information. The same number as us, I think, she says after a moment of thought. I don't know much, though. You'll have to ask Nebula for more details. Who? Fury asks with a raised eyebrow. Thanos' daughter. Speaking of Nebula, the unloved daughter of Thanos and her Kree subordinates are currently occupying the house of a married couple that are out of town for their anniversary. They spent the day infiltrating various government buildings, searching for any clues that could lead them to the Tesseract. Sadly, their efforts bore little to no fruit. Sure, they learned about plenty of government facilities, though they wouldn't know what was inside until they start poking around more. As the Kree stealth squad was raiding the kitchen for food like a bunch of animals, Nebula sat on the couch and familiarized herself with the TV. These humans really need to update their technology. Nebula comments as she flips through the channels. What's this? A man in spider-themed clothing stood on a podium surrounded by a crowd of eager people. The alien army that was threatening our planet through our TVs and radios has been dealt with. They were in orbit around our planet, waiting to invade. We... The Avengers acted quickly and launched an attack before they could enter Earth's atmosphere. As that would keep all of you away from the fighting. Impossible. 
Nebula thought in disbelief. Suddenly, a Kree soldier who was in hearing range dropped a cooked chicken leg onto the floor and stared at the TV in shock. Lies! He exclaims, drawing the attention of the other Kree. Our army would never lose to these apes so easily. After playing that clip, a news anchor started speaking. Spider-Man, Earth's most loved hero and co-founder of the Avengers, says the alien threat has been dealt with. As the newswoman says this, the newly arrived Kree watch in shock. Some were skeptical of his claims, but he had this to say. The screen changed to a similar clip, except this time the oddly dressed man was talking about commandeering Kree ships and interrogating the surviving captives. How dare they spread lies about our army? A Kree says through his grinding teeth. Hmm. I don't think he's lying though. Nebula thought as she wondered what to do now. We should return to the ship. One of the Kree voices their opinion. Ronan needs to hear of this. What if he isn't lying? Nebula asks thoughtfully. No one had an answer for her, though they all thought that was highly unlikely. That doesn't matter. One of them says angrily, as he glares in Nebula's direction. We're returning to the ship. Ronan the Accuser wouldn't lose to some weak backwater planet. Nebula seethed as she was treated harshly by some random grunt. This is all due to Ronan's attitude toward her. He disrespected her at every moment he could, and now his subordinates have learned to do the same. Look at me like that again, and I'll cut you into tiny little pieces, Nebula earns as she takes out a knife from her belt. After all, her father wouldn't care for the loss of a random Kree nobody. Humph, try it, he counters and draws his laser pistol. Without another word, Nebula flicked her hand and launched the knife across the room. Before anyone could react, the knife flew into the disrespectful Kree's left eye, piercing straight into his brain. As he lifelessly collapsed onto the floor, the other Kree grabbed their weapons tightly and aimed at her. Clean this mess up and meet me at the shuttle. We might as well check for ourselves if Ronan lost or not. Nebula says as she walks out of the house, ignoring the guns pointed at her the whole time. Is it wrong to hope that he's dead? Time slowly passed as Fury extracted as much information from the captives and called the Avengers to assemble once again. Just when they thought the threat was taken care of, another alien army was only hours away. Though two people didn't get this message, as they were currently in space. Tinkering with the ship's control panel, Peter and Tony worked steadily to figure out the many wires and started working on a port that Jarvis could connect to the ship through. After a couple of hours of work, in which Peter had to make a few trips to Tony's workshop for supplies, the two were only a few steps away from completing the port. Connect the blue wire next. Tony backseats Peter's work. No, it's the gray wire, you idiot. Peter comments as he grabs the gray wire. No, the gray wire connects to the scanners not the databanks. Tony corrects with a huff. How much do you want to bet? Peter asks with a challenging look. $100,000 and a single tweet from the other's Twitter account. Tony offers, accepting the challenge. Deal. Peter says as he grabs the blue wire and plugs it in. Instantly, the monitors in the room started lighting up as the scanners started to pick up a million non-existent intruders on board. Looks like I win, Peter says, as he replaces the blue wire with the gray one. I only take cash, by the way. Whatever. Just hurry up. Tony started pouting like a child. Finishing the last few tweaks, Tony was finally able to plug Jarvis into the newly made port through his phone. Good luck, buddy. Tony says as Jarvis code floods through the port and into the ship. Connection secure. Jarvis voice plays through the ship speakers. Accessing ship's databanks. Haha! Ha. Tony laughed triumphantly. It worked! Translating foreign alien coding and language. 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. 1 hour, 57 minutes, 7 seconds. Translating foreign alien coding and language. 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. 100%. Jarvis kept them updated through the speakers of the ship. Good job, buddy. Tony says as he pats the wall of the ship proudly. Anything we should know? 
Peter asks Jarvis. Yes, I now have full control over all 20 Kree warships. I can control each of them from the flagship. Jarvis answers. Well, at least the mess Tony made didn't affect the ship much. Peter says as he turns a quick glare at the man in question. What? We would have replaced the controls anyway. They were all labeled in whatever language the Cree write in. Tony says with a shrug. That is not all. Jarvis says as the remaining monitors in the room play a recording from the databanks. How much longer until we arrive? Security footage of Ronan and Nebula speaking appears on the screen. Nebula is here? Peter confirmed his earlier suspicions. Did she die in the battle? Peter would have remembered seeing her with the prisoners, as he was the one that was in charge of that. 37 hours. Though we can half that if we increase speed and leave behind the slow Chitauri ships. Nebula answers as she glares hatefully at Ronan. Hmm. Do it. Ronan commands. What? Nebula asks. Increase every ship's speed to maximum. Ronan turns and walks to the door, passing Nebula along the way. Half of our army will arrive late, but that won't change the outcome. The screen goes black as the video ends. He's right, it didn't change the outcome. Tony says with an air of confidence. We still would have won either way. Jarvis, I'm guessing that odd language was a message from the Chitauri? How far away are they? Peter asks. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers respectfully and dutifully. The message from earlier can be roughly translated to a report on their arrival time. We have around an hour and a half until 20 Chitauri warships arrive. Okay. Do our new ships have any firepower? Peter asks as a wide smile blooms on Tony's face. Hee hee. I like the way you think, Webhead. Tony laughs excitedly. Yes, each of the Kree ships is outfitted with hundreds of missiles as well as a couple of high-powered beam weapons. When it comes to defense, there's a kinetic shield that can be activated during combat. Though, the shields will drain the power of each ship fairly quickly. Jarvis explains everything he learned about the ships. Peter doesn't say anything as he and Tony turn to look at each other, smiling like two maniacs. All right, Tony. You work on our battle strategy with Jarvis. Peter says as he opens a portal to the tower. I'll go and gather our forces, just in case. As Peter was walking into the portal, he turned around and looks back for a moment. Jarvis, where's that woman from the video? I don't remember seeing her among the dead or the prisoners. Peter asks with one foot inside the ship and another in the tower. One moment, Jarvis says as he searches the ship's data banks. She and a few Kree were sent down to Earth to investigate the whereabouts of the Tesseract. She didn't return? Peter asks. No, sir. Jarvis answers swiftly. Okay, if she does return, can you trap her in the ship? I want her alive, Peter says, receiving a knowing smile from Tony. I thought you had a girlfriend? Tony says with his infuriating smirk. Though I understand the appeal of a sexy blue alien. Not everything is about sex, you old perv. Peter says, happy that he can finally use Tony's age against him. After all, if he made age jokes before, Tony would have known Peter was younger than he portrays himself. At least I'm not a middle schooler. Tony yells back as the portal closes, leaving him and Jarvis alone on the ship. So, tell me more about these high-powered beam weapons. Arriving in the tower, Peter checked his phone and found a bunch of missed calls and messages from different members of the Avengers. Jarvis, where is Fury? Peter asks as Jarvis is integrated with the entire tower. He and many other Avengers member are currently having a strategy meeting. Jarvis says and gives Peter the location. Walking into one of the large meeting rooms, Peter felt a bout of deja vu come over him, as every member was here once again. Let me guess. Peter says as he waltzed into the room, instantly drawing everyone's attention. You guys learned about the second army headed our way? You're late, Fury says angrily. We've known about this for hours, Natasha says with a roll of her eyes. Good for you, Peter says as he waves his hand and creates a portal to the ship. We have a bit more than an hour before they arrive, so let's go. We haven't decided on a plan yet. Charles says from his wheelchair.
Tony and I already have that covered, Peter reveals as he gestures to the portal. If you don't want to miss the fireworks, then come on. Sighing in annoyance, Fury was the first to step through the portal, followed by everyone else. Stepping in behind them, Peter closes the portal. Stark, what's the plan? Steve asks as he and everyone else freezes at the mess that was once a pristine control room. Just as Tony was about to answer, a soft alarm went off, filling the control room. Sir, a shuttle is docking onto the flagship. Jarvis informs them as the alarms stop. Is it the woman from the video? Peter asks, ignoring the curious glances from those that just arrived. Yes, sir. Would you like me to lock them in the shuttle? Jarvis asks dutifully. Yeah, just make sure they can't detach from the ship, either. Peter answers with a nod. Done. Jarvis says after only a second. Shuttle locked in place. What's going on? Nightcrawler voices everyone else's thoughts. I'll explain later, Peter says as walk to the door. Jarvis, lead me to the shuttle. Yes, sir. As their shuttle docked on Ronan's flagship, Nebula clicked her tongue in annoyance. Looking over at the dead body laying motionless on the side, she rolled her eyes hatefully. I tell them to take care of the body and these idiots bring it with us. Nebula thought with a disgruntled sigh as a decaying smell filled the small shuttle. The shuttle shook as a loud clang was heard, locking the shuttle to the much larger ship. Preparing herself for what's to come, Nebula stood up and hit a button next to the sliding doors. Instantly, a red light appears under the button and the door doesn't budge. What the? Nebula mutters as she taps the button once again. Nothing. The door stays sealed shut, leaving them trapped in the tiny shuttle with a decaying carcass. Open the damn door already, one of the Kree yells toward Nebula. What do you think I've been doing? She turned to glare at the idiot behind her. Move out of the way, another says as he pushes forward and hits the same button to no avail. It's locked. No shit, Nebula says as she pushes forward. Let me see what I can do. Suddenly, Nebula's hand turns into a sort of alien multipurpose tool, which she uses to take the panel beside the door apart, revealing the many wires hidden underneath. Just as she was about to start messing with the door's controls, it suddenly swung open on its own. Huh? You did it? Kree asks in surprise. No, I didn't. She admits and looks out the door. Hello, a foreign voice says. Peter stood outside the door in his blue and red spider suit, waving toward the newly arrived aliens. Held in his right hand was the hammer that once belonged to Ronan the Accuser. That doesn't belong to you. One of the Kree noticed the hammer and points his gun menacingly. Well, it does now, Peter says with a shrug. The old owner won't be needing it anymore after all. They seemed to understand what Peter meant, as the more hot-headed Kree started firing at him. With a quick swipe of the hammer, Peter shot some kinetic force at the incoming laser bolts, knocking them to the side with ease. You step to the side. Peter motions for Nebula to get out of the way. Deciding to trust her instincts, which were currently screaming at her to listen to this stranger, Nebula exited the shuttle and stood at the side, leaving the remaining Kree inside. Thanks. Jarvis, do it, Peter says, and the doors to the shuttle swiftly snap shut. Open the airlock. In the shuttle. As the Kree were getting ready to shoot the door open once again, the second pair of doors behind them opened, sucking them into the cold vacuum of space. From a nearby window, Nebula watched as the dead bodies of the Kree that she spent the day with floated out into space. What happened while I was gone? This way, Peter says as he turns his back and walks back the way he came. Nebula stared at his back in silence, contemplating whether she should attack or not. After all, she still had all of her weapons and even if she didn't, her body is practically a living weapon thanks to her dear old dad. Though, she seemed to miss her window of opportunity, as Peter turned around and waited for her to follow. Come on. We'll miss the show if you take too long, Peter says, confusing Nebula even further than she already was. Question mark. Nebula simply stared for a moment before finally following after Peter. As they traversed the large ship, Peter made some small talk. What's your name? Pete asks as he points to his mask. I can't tell you mine, 
but you can call me Spider-Man or Spidey for short. Why? She asks, feigning disinterest. Well, I fight crime on Earth, so I try to keep my identity a secret. That way, my family and friends can live their lives without worrying about retaliation from whoever I happen to piss off in the process. Hmm, I see. She answers without much enthusiasm. Nebula. Hello, Nebula. Peter says excitedly as he starts digging for information he already knows. Why were you with these Kree? She doesn't answer this time. Because based on the way you were looking at Ronan in the security footage, I could tell that you hated his guts with a fiery passion. Peter says as she rolls her eyes at his obvious observation. He's dead now, by the way. Really? Nebula asks uncertainly. Yup. I did it myself. Peter says as he spins the hammer between his fingers. I wish that I could have seen it firsthand, or killed the bastard with my bare hands. She comments with a hate-filled look. So, are you a cyber woman or something? Peter asks, hoping this question would draw on her daddy issues and get her talking about Thanos. Why? Do you think I'm ugly too? Nebula spat out angrily. No, I think you're quite beautiful, but sadly for you, I'm a taken man, Peter says as he turns to look at her. Why? Do you think you're ugly? Nebula goes quiet as they stand unmoving in a metal hallway. I didn't use to look like this. At one point, I was completely flesh and blood. Huh? Peter says as he smiles under his mask. I didn't think you'd open up like that. You seem very... prickly. Shut up and keep walking. Spider boy, she says with a huff and a glare. It's Spider-Man, Peter says, as they walk the rest of the way in silence. Finally arriving at the destroyed control room, Nebula caught sight of the entire Avengers crew. Yo, this is Nebula, Peter says as they enter the room. Thanos' daughter? Fury asks as everyone becomes alert at the drop of a hat. How do you know that? Nebula asks back as she grips her pistol tightly. Slap before anyone could get serious, Peter slapped Nebula on the back of the head, causing her to loosen her grip on her pistol and glare in his direction. No fighting, Peter orders. You know that's apparently the daughter of the man that sent these armies here, right? Peggy reveals with a concerned look. Now I do, Peter says with an uncaring shrug. Though we won't be fighting, she's my guest. At least, for the moment, many people didn't seem to agree as even Nebula looked at Peter with a funny look on her face, though he ignored all of them. Jarvis, what's the Chitauri survival time? Peter asks. Thirteen minutes, sir. They've already entered our solar system. Jarvis answers dutifully. Have you and Tony made the strategy? Peter continued his questions. Yes, when the Chitauri arrives, we will hail them, pretending to be a Kree officer. I'll relay orders for them to take a certain position. And once every ship is in our sights, we'll launch the attack. Jarvis explains. Good, since we don't know what type of defenses they'll have. Double whatever firepower you already plan to use. Peter orders after a second of thought. Tony can always make more missiles. After all, it's his family's specialty. Hey! Tony yells from across the room. We don't do that anymore. Really? How many missiles are in your suit right now? Peter asks as enters a thinking pose. Let's not even get into how many more Iron Man suits you have, which all probably have missiles in them as well. Okay, maybe I still do that, but I don't sell them anymore. Tony gives in to Peter's logic. I never said you did. Peter shrugs as he looks out of the large observation window. Is that their ships? Far off into the black void of space, Peter could see tiny specks getting larger as time went by. Yes, that's the army my father gave to Ronan. Nebula reveals as she steps up beside Peter. Jarvis, positions. Tony commanded. Yes, sir. His trusty AI replies. Instantly, every Kree ship fired up and sprung to life, maneuvering into predetermined locations. As this was happening, Peter and everyone else watched the incoming fleet get closer and closer. Similar to the Kree fleet, the Chitauri seemed to have a flagship as well. While the other 19 ships were around the same size as the normal Kree ships, the flagship, so to speak, was probably about two or three times bigger than Ronin's. Oh yeah, 
Peter remembered something as he saw the giant spiky bug-like ship. Wasn't that the ship that controlled all the soldiers and other ships? In the Avengers movie, the Battle of New York ended when Iron Man took a nuclear missile that was meant to hit Manhattan and redirected it through the portal linking Earth to Thanos' domain. The nuclear missile then obliterated the Chitauri command ship, which controlled every Chitauri and Leviathan, causing them to die all at once. Should we just destroy the command ship and steal the rest? Peter wondered, though he didn't know how to explain where he got his information from. Whatever, we have enough ships. We can always collect the scrap from their ships for research. Thinking of this, Peter turned to Magneto, who was watching the different alien armies arrival. Eric, can you collect the scraps from their ships? I don't want any of it to fall to Earth or get stuck in orbit. Peter asks. Yeah, we can study it too. Tony says excitedly. Sure. No problem. He agreed easily. As they were talking, the alien armada got close enough for Jarvis to make contact. Relaying orders to enemy ships, Jarvis says as he goes silent. Within minutes, the Chitauri ships break formation and maneuver into a new trajectory, following Jarvis' false orders. It worked, Tony says, vibrating with excitement. It's wonderful when a plan comes together, Peter mutters as Nebula watches her father's army fall into a trap. Weirdly enough, she didn't feel the urge to help or warn them. In fact, Nebula felt eager to see the downfall of her father's carefully thought-out plans. The destruction of her father's army incited the burning vengeance that Nebula has been keeping under control for all of this time. You don't like your father very much, do you? Peter asks as he sees the hateful look on Nebula's face as she glares at the incoming army. I hate him more than anyone in the infinite universe. She admits at the moment. Hmm. Is he the one that did that to you? Peter asks, pertaining to her cybernetic upgrades. Yes, she answers curtly. Want to get revenge? Peter asks like the devil with an offer for her. Yes, Nebula admits through clenched teeth. Enemy army in place. Awaiting orders. Jarvis says as the Chitauri fleet stops downrange from the Kree ships. Shields up and weapons ready. Peter orders. Shields booting up. Jarvis says as each Kree ship glows in a blue light. Shields ready. Missiles ready. Beam cannons charging. You said you wanted revenge, right? Peter turns back to Nebula. I do. She answers resolutely. Weapons ready. Jarvis informs everyone. Then order the attack. Peter tells her, getting shocked gazes from everyone in her room. Destroy your father's fleet as the first step of your revenge. And we'll help you finish it when the time comes. You don't understand. He's stronger than you can imagine. Nebula's face twists with uncertainty as she makes excuses. And we're stronger than you think we are. Peter says as he rests a comforting hand on her shoulder. This is your chance. You won't get another. Either take it or return to your father empty-handed. Nebula's instantly wavered, as a failure of this magnitude would mean another piece of her would be ripped away and replaced with cybernetics. Peter tinkered with the idea of revealing the Infinity Stones in his possession, as that would definitely bolster Nebula's faith in him. It certainly seemed to work in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, where Nebula joined forces with Ronan against her father after the Kree warlord took possession of the Power Stone. Though, Peter knew it was best to keep the stones a secret and would continue to do so. Nebula's hands tightened into clenched fists as her eyes went bloodshot and her heart beat like a racehorse. Fire! Fire! Nebula made her decision and exclaimed through gritted teeth. Under Jarvis' control, instantly every Kree warship, including the one they were currently in, launched countless weapons at the Chitauri fleet. Thick red laser beams were the first to make contact with the enemy, as endless missiles soared through black space. Each ship had a few laser cannons attached to them, especially the flagship, which had eight altogether. One red beam targeted each ship, while the remaining focused on the giant command ship. While everyone was watching and waiting for the missiles to hit their designated targets, Peter turned to see Nebula staring out of the window, observing the result of her command with bated breaths. Her eyes were slightly bloodshot as she gripped her hands into tight fists, staring out of the window in silence. Boom! She watched as the first of many missiles hit its target, 
blowing a hole in one of the Chitauri warships. Nebula's breathing sped up, as one after another, her father's ships were struck by the highly explosive Kree missiles. Never before has she rebelled against Thanos, the man that adopted her, though the idea was always in the back of her head. After every torturous cybernetic surgery, the thoughts of rebellion would grow stronger and stronger. Of course, one very crucial thing kept these thoughts at bay. Her father is one of the strongest beings in the known universe. How could she fight against someone that could kill her with a flick of his finger? Not to mention the fact that nobody would join her cause. Thanos' subordinates are known to be very loyal, as they're either true believers in his cause or know the consequences of such actions. Just as Peter was going to try and comfort her, Jarvis talks through the speakers of the ship. Incoming message from Chitauri command ship, translating, he says as he freezes for a moment before speaking again. Traitorous Kree scum, Thanos has been informed of your betrayal. There will be nowhere for you to hide. Ronan, silence fills the ship as the message continues to badmouth both Ronan and the Kree race as a whole, though nobody here was a Kree, so the insults didn't really land as the Chitauri expected. When the message finally ended, Peter spoke up. I guess, they know they're not surviving, so they wanted to make their grievances known, Peter says with a shrug. Too bad Ronan isn't alive. I'm sure his reaction to that message would have been delightful, Nebula says spitefully. Before anyone else could say a word, the Chitauri started their counterattack. Knowing that they wouldn't survive this encounter, the bug-like alien ships formed up in front of the command ship, protecting the brain of their army, at least for the time being. As their ships were exploding from the constant bombardment, the Chitauri fleet fired up their engines and moved full speed toward the Ronin's former flagship. Uh, Tony says worriedly, That doesn't look good. They're suicided bombing us. Charles comments with no small amount of fear. Eric, this would be your time to shine. Peter says as he turns to see a strained-looking Magneto glaring at the incoming ships. I'm already on it. Eric screams as he uses his magnetic powers to push the fleet of alien ships backward. Jarvis, can we maneuver away while Eric slows them down? Peter says, knowing that Eric was pushing his powers far past their limits at the moment. Yes, setting a new course. Jarvis replies and the ships start moving as they continue to fire at the slowed Chitauri ships. Good, Peter says as he turns back to a sweating and tired-looking Magneto. Eric... Once we're out of the way, you can stop. Stop what? Nebula asks, wondering what was happening. He's holding them back by manipulating the metal of their ships. Peter explains curtly as he places a comforting hand on her shoulder. I told you before, we're stronger than you think. Huh? Do you all have powers? She asks as those with abilities are rare, unless your race had some sort of innate ability. Though humans are relatively weak, Yup, Peter nods. And you're all from the same planet? She clarifies just to be sure. Borns and raised. Peter answers, shocking her even further. Can we do this whole introduction later? Steve yelled from the side in exasperation. Now's not really the best time for this. Magneto strained his powers to the max as Jarvis moved the ships, only bumping a single enemy ship as they dodged out of the way. As the Chitauri ships passed by, Missing their suicidal attack, they left their backs wide open for a counter. Jarvis, concentrate fire on their biggest ship. Peter orders, finding the perfect excuse to reveal a bit of his knowledge. Why? Tony asks before Jarvis could do anything. They used the smaller ships as a shield during their little offensive, so the giant command ship must be important somehow. Peter says with a shrug. He's right. Nebula backs up Peter's assessment. The command ship controls all the Chitauri and their ships. Destroy it and they will all shut down. Upon hearing this, every person on the ship turned to Nebula with an annoyed look on their faces. You knew this the entire time and didn't tell us? Fury asks with his usual suspicious look. I just betrayed my father, who happens to be the strongest person in the universe. Nebula fires back in a sharp, sarcastic tone. I'm sorry that it slipped my mind. Fury merely clicked his tongue and turned his attention back to the Chitauri fleet. Concentrating fire on the enemy command ship, Jarvis calls over the speakers. 
Immediately, every beam and missile fired from the Kree fleet changed trajectory. Each of them headed straight toward the back of the largest Chitauri ship. The Chitauri seemed to notice this, as they tried to maneuver their ships to form the shield once again. But sadly, it was too late for them. First to hit were the laser beams, which purposefully aimed at the engines and thrusters behind the command ship, forcibly stopping the ship in its tracks. As the ship was stranded in space, the missiles rained down onto key positions, blowing piece after piece of the ship's hull off into space. Soon enough, the thick red laser, which was tearing through the command ship, seemed to find a weak spot in the engine. Boom! In an instant, the back half of the enemy ship exploded in a bright purple light. Debris flew everywhere as the remaining missiles hit the destroyed ship, decimating the front half next. Suddenly, every Chitauri ship shut down as Nebula said it would, drifting in space without a command to follow from their hive mind. As far as first space battles go, I'd call that a resounding success, Tony exclaims as he stared at the surviving Chitauri ships greedily. Of course, the debris from the destroyed ships would come in handy too, though a complete ship was easier to study. Okay, Eric, can you handle the scraps? Peter turns and asks. I think he'll need a minute. Charles says as Peter caught sight of Magneto, who was collapsed on the floor, breathing heavily. His nose and ears showed signs of bleeding, which certainly showed how hard Eric was pushing himself. Just give me a minute, Eric says with a huff as he wiped the blood from his nose. Actually, maybe an hour would be best. Looking at the floating debris, which was falling down to the planet, Peter wasn't sure what to do. I could open a portal to collect some, but I would only be able to get a small amount. Thinking for a moment, Peter gave up as he watched a small fraction of the Chitauri ship scraps disappear into Earth's atmosphere. Is this the universe's way of making sure the vulture is born? Peter thought as he remembered his classmate's father. Whatever, I'll just keep an eye on her family. Maybe I can offer her father a job. After all, using alien scrap to invent villain-level technology is pretty impressive. Though what worried him the most was the people he didn't know who would also come into contact with the Chitauri debris. Will there be some new villains and heroes because of this? After the destruction of the Chitauri fleet, Peter waited in the flagship alongside Tony, Magneto, and Nebula, who didn't know what to do with herself after betraying her father. Only an hour ago, her life revolved around doing her daddy's bidding, but now that's all gone. On top of that, there's this small feeling of dread for Thanos' reaction towards her choice. A little over an hour after the battle, Eric was well-rested once again and started gathering the scraps of the Chitauri ship. With Jarvis' help, he was able to load up all the scraps into the cargo bays of each Kree ship. As for the five remaining ships, which were slightly damaged from the battle, Peter and Tony took a portal over to check them over. Based on how odd they looked from the outside, they were both sure that the controls would most likely be far more confusing than the Kree ships. Starting with the least damaged ship, Peter opened a portal and tested for oxygen, which the ship thankfully still had. Thank God, Peter mutters as he steps through, followed by Tony, who was still armed in his Iron Man suit. Out of all the remaining ships, I bet this is the only one with air, Tony says as the others had more major hull damage to account for. Well, we'll see, Peter says as they traverse the ship. Within minutes, the two found countless toppled over bodies of the surviving Chitauri soldiers. Insert picture of Chitauri here, each of them was still alive and breathing, though they seemed to be in some sort of coma. Is it like a hive mind? Tony guesses as he looks over the ugly aliens. Yeah, I think they became brain dead after we destroyed that command ship, Peter says as he taps one with his foot. Do you think they could wake up if another command ship comes in range? Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe? Tony didn't know for sure. Should we kill them then? Peter asks, getting an odd look from Tony. You know, in case another command ship comes, they could cause quite a bit of trouble. Not to mention the fact that our detainment floor is already packed with Smurfs. Besides, these guys are creepy. Looking down at the monstrous-looking aliens, Tony couldn't help but agree. 
They do remind me of a horror movie monster, though we should keep a certain amount alive for testing. Who knows, we might be able to find a weakness that can be exploited on our next encounter. Sounds good to me. Peter agreed as they continued exploring the ship. Soon enough, they found something that shocked Tony and reminded Peter of the attack on New York from the movie. In some sort of onboard hangar, ten colossal fish-slash-bug-looking behemoths laid on the floor, like dead fish out of water. Although they seemed to be living beings, which were the size of large skyscrapers, they looked to be weaponized so that they can house hundreds of Chitauri soldiers and their skiffs. Chitauri Leviathans also known as Chitauri Dragons. The Leviathans are a race of biomechanically engineered Akanti Starshark hybrids produced by the Chitauri to act as a sort of large-scale flying mount. What the hell are these? Tony says excitedly as he runs around the Leviathans like a kid in a candy store. Looks like some sort of weaponized space whale or something. Peter says actually not knowing much about them, other than the fact that they destroyed a lot of buildings in the movie. I don't even know where I would begin with these things, Tony says as he wants to dissect one of them, but doing so would be extremely difficult due to their size. Let's figure that out when we're back on Earth, Peter says, as they continue their search and finally find what appeared to be the control room. This is far worse than the Kree ships, Tony mutters in confusion. There were no screens, buttons, or obvious controls of any kind. Everything was far more alien. Well, let's get Nebula. She'll hopefully know how any of this works. In a suburban home, a balding middle-aged white man sat on his couch with a beer in hand and a recorded football game playing on the flat-screen TV. Insert picture of Adrian Toomes, the vulture, here, as he was watching the game in silence, sipping his beer on occasion. A beautiful black woman walks over and hugs him from behind. It's getting late. Liz is already asleep. She says after planting a kiss on his cheek. I just want to finish the game, and I'll head off to bed. Adrian replies as he doesn't take his eyes off the TV. Okay, but don't be too long. You have to be up for work in about seven hours, she says, and receives a tired groan in return. Don't groan at me. I have work tomorrow too. Sorry. I just wish that I had more time to relax sometimes, he says with a sigh. Don't we all... His wife says as she kisses him on the cheek once again and leaves the room. Damn jets. Adrian cursed as he switched off the TV. Couldn't score even if their worthless lives depended on it. Almost an hour after his wife left, Adrian's team of choice lost spectacularly, driving him into the worst mood possible. What made it even worse is the fact that he would have to wake up for work in six hours, leaving him little room to sleep as long as he'd prefer. She's always right he thought, pertaining to his lovely wife. Just as he was about to head upstairs and call it a day, the night sky lit up through the back windows, drawing his attention. Walking over to the windows leading to the moderately sized backyard, Adrian saw a mesmerizing scene of what looked like a shining meteor shower. A cluster of what seemed to be hundreds of meteors fell from the sky, though they burned in an ominous purple light, which was an odd sight to see. Did I drink too much? He thought, but quickly threw that idea away, as he only had a few normal-sized cans. Taking in the sight of countless shooting stars, Adrian was lost in thought as only minutes later the sound of loud banging filled the whole neighborhood. As car alarms and other sounds of destruction filled his ears, Adrian saw a couple of these meteors fall and impact his backyard. What the? He mutters as more meteors fall and impact his neighbor's houses. Instead of burning up in the atmosphere of the Earth, as meteors usually do, whatever was falling from the sky was coming down completely intact and bringing destruction with it. As sounds resembling some extreme version of a hailstorm filled his surroundings, every house in the neighborhood, including his own, was damaged to different extents, depending on the owner's luck. By this point, Adrian's wife and daughter, Liz, had woken up screaming and ran down the stairs. Dad! Liz yelled as she saw her father at the bottom of the stairs looking out of the window. Get away from the window! Acting quickly, she pulls her father from the window just in time for a long and sharp metal shard to shatter it and impale the wood floor where he once stood. Staring at the spear-like metal that could have killed him, Adrian turned to his daughter with a thankful look. How'd you know? 
Something similar happened to the window upstairs, she says. Enough talking. His wife yells and opens a nearby door. Everyone in the basement now. After spending the night in the basement together, waiting out the odd catastrophe that was happening outside, Adrian's cell phone started ringing. Uh, hello? He answers as his family listens in out of boredom. Is this Adrian Toombs with Best Salvage? A woman asks from the other side of the call. Best Man Salvage is a cleanup crew owned by Adrian that holds a contract to salvage any incidents occurring in New York City. Yeah, is this about last night? He answers, both happy and annoyed at the same time. Happy as he would be making a lot of money off of this incident which his business was in dire need of, and annoyed as it would be a lot of work in the coming days based on what he saw last night. He hadn't even slept yet. Yes, the mayor is calling in every salvage crew to clean up last night's incident. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.